Your Bloody Mania, the showcase of the immortals, the granddaddy of them all, the reason why probably 99% of us know what wrestling even is. The final roll of the dice for Vince McMahon in his quest to rule the wrestling world, the first WrestleMania in 1985 was make or break for WWE. If it failed, then Hulk Hogan would have ended up selling meat from a wagon in Minneapolis with Eric Bischoff, and Vince McMahon would have ended up on the waltzes. But WrestleMania succeeded massively and turned WWE from niche attraction to household name. The following 35 plus years has seen Mania grow and grow, from wrestling's World Cup final to a legitimate events behemoth with cities all over the world, well, all over America fighting for the rights to host the events. So far, there have been 36 WrestleMania events, featuring a whopping 383 televised matches, including pre-shows. We've seen title changes, celebrity involvement, record-breaking bouts, and dream matches which were once a fantasy. But which match is the best? Which match is the worst? And why in the hell did I sign up to do this? 380 three matches. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every WrestleMania match ever, ranked from worst to best. Join us! Number 383, Yokozuna vs Hulk Hogan for the WWE title at WrestleMania 9. Seconds after Bret Hart lost the WWE title to Yokozuna, everyone's best mate Hulk Hogan ran out and instantly took on the new knackered champion. We all know what happened. Salt in the eyes, clothesline, leg drop, Hogan was your new champion. Grown. What was meant to be a shiny new chapter in WWE history became the Hogan Show once more, but don't worry, he assured Bret and Vince that he would drop the title to the Hitman later in the year and pass the torch properly. Plot twist, of course he didn't, it's Hulk Hogan. And this was him at his worst, which is why this suitably ranks as the worst WrestleMania match ever. Number 382, Red Rooster vs Bobby Heenan at WrestleMania 5. Rooster was once part of the legendary Heenan family, but the brain said, nah mate, you're crap, and booted him out. Looking to save face, Rooster challenged his former manager to a match at WrestleMania 5. Luckily for Rooster, Heenan had been battered earlier in the night by the Ultimate Warrior, and so Rooster made short work of Heenan, winning in under one minute. Not anything to shout about really, is it? Beating an injured manager in a wrestling match. Oh, and even worse, Rooster was beaten up post-match by the Brooklyn Brawler of all people. Lame. Number 381, The Undertaker vs Giant Gonzalez at WrestleMania 9. WrestleMania 9 is a love-hate affair amongst wrestling fans, but what is not up for debate is how terrible the Undertaker vs Giant Gonzalez match was. The only slight blip on the Dead Man's Mania record, until he faced Brock Lesnar obviously, Taker beat the 7 foot 7 former WCW star by DQ after he was chloroformed by Gonzalez and manager Harvey Whippleman. Ending aside, the rest of the match was hot garbage, as even Taker couldn't do anything with the totally immobile Gonzalez. Still, at least Undertaker Undertaker had a cool entrance with a vulture and a chariot, and Gonzalez's nude suit was something to see, I suppose. Number 380, Michael Cole vs Jerry Lawler at WrestleMania 27. The tyranny of heel Michael Cole is easily one of the worst and most obnoxious storylines WWE ever did. After months of dominating WWE TV and drawing the wrong kind of heat, he faced his comeuppance when he took on broadcast partner Jerry Lawler at WrestleMania 27. Not content with Cole dominating TV for months, this was somehow one of the longest matches on the Mania card, and not even the comedy of his truly terrible tattoos could make it an enjoyable watch. Lawler made Cole tap out with an ankle lock, the anonymous Raw general manager reversed the decision, and Steve Austin stunned everyone. A waste of time. Number 379, the Miss WrestleMania Battle Royal at WrestleMania 25. Ah yes, the moment when even Daredevil himself could see that WWE's women's division was officially in the toilet. Santina Morella, Santino in a wig and dress, beat 24 women's division stars from past and present to be crowned Miss WrestleMania. Imagine Molly Holly coming out of retirement for this to be told, yeah, a Canadian fella who pretends he's Italian and has a snake puppet is going to put on a dress and wig and win the damn thing, because we think women's wrestling is a big joke! 
So it's fair to say that Santina got a mixed reception when the character returned for the 2020 Women's Rumble. At least the Master of the Cobra didn't win that one. Number 378, The Rock vs. Eric Rowan at WrestleMania 32. The record for the shortest WrestleMania match goes to the six second long burial of Eric Rowan and by extension the entire Wyatt family by The Rock at WrestleMania 32. After the match, the Wyatts looked like they were about to pounce, only to be thumped some more by a returning John Cena to allow the two A-listers to smile and wave for the camera. While we were thankful for a short match in the midst of the 10 week long WrestleMania 32 and any appearance by The Great One as a cause for celebration, this was a waste of time and personnel. It also didn't really serve much of a purpose outside of getting some big names onto the show and giving Rocky the record for the shortest Mania match. Number 377, Sable vs. Tori for the WWE Women's title at WrestleMania 15. Despite being over like Rover with the WWE audience, Sable wasn't especially liked backstage, nor was she terribly exciting in the ring, though she could be carried with the right opponents. Still, WWE realized her crossover appeal and pushed her heavily, including a run with the reintroduced women's title. As champ, Sable took on her biggest fan, Tori, for the belt in the first women's title match at WrestleMania in five years. The two were awkward together, and Tori's sloppy escape from the Sable bomb in particular demonstrated this. Nicole Bass then debuted after four minutes of a poor attempt at wrestling, and this match was thankfully over. Still, Tori's airbrushed catsuit was kinda cool, I suppose. I'm clutching at straws here. Number 376, Mr. T vs. Roddy Piper in a boxing match at WrestleMania 2. A year after main eventing WrestleMania, teaming with Hulk Hogan and Paul Orndorff respectively, Mr. T and Roddy Piper locked horns once again. This time it was to be a boxing match, because Piper was a Golden Gloves boxer in his youth, and Mr. T once played a boxer in a movie. Now a bad and boring boxing match is bad enough, but a bad and boring boxing match on a wrestling card is even worse. T and Piper half-heartedly slugged each other for a quarter of an hour before Piper hit a scoop slam and got DQ'd. And that was it. This was the longest and worst match at arguably the worst WrestleMania. Number 375, Big Show vs. Akabono in a sumo match at WrestleMania 21. WrestleMania is all about spectacle, a smorgasbord of celebrities, entertainment, and international appeal. And in the case of WrestleMania 21, it also had a sumo match for no real reason. Big Show took on real-life Yokozuna, the sumo legend Akabono, and was swiftly disposed of. And no one was bothered, and I doubt anyone bought the pay-per-view for this match. For what it's worth though, it seems like this win awakened something in Akabono, and before long he went and won the bloody triple crown in all Japan. Twice. Meanwhile, Big Show, upset by the loss, turned heel until someone gave him a hot dog backstage and he cheered up, turning babyface once more. Number 374, Tori Wilson and Sable versus Miss Jackie and Stacey Keebler Playboy Evening Gown match at WrestleMania 20. A couple of hundred years ago, there were these things called magazines, some of which featured naked ladies, including several WWE superstars. Leading up to Mania 20, Playboy struck another deal to feature WWE stars in their mag, this time the tag team of Sable and Tori Wilson. So naturally, there was an evening gown match booked for the biggest night of the year in order to help sell copies. This was just not a wrestling match. It was two minutes of mild titillation so Jerry Lawler could be as crass as he wanted. The cover stars won, by the way, if anyone cares. Number 373, Fabulous Moolah vs. Velvet McIntyre for the WWE Women's title at WrestleMania 2. For those who complain about Charlotte Flair always being in and around the women's title picture, allow me to present the Fabulous Moolah. Despite having held the belt for a combined 28 years, the aging Moolah was given another run with the gold, screwing Wendy Richter out of the belt in 1985 at the behest of Vince McMahon. As the undisputed heel of women's wrestling, would Moolah finally face her comeuppance at WrestleMania 2? No. Instead, she beat Velvet McIntyre in 1 minute and 25 seconds. Moolah did drop the title to McIntyre later in the year, for just six days before holding it for another 380. Number 372, Terry Runnels versus The Cat in a cat fight at WrestleMania 2000. Fans act like the period before the Divas Revolution was the worst for WWE women's wrestling, but I can assure you it was far worse in the Attitude Era. Nothing against Terry or Stacey Carter, but neither were really wrestlers, were they? Terry was a valet and The Cat was there too, 
get her whiskers out, so to speak. With Moolah and Mae Young in their respective corners, Val Venus as ref and Jerry Lawless salivating on commentary, this was a mercifully quick match going a little over two minutes. It was also the only one-on-one -on -one match at WrestleMania 2000. Makes you almost pine for Eva Marie, doesn't it? Number 371, Kane versus Chavo Guerrero at WrestleMania 24. Nothing says WrestleMania quite like ECW. Sorry, that was meant to say ECW and WrestleMania are nothing alike, so why mention them in the same breath? The once proud third company of American wrestling had become a laughing stock by Mania 24, and champion Chavo Guerrero was an afterthought to put things nicely. After winning a number one contender's battle royal on the pre-show, extreme icon Kane faced off against the ECW champ and flattened him in 11 seconds with a choke slam. Really, he should have just thrown the title down and told Shane Douglas to kiss his ass, just to bring everything full circle. Number 370, Corporal Kirshner versus Nikolai Volkov in a flag match at WrestleMania 2. 80s WWE was obsessed with USA versus Russia storylines. Come to think of it, they're still a bit obsessed to this day. WrestleMania 2 saw this classic tale take the form of Corporal Kirshner against Nikolai Volkov in a flag match. The winner got to lift a flag, which they could have done in the safety of their own home without fear of getting battered. To prove America's superiority over the USSR, Kirshner won in two minutes after blasting Volkov with Freddie Blassie's cane, and Old Glory was soon hoisted high in the air. USA! 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 Number 369, Alicia Fox, Maurice, Leigh Cool, and Vicky Guerrero versus Beth Phoenix, Eve Torres, Gail Kim, Kelly Kelly, and Mickey James at WrestleMania 26. A match in the dreaded WrestleMania death spot, this 10 Divas tag match barely got any time or any fan reaction, despite featuring great talents like Beth Phoenix, Gail Kim, and Mickey James. The heels entered to Michelle McCool's music, naturally, but the focus of the match was Vicky Guerrero, who had been making everyone's life miserable for ages. There was about a minute of supposed action before everyone took their turn to hit their finisher on one another. Vicky got the win after a frog splash with a botched pin on Kelly Kelly, and is to this date undefeated at WrestleMania. Fear the streak. Number 368, Earthquake vs. Adam Bomb at WrestleMania 10. Adam Bomb was the up-and-coming monster who survived the nuclear disaster at Three Mile Island. Having been in WWE for less than a year, the best way to establish him as a credible threat was to have him defeat a legendary monster in Earthquake, right? Wrong. Instead, the veteran Quake dismantled Bomb in just 35 seconds, and big hapless Adam soon drifted down the card. As for Quake, this squash happened a few months into his second run with WWE, but by May he would be put on the shelf with an injury, in reality he was miffed at doing jobs, and he would quietly leave WWE for WCW. Number 367, Tori Wilson vs Candice Michelle in a Playboy pillow fight at WrestleMania 22. For 2006 obligatory Playboy WrestleMania tie-in, we were treated to the Sport of Kings, a stipulation more feared and intense than Hell in a Cell, TLC, and War Games combined. The Pillow Fight. WWE had attempted a pillow fight at WrestleMania 19, but it was a bust. For Mania 22, we finally got a true pillow fight between Tori Wilson and Candice Michelle, featuring a bed, saucy nightwear, and a dog's ass being rubbed in someone's face. And in true pillow fight fashion, and it ended with a roll-up, as Tori won and continued her legendary WrestleMania Playboy streak. Number 366, The Bushwhackers vs. The Rougeau Brothers at WrestleMania 5. Ah yes, Luke and Butch, two big New Zealand brutes who loved biting asses and licking fans and being, well, a bit weird when you come to think of it. In their WrestleMania debut, they took on the Rougeaus, and unfortunately, the two teams didn't have the best in-ring chemistry together. At least we got to see the Whackers try and rip Jimmy Hart's obnoxious jacket in two, but sadly, this was the highlight of the nine-minute match. Yes, nine minutes. Might as well just skip this one and use those nine minutes to stare at that blank wall you've been neglecting recently. Number 365, Owen Hart vs Skinner at WrestleMania 8. Owen Hart's WrestleMania debut, discarding his blue blazer appearance at WrestleMania 5, was an oddly low-key affair. Squaring off against Animal Trapper and chewing tobacco enthusiast Skinner, you would expect this to be an Owen showcase, but you would be wrong. After spitting in Owen's face, Skinner dominated the youngest Hart brother, even hitting him with his reverse DDT finisher, the Gator Breaker. Owen 
kicked out but still couldn't get control, and one with a simple roll-up having got in almost zero offense. A really strange match this one, especially considering Owen's next Mania appearance two years later. Number 364, Adrian Adonis vs Uncle Elmer at WrestleMania 2. This match has aged horribly. Adrian Adonis would go on to be an amazing heel, but at WrestleMania 2 he was nothing more than an overweight gorgeous George, minus the legacy. Adonis camped her up royally, and Uncle Elmer responded by taking the piss out of his effeminate ways to the delight of the crowd and the horror of modern audiences. The match itself wasn't great, as all Elmer could do was clubbing blows and a belly bounce if you were lucky. Adonis bumped like a magician for him, which was doubly impressive considering his size, but got the win with a falling headbutt. Number three. 363 Bad News Brown vs Jim Duggan at WrestleMania 5 as two out-and-out -out brawlers, you knew what to expect from Bad News Brown vs Jim Duggan. Lots of punches, kicks, and hacksaw yelling ho a lot, this can barely be considered a wrestling match. So prominent was the lack of actual wrestling that even Gorilla Monsoon brought it up on commentary, likely with Vince turning purple backstage. Brown eventually grabbed a chair, Duggan grabbed his plank, ooh and the two had a duel in the ring like mad pirates as the ref called the double DQ. Anyone who said they were expecting more is a dead Damn liar. Number 362, Earthquake vs Greg Valentine at WrestleMania 7. Greg Valentine's seventh WrestleMania bout was his shortest, as the former IC champion got steamrolled by Earthquake in a little over three minutes. To be fair to the aging hammer, he gave as good as he got, managing to get the future Dungeon of Doom member down to one knee to a big ovation. But Quake was having none of it, and before long came the inevitable Earthquake splash and the 1 2 3. That's because Earthquake was fresh off losing a feud against Hulk Hogan, so needed to get his steam back. A solid match, but nothing exciting. Number 361, Brutus Beefcake vs David San Martino at WrestleMania 1. The first WrestleMania wouldn't be right without an appearance from San Martino, but fans got the rubbish end of the stick when they got David instead of Bruno. Part of a half-assed push to try and continue getting money out of the San Martino name, David had nothing on his legendary old man. Beefcake, on the other hand, was in the best shape of his career, but was not too polished in the ring. The crowd were mild until the DQ finish, when Johnny Valiant and Bruno Sammartino rushed the ring for a good old-fashioned brawl. And unsurprisingly, Bruno got one of the loudest reactions of the entire night. Number 360, The Great Carly vs Kane, WrestleMania 23. Ah, big massive slow lad versus a big massive slow lad. The kind of match that no one likes, but WWE always seems to book anyway. Even better, an inter-promotional match between SmackDown and Raw. Another trope no WWE fan could give two Carlys about. The only notable thing about this match was the nod to WrestleMania 3 as Kane slammed Carly. But Hogan versus Andre, this was not. If Gorilla Monsoon was still alive, he'd have dubbed this the immovable object meets the immovable object. Carly won and then choked Kane with a big chained hook like the one from See No Evil. Okay then. Number 359, Beth Phoenix and Melina versus Ashley and Maria in a Playboy Bunny Mania Lumberjill match at WrestleMania 24. Another entrant in the WrestleMania Playboy crossover series saw cover stars Maria and former cover star Ashley take on frowning paragons of virtue Beth Phoenix and Melina with a cast of Lumberjills outside to keep order, including Cherry. Remember her? Again, this was merely on the card to draw attention to Playboy, but surprisingly, the cover stars lost despite King of the Leches Jerry Lawler running to their aid when Santino bastard Morella tried interfering. All was well in the end though as Snoop Dogg clotheslined Santino out of his shoes, then gave Maria a big snog afterwards. Doggy style. That makes no sense, does it? Number 358, the Hart Foundation versus the Bolsheviks at WrestleMania 6. According to WWE logic, there is no greater crime than being proud of your country if you're not an American. The Bolsheviks fell foul of this on many occasions, but never more devastatingly than at WrestleMania Mania 6. While Nikolai Volkov attempted to sing the Russian national anthem pre-match, he was jumped by the Hart Foundation, who swiftly nailed the heart attack and got the win in 19 seconds. An easy payday for Brett and the Anvil, and one in the eye of the Soviet Union, I guess. Number 357, Kelly Kelly and Maria Menounos versus Beth Phoenix and Eve Torres at WrestleMania 28. 
When WWE gets celebrities involved, they usually pick people who aren't remotely asked or even knowledgeable about the product. The same could not be said for TV host Maria Menounos, who is a massive WWE fan and something of a Bob Backlund mark to boot. Maria laced up some boots and teamed up with Kelly Kelly to face Beth Phoenix and Eve Torres. And she actually took a beating before the hot tag to Kelly, completely different to most celebrity matches. The fact that Mazza got the pin on Beth Phoenix was a little hard to swallow, but it's not like it had any lasting repercussions. Number 356, Butterbean vs Bart Gunn in the Brawl for All at WrestleMania 15. This was less a match and more of a Roman Coliseum spectacle, as wrestler Gunn was paired with super heavyweight boxer and knockout machine Butterbean. This was his reward for winning the Brawl for All tournament and ruining WWE's plans. Gunn was hard as nails, but unfortunately for him, Butterbean was harder than nails. He unceremoniously destroyed Gunn in a fight as one sided as Homer Simpson vs Dreader Tatum, knocking the bodacious one clean out in 35 seconds. Gunn was soon released by WWE, and it's hard not to feel sorry for him, especially as he was turned to paste in front of a pay-per-view audience of 800,000. Number 355, The Legion of Doom vs Power and Glory at WrestleMania 7. Here's a question. For the Road Warriors WrestleMania debut, were they going to A. Put on a back and forth tag classic showcasing themselves and their opponents. Or B. No sell everything and squash the other team in seconds. If you answered A, then you've never seen an LOD match before, have you? Hawk and Animal took a few moves from the team of Hercules and Paul Roma, but of course didn't really register any of them. Animal turned a top rope crossbody from Roma into a gorgeous power slam before the inevitable doomsday device and the win. A textbook squash to put over the biggest team in the world. Number 354, Hillbilly Jim, Haiti Kid and Little Beaver versus King Kong Bundy, Little Tokyo and Lord Littlebrook at WrestleMania 3. A year on from his career defining cage match with Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania 2 and Bundy had plummeted down the card, teaming with Little Tokyo and Lord Littlebrook to take on Hillbilly Jim, Haiti Kid and Little Beaver in a quick comedy match. The four smaller wrestlers had nice chemistry and worked out some decent spots, but the audience just didn't care. Little Beaver even nailed Bundy with a dropkick, the mad bastard. Bundy eventually swatted Beaver and was DQ'd before all the smaller wrestlers banded together and chased Bundy out of town. Like a crap fairy tale in front of 93,000. Number 353, The Barbarian vs Tito Santana at WrestleMania 6. Coming in the middle of a frankly stacked WrestleMania 6 card, The Barbarian versus Tito Santana was easily lost in the shuffle, and it's not hard to see why. Tito got his usual beats in like his patented flying forearm, and Barbie nailed a few impressive power moves, but it was hard to really care about it. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't a bad match, but it wasn't very exciting, and save for the Barbarian taking Tito's head off with a huge diving clothesline, it was utterly forgettable. Number 352, The Mountie versus Tito Santana at WrestleMania 7. The Mountie always gets his man, and if you don't believe me, then you haven't been paying close enough attention to his theme music. The Mountie's man at WrestleMania 7 was Tito Santana, with the former IC champion falling to the Mountie's shock stick in a couple of minutes. Jacques Rougeau unleashed the Mountie on WWE television two months prior, so there was no chance of him losing this one. At least Tito got a good amount of offense in and wasn't likely to be saddled with an awful gimmick or anything. No, wait, sorry, he would become El Matador within a few months. Number 351, Melina vs Ashley, WWE Women's Title Lumberjill match at WrestleMania 23. A victim of unfortunate placement more than anything, Melina vs Ashley had the death spot at WrestleMania 23, coming between the Trump McMahon showdown and the WWE title main event. Yikes. The match itself was nothing to write home about either, as it was only given four minutes and was the obligatory get everyone in the division on the card match. Melina retained the title and all the Lumberjills had a big fight afterwards to the surprise of precisely no one. There was a Lumberjack match at Mania 23 too, but it was a dark match though, so not on this list, thank f Number 350, the interpromotional battle royal on the WrestleMania 22 pre-show. Ah, the traditional WrestleMania battle royal. Sporadically used in the first handful of manias, it soon became the ideal crowd warmer as well as a way to get as many people as possible a mania payday. Mania 22's battle royal was an 18-man affair featuring household names like Simon Dean, Rob Conway, and Tyson Tomko. To be fair, there were a few Hall of Fame worthy superstars in the mix too, such as Road Warrior Animal, William Regal, and Goldust. 
You know the rest, lots of fumbling and bumbling before Viscera won. Number 349, Don Morocco versus Dino Bravo in the WWE title tournament at WrestleMania 4. WrestleMania 4's one night WWE title tournament was a bit of a slog and a thousand light years away from 1998 Survivor Series Deadly Game. The second out of 11 matches in the tourney was the slow plodder between Dino Bravo and Don Morocco. The action went back and forth for four minutes until Bravo pulled the ref in the way of Morocco's running splash. Bravo went for a pin, but the ref waited a minute and then DQ'd the blonde meathead. An awkwardly flat ending to a not very exciting match. Number 348, One Man Gang vs Bam Bam Bigelow in the WWE title tournament at WrestleMania 4. While we're on the subject of plodding matches at WrestleMania 4, might as well talk about this one. Bam Bam Bigelow and One Man Gang were two meaty dudes, but didn't gel so well in the ring. The two put on a sloppy match, but of course it didn't stop Gorilla Monsoon from proclaiming it the irresistible force versus the immovable object. Blasphemy. After a bit of back and forth, Bam Bam charged the ropes when Slick, One Man Gang's manager, pulled the top rope down and caused him to tumble out. Bam Bam tried to get back in the ring, but One Man Gang prevented that, getting the beast from the east counted out in the process. A crap way of having Bam Bam avoid the job, this did nothing but make him look like an utter tit. Number 347, Big Boss Man, Jim Duggan, Sergeant Slaughter and Virgil versus The Mountie, The Nasty Boys and Repo Man at WrestleMania 8. Jim Duggan, The Nasties, Virgil, a recipe for a big brawly mess, and that's exactly what we got. The faces dominated proceedings with quad clotheslines and lots of playing to the crowd. The heels then got the upper hand before crossed wires from The Nasties led to the rarer than rare occurrence of a Virgil win. It was a bit like an eight-man tag from a video game, but less fun, less coordinated, and far sweatier. Number 346, the 26-man battle royal on the WrestleMania 26 pre-show. WrestleMania 26's pre-show battle royal aptly featured 26 male superstars, and this alone seems to be the only kayfabe reason for it occurring. Featuring your usual lower card talents as well as horrible gimmicks like Kung Fu Naki and Slam Master J, no relation to Shorty G by the way, this was never going to be one for the ages. But hey, there were some set pieces moments, everyone ganging up to eliminate Great Carly, Regal and Finley having a good old scrap, and Yoshitatsu getting the win by booting Zack Ryder in the chops. Number 345, John Morrison, Trish Stratus and Snooki versus Lay Cool and Dolph Ziggler at WrestleMania 27. MTV's Jersey Shore was a show that featured meatheads with heavy tans shouting at one another. So when breakout star Snooki was scheduled to get involved with WWE, most people saw it as a match made in heaven. Unfortunately, Snooki's appearance slightly overshadowed a returning Trish Stratus, despite their team getting the win. The match wasn't bad or anything, but Trish should have been given something better to do here. The most notable thing about this one is John Morrison allegedly being angry at Stratus taking a WrestleMania spot that he felt should have gone to his then-girlfriend, Melina. By the way, Snooki also undefeated at WrestleMania. Number 344, King Kong Bundy vs Special Delivery Jones at WrestleMania 1. The first WrestleMania was full of, well, first including the memorable squash match between King Kong Bundy and Special Delivery Jones. Bundy made short work of the hapless Jones, pinning him in about 24 seconds, or 9 seconds if you want to believe Howard Finkel, further showing why Bundy was one of the most feared competitors of his day, and setting him up nicely for a main event run. That's all there is to say really, apart from the fact that this was the shortest WrestleMania match until WrestleMania 6, or if you want to keep kayfabe alive, WrestleMania 24. Number 343, Hulk Hogan vs Sid Justice at WrestleMania 8. Despite the fact that Sid was cheered at the Royal Rumble, WWE turned him heel because Hogan just had to vanquish him, brother. And despite the fact that WrestleMania 8 featured Randy Savage vs Ric Flair for the WWE title, Hogan just had to close the show. That's right kids, it was the Hulk Hogan show once more as he and Sid did the old big man vs big man match. What was noticeable was Sid being the first person in history to kick out of the leg drop due to Papa Shango missing his cue to interfere, all before a returning Ultimate Warrior ran in for the save. A memorable moment to cap off what had been largely a total mess. Number 342, Bam Bam Bigelow and Luna Vachon vs Doink and Dink at WrestleMania 10. If you're anything like me, you may from time to time sit and wonder how WWE dropped the ball with Bam Bam Bigelow. The 
Beast from the East should have been a credible main event heel, but instead was relegated to crap squash matches and whatever the hell this was at Mania 10. Bigelow and Main Squeeze Luna were feuding for months with a no longer interesting Doink and his Christmas present Dink. Yes, Doink got a mini version of himself from Santa. This was a typical comedy match because small people are funny, at least according to Vince McMahon. Bigelow got the win here with a diving headbutt. Number 341, Bret Hart versus Mr. McMahon in a no holds barred lumberjack match at WrestleMania 26. 13 years in the making, one of the most notorious moments in wrestling history, and we were finally going to get a payoff with Bret Hart versus Vince McMahon. The screw job bites the dust. Sort of. Unfortunately, several major ailments meant that Bret couldn't bump or do much of anything in the ring anymore, and rather than the satisfying deathmatch we all prayed for, we instead got Bret Hart absolutely leathering Vince with no reply for 11 minutes. It was practically a snuff movie. All the Harts got involved too, with the Hart dynasty putting some boots in, and camera-shy referee Bruce Hart literally walking over a prone Vince. Therapeutic for the Hart, an uncomfortable snoozer for most everyone else. Number 340, Genichiro Tenryu and Koji Katao versus Demolition at WrestleMania 7. As part of a talent trade with Super World of Sports in Japan, the team of Tenryu and Katao made their WWE debut at WrestleMania 7. That's right, Genichiro Tenryu, the future IWGP champion and three-time All Japan Triple Crown winner, the first man in history to hold both titles. And here he was having a forgettable match against Smash and Crush in front of an apathetic crowd. The fans also had no idea who these guys were and were coming down from the excellent Randy Savage Ultimate Warrior match. Luckily, it didn't last long and Tenryu at least got the win with a powerbomb. Number 339, Andre the Giant versus Big John Studd in the $15,000 Body Slam Challenge at WrestleMania 1. Big John Studd wanted to establish himself as the one true giant of WWE, but Andre the Giant was in his way. Bobby Heenan wanted in on the action and stumped up $15,000 if Andre could body slam Studd, but if he failed, he would have to retire. The match went how you would expect. An aging Andre was slowing down, and Studd was never the best in-ring worker in the world, but the fans loved Andre and blew the roof off of MSG when he finally nailed a body slam for the win. Oh, the good old days when a body slam was as effective as a Canadian destroyer. Number 338, The Undertaker vs King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania 11. Easily the most forgettable of all the streak matches, this one saw Undertaker go 4-0 against King Kong Bundy at Mania 11. Bundy was part of Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation, who had been feuding with Taker for the best part of a year. Going into this match, the bad lads robbed Taker's urn, claiming it as the source of his powers, the awful scumbags. This was messy, weirdly paced, with lots of run-ins and a strange finish where Taker got the win with his running diving clothesline. Probably because Bundy was too big to tombstone, in fairness. Strange match. Number 337, Big Boss Man vs Akeem at WrestleMania 6. Former Twin Towers partners Bossman and Akeem fell out after Bossman refused to take bribes from Ted DiBiase, and they decided to settle their differences at WrestleMania 6. And they settled them in less than two minutes. Seriously, the entrances were longer than the match, but that's okay because Bossman's Hard Times theme is inarguably amazing. The man from Cobb County got the win with the Bossman Slam, condemning Akeem the Dusty Rhodes impersonator to his last major loss on WWE television. Bossman then got his hands on slick and batted him about like a cat with a mouse. Number 336, Tatonka vs Rick Martel at WrestleMania 8. This match saw the pay-per-view debut of the undefeated Tatonka, heralded to the ring by members of the Native American Lumbee tribe. Rick Martel got his regular entrance. Wonder who won this one? Tatanka was okay in the ring, but all he ever did really was chop. Chop here, chop there, more chops than Walter and Kenta Kabashi at a barbecue grill. Rick Martel was put in with Tatonka to make this bright new star look good, and considering the fact that Rick Martel is awesome, it was certainly mission accomplished. Tatonka got the win with a running crossbody, as he must have been all chopped out. Number 335, The Boogeyman vs Booker T and Shawn 
Carmel at WrestleMania 22. Booker T was coming off an amazing US title feud with Chris Benoit in early 2006 and would need something to do before becoming King Booker in the summer. Unfortunately for he and wife Charmel, that meant wasting a few months being terrified of worm-eating clock-butting freak the Boogeyman. SmackDown's shiny new spooky sod stalked Booker and Charmel for weeks, leaving the Huffmans absolutely terrified as a result. Cut to WrestleMania 22 and the happy couple took on Boogie in a losing effort, with Charmel receiving a worm loaded snog for her troubles. Grim. Number 334, The Natural Disasters vs. Money Inc. for the tag team titles at WrestleMania 8. Angered that manager Jimmy Hart went behind their back and led Money Inc. to tag gold, Earthquake and Typhoon said, let's be good guys instead, and decided to batter Money Inc. for the tag team titles at WrestleMania 8. And batter them they did. So much so that IRS and Ted DiBiase took the count out loss and kept hold of their belts. This just didn't feel feel like a WrestleMania match. If Raw had existed back then, it would have been the perfect place for it, but not Mania. The Disasters would eventually win the titles in July at a TV taping. Number 333, Jake Roberts vs George Wells at WrestleMania 2. The great Jake Roberts' first WrestleMania saw him win a match against Jobber to the Stars' George Wells. The fact that there was a Jobber match at Mania is strange enough, but the fact that Wells got most of the offense during it is even stranger. You actually find his Himself rooting for George despite the inevitable outcome. And when he nailed a head scissor takedown, if you didn't shout, Come on, George! then you are simply dead inside. Jake eventually turned the tide with the DDT, leading to a brutal post match snake attack. Poor George, foaming at the mouth as Damien made a mockery of him. He didn't deserve that. Not our George. Number 332, Razor Ramon vs. Bob Backlund at WrestleMania 9. The bad guy took on legendary former WWE champion Bob Backlund at WrestleMania. WrestleMania 9 in both men's WrestleMania debut. Razor was the up-and-comer, Backlund the returning hero, the match was cut short due to time constraints. The fans were bored regardless. Most fans seem to be unfamiliar with Backlund, so why should they have cared? No matter what the fans thought, both men deserved better, especially Backlund as he was pinned in just four minutes. This was the first time that the third longest reigning WWE Champion in history was pinned clean on WWE TV for the best part of 15 pissing years. Ridiculous. Number 331, Men on a Mission vs. The Quebecers for the tag team titles at WrestleMania 10. The former Mountie and the future PCO took on the future Viscera and the always Mo, defending their WWE tag titles. The Quebecers had leveled the entire tag division, but men on a mission were their biggest test. Literally, look at the size of them. Despite fans liking their gimmick, MOM weren't brilliant in the ring and had several sloppy moments in this match. The Quebecers were much better, but suffered a count out loss, retaining their titles in the process. Men on a Mission would later accidentally win the titles on a house show after Mabel legitimately splashed Pierre, and the future Ring of Honor champion failed to kick out. Number 330, the Texas Tornado versus Dino Bravo at WrestleMania 7. The one and only WrestleMania appearance for the Texas Tornado Kerry Von Erich saw him dispatched Dino Bravo with relative ease at WrestleMania 7. Tornado dropped the IC title a few months earlier to Mr. Perfect, so was being built back up, and as Bravo was winding down his in-ring career, he was the ideal choice to take the loss. The match itself was nothing special, but the crowd would bang into Tornado, cheering for every attempt at the famous Von Erich Iron Claw, then going wild as he nailed the Tornado punch for the three count. Number 329, the Allied Powers versus the Blue Brothers at WrestleMania 11. 11. A year after the Lex Express unceremoniously crashed off a cliff, hapless Luger found himself tagging with Davy Boy as cross-Atlantic team the Allied Powers. In their first pay-per-view appearance, they took on the Blue Brothers, aka the Harris Brothers, with long hair. The match went as you would expect, lots of power moves from the Powers, while no one cared about the Blue Brothers because no one ever cared about the Blue Brothers. And to think, a year earlier, Lex was in the WWE title scene. Now, he was curtain jerking against the bloody Harris boys. Number 328, Goldberg vs. Brock Lesnar with Steve Austin as special guest referee at WrestleMania 20. Everyone loved Goldberg. Everyone loved Brock Lesnar. 
But then, word got out that both were leaving, and the entire WWE audience made them public enemy number one. The last match from their first WWE run was a lethargic affair. As both men had one foot out of the door and just seemingly couldn't really be asked performing, with the crowd booing every last thing they did. Goldberg got the win after 13 long minutes, then received a stunner from special referee Steve Austin to possibly the loudest cheer of the night. Thankfully, Billy and Brocky would have a WrestleMania rematch 13 years later, and safe to say, it was a bit better than this. Number 327, Junkyard Dog versus Greg Valentine for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 1. Greg Valentine is one of the most underrated IC champions ever. Junkyard Dog was one of the most popular stars of the rock and wrestling era, but their WrestleMania bout was underwhelming at best. Valentine was feuding with Tito Santana and was denying him a shot at the title, so JYD came in as a proxy and headbutted Hammer everywhere. You know, like a dog. The Hammer cheated for the win, but Tito came out and got the match restarted. Valentine took his title and buggered off instead. An angle more than a match, but the crowd were into it, so job done. Number 326, Don Morocco versus Paul Orndorff at WrestleMania 2. Vince McMahon's dream right here, two big, burly, massive men engaging in colossal combat. Four. On paper, this should have been great. Big Bad Morocco versus established main eventer Paul Orndorff? Sign me up! In reality, we got two plodding fellas slowly wrestling before saying sod it and having a big brawl outside. The ref had seen enough and delivered the quickest 10 count in history, counting both men out as the New York crowd loudly cried BS. At least Orndorff got to swing a chair about and look hard though, a small victory. Number 325, The Undertaker vs Big Boss Man in Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania 15. Ministry of Darkness Undertaker was amazing, eyebrow piercing and all, and he deserved much better than his Hell in a Cell match against Big Boss Man at Mania 15. Boss Man was great, don't get me wrong, but the super-powered leader of a satanic cult versus a rich bloke's bodyguard isn't the most exciting story. Who cares though, because when all was said and done, Taker hung him from the roof of the cell with a noose in the biggest overreaction in wrestling history. Don't worry though, Boss Man was okay, and before long it turned out that the corporation and the ministry were all one big happy family anyway. Hope Taker bought him some chocolates as an apology at the very least. Number 324, Rocky Maivia versus The Sultan for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 13. Pre-Rock Rocky Maivia was as bland as plain bread and a glass of water. Pre-Rikishi Sultan was a forgettable, mysterious foreign menace heel in a mask. The crowd was never going to like this match and like it, they did not. Despite Rocky and Sultan's best efforts, the fans were not on board, only perking up to shout, Rocky sucks, and boo as Sultan slapped on rest hold after rest hold. They booed even harder when Rocky attempted a comeback, and yet the pair would become two of the most popular stars in the company in just a few short years. Amazing what a bit of attitude can do for someone. Number 323, Butch Reed versus Coco Beware at WrestleMania 3. Everyone's favorite Hall of Fame in Ducktee, Coco Beware, and future Doom Bruiser Butch Reed were sandwiched between a Heart Foundation match and Savage vs. Steamboat at WrestleMania 3. Tough spot, that. As anticipated, this was a pure filler match. Coco shone and the crowd loved the Birdman, but the natural cheated to win and pummeled Coco post-match. Tito Santana made the save though, and the crowd rejoiced. The guys made the most of their spot, and it wasn't a bad bout at all, but this was always going to be somewhat of a piss break match, wasn't it? Number 322. The Ultimate Warrior vs Hunter Hearst Helmsley at WrestleMania 12. The up-and-coming undefeated Connecticut Blue Blood took on the returning Ultimate Warrior in a highly anticipated bout at WrestleMania 12. Flanked by Sable, Hunter quickly nailed the pedigree, but it was instantly no-sold, and Warrior proceeded to do his usual shtick for the easy win in about two minutes. Warrior even kept his big coat on for most of the bout. Must have been nippy in Anaheim. And just think, Helmsley got this treatment before the curtain call. You can almost see why the reign of terror happened now, can't you? Number 321, the Battle Royal at WrestleMania 4. WrestleMania 4's Battle Royal was your standard affair, loads of people in the ring throwing each other out in order to nab a big trophy. Wonder if that big trophy would survive the night. For some reason, George Steele stayed outside for the duration of the match shuffling about before arbitrarily leaving after pulling Jim Neidhart out. Excellent strategy, well done George. The final two were Bad News Brown and Bret Hart, but both were heels, uncommon for the time. Brown got the win eventually by suckering Bret, but the hitman got the last laugh by, you guessed it, smashing the trophy to bits. 
Number 320, Jake Roberts versus Rick Rude in a WWE title tournament match at WrestleMania 4. If there were ever a match you would think would steal a WrestleMania, you would assume it would be Jake Roberts versus Rick Rude, but you would be unpleasantly surprised. Occurring during WrestleMania 4's frankly boring title tournament, both men were in good positions on the card, but neither could afford to lose. Time for a draw, baby! The match started well, but an overly long submission spot killed the crowd. Out. The action picked back up toward the end, but it was too late and time ticked out at 15 minutes. Disappointing considering the caliber of talent in ring, but this was merely the precursor to an eventful feud between the two. Number 319, Maven vs Goldust for the hardcore title at WrestleMania 18. The 24-7 Hardcore title was a fun addition to WWE programming, but by 2002 it was begging to be put out of its misery. Still, it was as good a way as any to kill a few minutes, I guess. Maven came into WrestleMania 18 as champion, taking on Goldust who had a load of golden bins with him. But Hollywood backlot brawl this did not turn out to be, as instead we got WWE's tame version of garbage wrestling. After both men hit each other in the face with bin lids, Spike Dudley ran in, pinned Maven and cheesed it with the title. Maven would regain the title later in the night from Christian. Number 318, Alundra Blaze vs Leilani Kai for the women's title at WrestleMania 10. WWE's second attempt at a women's division centered around Alundra Blaze and literally about three other women. So in order to give new women's champion Blaze some credibility, she was booked into a match with former champ Leilani Kai, who was making her first WrestleMania appearance since WrestleMania 1. Kai's offense looked a little dated, mainly chest bumps and hair pulls, but the two made the most of their time, with Blaze hitting a number of nice sunset flips and Frankensteiners before getting the win with a bridging German suplex a little after three minutes. Number 317, Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov versus the Killer Bees at WrestleMania 3. Jim Duggan's character's a bit of an arsehole, isn't he? Here was Sheiky Baby and Nikolai ready to take on the Killer Bees, but Duggan comes out too because he clearly hates foreigners. To be fair, the heels were heat magnets and Sheik routinely ran down the US of A and the ring was strewn with debris thanks to Nikolai singing the USSR national anthem. The match itself was good but short and ended when Sheik had Jim Brunzel in the camel clutch only for Duggan to run in and whack him with a 2x4 for no apparent reason, giving the heels the DQ win. Number 316, Demolition versus The Powers of Pain and Mr. Fuji for the WWE tag titles at WrestleMania 5. A year removed from their great tag title match, against Strike Force, Demolition was still champions but had turned face, having lost Fuji as their manager. Fuji was now backing the Powers of Pain, the Barbarian and Warlord, and aligned himself with the Big Angry Sods in a handicap match for the titles. Four Hosses and Mr. Fuji in the ring meant very little wrestling and lots of stiff clubbing brawling, but it worked. Fuji in particular looked great, despite missing a top rope leg drop that took close to 45 bloody minutes to prepare for. Demolition got the demolition decapitation on their old boss, much to the crowd's approval. Number 315, Tag Team Number 1 Contenders Battle Royal at WrestleMania 14. Only the Nation of Domination and the Mystery Team, the rechristened LOD 2000, got televised entrances, so take a guess as who was going to win this one. Yes, LOD were back in cool new helmets and biker shorts, and Sonny was there too as their new manager, before it all, you know, happened. It was a tag team battle royal, meaning that when one member of a team was eliminated, the other had to leave the ring too. Lots of flailing limbs and quick eliminations later, LOD got the win by last eliminating the new Midnight Express. Number 314, Earthquake vs Hercules at WrestleMania 6. Hulk Hogan needed a steady supply of monsters to topple, and in mid-1990 the monster mantle would fall to the undefeated Earthquake. But before their feud, WWE needed Earthquake to look super strong. Hercules was the perfect opponent, massive and established, so that Quake toppling him would be a statement of intent. The two worked well together, Herc having to fend off Quake and Jimmy Hart as the burly Canadian battered him around the ring. Before long, it was time for the Earthquake splash and the victory. Then, another splash for good measure. Oh, and an interesting note, Earthquake was only 26 here. 
tough paper round. Number 313, the 30 man interpromotional battle royal on the WrestleMania 21 pre show. You know the drill by now, 30 men this time though. The most notable thing about this pre show battle royal is who won it, Booker T. Yes, Booker didn't make the main card of WrestleMania 21 two years on from his world title match with Triple H. I mean, Money in the Bank happened at Mania 21. Booker could have been inserted into that somehow, surely? No, the pre show was the spot for him, but at least he won. I guess, last eliminating Chris Masters. 2005 would get better for the five-time WCW champion, as Kurt Angle would soon start harassing Booker's wife Charmel on SmackDown. Sorry, did I say better? I meant worse. Far worse. Number 312, Total Divas vs Team Bad and Blonde on the WrestleMania 32 pre-show. Oh, look out, time for some totally real drama for the benefit of Total Divas and literally nothing else. Yes, the conclusion to a season of the reality TV show saw the cast of Total Divas take on Bad and Blonde. Bet Jim Cornette loved this one. All kidding aside, this wasn't a bad match, but it's hard not to be cynical when you know its only purpose was to promote another TV show. Still, Brie winning with the Yes Lock and an injured Nikki coming out to celebrate was quite nice. Number 311, Mankind vs The Big Show at WrestleMania 15. The Big Show was new to WWE and had cost Mankind his title during his feud with The Rock, with the two subsequently battering each other in a Boiler Room Brawl. Surely this rivalry would reach fever pitch at WrestleMania? Well, no. Obviously, the best story was to make the two fight for the prestigious honor of refereeing the main event. It was slow, a bit boring, but Mankind won via DQ after taking a big choke slam onto two chairs. Post match, Big Show turned face by chinning Vince McMahon, as one got the feeling that this should have all taken place on Raw, really. Number 310 Big Show, Kane, Kofi Kingston, and Santino Moreno versus The Core at WrestleMania 27. Despite having IC champ and tag champs in their mix, The Core were pretty much a bust from the off. A shadow of what the Nexus could have been, Mania 27 was arguably The Core's lowest point, losing to the thrown together team of Big Show, Kane, Santino and Kofi, who was a last minute replacement for Vladimir Kozlov. The archetypal get everyone on the card for a payday match, The Core lost in 90 seconds, thanks to a Cobra and a WMD on Heath Slater. It's it's not like the core had been around for ages either, only three months. Number 309, Jim Duggan versus Dino Bravo at WrestleMania 6. USA, USA, chanted Jim Duggan at WrestleMania 6 in Toronto against Canada's own Dino Bravo. The silly Billy. Yes, the Canadians no sold the USA chance, but did ho along with Hacksaw as he and Bravo brawled around for a bit for their enjoyment. Despite the deck being stacked against Duggan, he managed to squeeze out a win by walloping Bravo with the 2x4 behind the ref's back. Unfortunately for Duggan though, Bravo was mates with Earthquake, who proceeded to manhandle Big Jim and hit him with the Earthquake Splash. Number 308, Randy Savage versus Butch Reed in the WWE title tournament at WrestleMania 4. After several years as the amazing heel IC champ, Savage turned face and was destined to become WWE champion at WrestleMania 4. In the first round of the seemingly never-ending WWE title tournament, Macho took on Butch Reed and dispatched him in about five minutes. If you've never seen the match, allow me to sum it up. Reed batters Savage for a few minutes, Savage turns it around, hits his classic offense, a top rope elbow drop and moves on to the quarterfinals. Not a bad match, just a formulaic Randy Savage exhibition really, and for what it achieved, that was perfectly fine. Number 307, Yokozuna vs Lex Luger for the WWE title at WrestleMania 10. Poor Lex, poor gormless gullible git Lex, poor Lex Express crashing no hope Lex, poor Lex. This was the final nail in the coffin of Luger's WWE title flirtations after the embarrassment of SummerSlam 93 and the weird ending to the 1994 Royal Rumble. With Mr. Perfect as guest referee, Luger took on WWE Champion Yokozuna in the first title match of WrestleMania 10. The total package did his best, managing to fend off Yoko and his managers Mr. Fuji and Jim Cornette, but when Perfect failed to count a pin, Lex shoved him and got disqualified. Perfect turned heel and Luger slipped down the card. Poor Lex. Number 306, Brutus Beefcake vs The Honky Tonk Man for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 4. A battle of the in-ring technicians for the IC title saw Brutus Beefcake take on Honky Tonk Man in the midst of the Elvis wannabe's legendarily long reign with the strap. 
Honky had Jimmy Hart and Peggy Sue in his corner, and the three did all they could to keep the barber at bay. At one point, Beefcake had the match won with the sleeper, and despite the bell not ringing, Beefcake celebrated like he'd won the bloody thing, moron. Unfortunately for him, Jimmy then megaphoned the ref for the DQ. Brutus then chopped Jimmy's gorgeous flowing mullet off for revenge as Honky and Peggy Sue ran away. Number 305, Rikishi and Scotty Too Hotty versus the APA versus the Basham Brothers versus the world's greatest tag team for the WWE tag titles at WrestleMania 20. We were a few years removed from WWE's golden age of tag wrestling, and while the competitors were largely fantastic, the division itself was an afterthought. Case in point, Scotty and Rikishi, APA, the Bashams, and Haas and Benjamin duking it out for the tag team titles for six whole minutes. What can four tag Tag teams achieve in just six minutes. Not a lot, it turns out. The world's greatest tag team did most of the work, and Scotty looked good, as did the Bashams. Rikishi ran wild, and the crowd woke up when he attacked everyone with his ass, and Farouk did absolutely nothing. But fair play to him. Number 304, the ECW title number one contenders battle royal on the WrestleMania 24 pre show. The traditional WrestleMania battle royal at Mania 24 had the added spice of having actual stakes. The winner would face ECW champion Chavo Guerrero on the main show and would beat him in seconds and make a mockery of ECW and everything it stood for. Alongside eventual winner Kane vying for the title shot were luminaries of ECW and legendary deathmatch warriors. Hardcore icons like Chuck Palumbo, Jimmy Wang Yang, and Deuce. Yeah, the roster for this one was a bit crap, really, but at least the match was better than the title match that followed. Number 303, The Ultimate Warrior vs. Hercules at WrestleMania 4. The Ultimate Warrior's first WrestleMania match saw him take on the equally beefy Hercules in a battle of the beef boys. Your classic big man match, this featured lots of shoving, gun shows, and posturing from both men. Hercules looked to have the match in the bag when he slapped on the full Nelson, but Warrior kicked back off the turnbuckle and turned it into a pin for the win. It didn't really look like it should have been a pin, though, to be honest. Fairly low intensity for a Warrior match, things picked up after the bell when Hercules choked him with a big chain before Warrior grabbed it and swung it round like a loon. Number 302, Rey Mysterio vs. John Bradshaw Layfield for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 25. Not every WrestleMania match has to be a 40-minute classic, and while the majority of the under-a-minute bouts are pretty rubbish and serve little to no purpose, Rey Mysterio punking out JBL in second was great stuff. After claiming the IC title, JBL was cemented as a true WWE Triple Crown Champion and had nothing left to prove. Naturally, Mysterio made him look a chump and took the title in less than 20 seconds. The crowd exploded for the result and then exploded more when JBL quit WWE on the spot. Number 301, the WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal on the WrestleMania 35 pre-show. The second outing for the no-name Memorial Battle Royal was a pretty typical one. Featuring 17 wrestlers compared to the 30-man Andre Battle Royal, it assembled the who's who of the women's division at the time, with former champions Mickie James, Naomi and Maria, alongside the likes of Ember Moon, Dana Brooke and Candice LeRae. Criminally, Asuka was also in this match, and even more criminally, she didn't win. No no, that honour went to Carmella, but there's barely a WWE fan alive who would say that she should have won instead of the Empress of Tomorrow. Not like WWE to do a bit of dodgy booking. Number 300, the Islanders and Bobby Heenan versus the British Bulldogs and Coco Beware, WrestleMania 4. To paraphrase the great Bobby Heenan's Hall of Fame speech, WWE had bulldogs, a parrot, and a weasel, and all of them were in this match. Heenan was the focus, bedecked in dog handler gear to stave off attacks from Matilda the Bulldog. The match itself, however, was the Davy Boy Smith show, and he was in especially fine form. Brain delivered a few cowardly attacks and got the win when the Islanders launched him off the top onto Coco Beware for the 1-2-3. Matilda got the last laugh, though, chasing Heenan up the aisle as Davy Boy launched her onto the feckless manager. Number 299, Brutus Beefcake versus Ted DiBiase, WrestleMania 5. Brutus Beefcake's WWE booking was simple. Never let him job, rarely let him win clean, and always give him an opportunity to strut and or cut. A 
prime example was when the Beefster took on Ted DiBiase at WrestleMania 5. Teddy had Virgil in his corner, and the two bent the rules to their whim. It was not enough, however, as Brother Brutai stood his ground, fighting out of a million dollar dream and locking in the sleeper. Virgil and DiBiase had enough, bludgeoned the barber outside the ring, and everyone got counted out. The heels then scarpered before Beefcake could indeed strut and or cut. Textbook. Number 298, TNA vs Head Cheese, WrestleMania 2000. Remember Steve Blackman? Yeah, he was hard, wasn't he? Waved sticks about and did karate. Remember when they teamed him with Al Snow, put cheese on his head, and tried to make him funny? That wasn't so great, was it? And what about here at WrestleMania 2000, when he pump kicked a little person dressed as a wedge of cheese? Head Cheese lost to the also terribly named TNA. All four men were good wrestlers, and they should have probably been better booked than this. Number 297, the Vicky Guerrero Invitational for the Divas title, WrestleMania 30. The one and only appearance of the Divas title at WrestleMania came during the Vicky Guerrero Invitational, a one fall to a finish multi-woman match. AJ Lee entered as champ in the midst of her record-setting 296-day reign and was promptly pummeled by everyone else in the bout. AJ escaped with the gold uh, butterfly after six minutes, convincing the ref that Naomi had tapped out. It was nice to see a Divas title match at Mania Hell. It was nice to see a women's match that wasn't a Playboy tie-in, to be honest, but the revolution was still clearly a ways away. Number 296, Liv Morgan vs Natalia, WrestleMania 36 Night 2 Pre-Show. It seems weird that there was a pre-show for each night of the pre-recorded two-pronged WrestleMania 36. You would think that they would just put everything on the main card, right? Night 2's kickoff bout saw Liv Morgan take on Natalia, the two feuding because, I mean, what else is there to do during a pandemic? A decent back and forth match, Liv got the upset win with a roll up out of nowhere. You know, it was a hard one to care about because A, it was on the pre-show, B, no one was there, C, Natalia turns more than the big show. Number 295, Ted DiBiase vs Jim Duggan, WWE title tournament, WrestleMania 4. Ted DiBiase is to blame for the long-winded WWE title tournament at WrestleMania 4. After attempting to buy the WWE title from Andre the Giant, the belt was held up by WWE management and we all suffered as a result. Laughing Ted took on Jim Duggan in the first round, flanked by hired goons Virgil and Andre, and the three were too much for Duggan to handle. Hacksaw got his licks in though, and DiBiase sold like a champ for him because he's great. Duggan went for the charge, got tripped by Andre, and Ted got the pin to advance to the next round. Number 294, the gimmick battle royal, WrestleMania X7. WrestleMania X7 really did have it all. TLC, hardcore brawls, Linda McMahon getting a road warrior pop, and a load of old lads scrapping in a ring while Mean Gene and Bobby Heenan did commentary. This was fun. Inconsequential, sure, but still fun, as we saw the likes of Sergeant Slaughter, Michael Hayes, the Bushwhackers, and many others have one last hurrah on the biggest stage. In the end, the Iron Sheik won, almost by default because he physically couldn't take a bump over the top rope. Number 293, Doink vs Crush at WrestleMania 9. Matt Bourne was the best Doink, there is no question about it. The evil, creepy, cigar-chomping clown was pretty cool before he turned face and became as tedious as school in summertime. Doink's first feud was with Crush, who didn't take too kindly to the creepy clown's child-scaring antics. At WrestleMania 9, Crush tried to literally crush Doink's head, but the clown prince of clowns bundled into the ref, then smacked Crush with a fake arm for the win after a little bit of twin magic. Both Doinks did their fake mirror shtick and laughed like drains, which distracted us from the surreal sight of JR in a toga. At least for a brief moment, anyway. Number 292, Baron Corbin Corbin vs Kurt Angle, WrestleMania 35. And so it came to this, the last hurrah of Kurt Angle, one of the finest in-ring performers of all time, wrestling his retirement match against no one's favourite anything, Baron Bloody Corbin. I know wrestlers are meant to go out on their back, I get it, but against Corbin? Could we not have had Ray or Joe or Cena or Chad Gable or a cardboard cutout of Charlie Haas or something? Was it a bad match? No. But considering the ways in which Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels have bowed out at WrestleMania, this was a massive, crushing disappointment for such an esteemed wrestler. 
I demand justice for sexy Kurt. Number 291, The Dream Team versus The Rougeau Brothers, WrestleMania 3. While Brutus Beefcake and Greg Valentine can hardly be considered a dream team, they were in fact very good and had decent chemistry with the Rougeau brothers at WrestleMania 3. This was an alright match with lots of quick tags, ending with Chaos as dream team associate Dino Bravo nailed Ray Rougeau for the win, while the virtuous Brutus Beefcake shook his head with anger at his team's underhanded tactics. This whole angle was simply a vehicle for a Beefcake face turn, which would pay off later in the night. The Rougeaus would eventually turn heel, a role that they were far better suited to. Number 290, Wendy Richter vs Leilani Kai for the women's title at WrestleMania 1. One of the driving forces behind the initial success of the rock and wrestling era was Wendy Richter and her clashes with Fabulous Moolah and Leilani Kai. After dropping the women's title to Kai at the war to settle the score, Richter was out for revenge at WrestleMania, flanked by Cyndi Lauper. This match was truly a huge deal, and after Richter got the win to a monster pop, the images of Richter with Lauper were beamed all around the world, weaving WWE into the fabric of pop culture in the process. A victim of backstage politics, this would be Richter's only WrestleMania match. I guess if you're only gonna have one, it may as well be one as important as this. Number 289, Money Inc. vs. The Mega Maniacs for the WWE titles at WrestleMania 9. Before he ruined the night by claiming the WWE title for himself, Hulk Hogan made his long-awaited return to WWE in the middle of the card, teaming with a face mask sporting Brutus Beefcake to take on the tag champs Money Inc. The match itself was a mess. Brutus and Hogan using Beefcake's mask as a weapon, Ted and Irwin using the Halliburton, ref bumps, Jimmy Hart pretending to be a ref for some reason. This match had it all. Jimmy counted a pin for the babyface win, but Danny Davis reversed the decision because Jimmy Hart clearly isn't a referee, the megaphone loving fraud. Number 288, tag team number one contenders elimination match at WrestleMania 13. The transition from new generation to Attitude Era was lovely and all, but not necessarily great for tag team wrestling. Consider this Four Corners elimination match. You had the underrated but unpopular Doug Furness and Phil LaFon, the all right I guess, Godwins, the good in the ring but dated gimmick New Blackjacks, and the Headbangers, who were crowd favourites for about five strange minutes. The four teams brawled for a little while with lots of quick tags, including the nonsensical teammate versus teammate scenario, before the moshes in skirts got the win. Their prize was a match against either Bulldog and Owen or Mankind and Vader. Good luck, guys. Number 287, Dino Bravo versus Ronnie Garvin at WrestleMania 5. Ronnie Garvin's WWE run wasn't long and came at the end of his career, but he could still go in ring. Here, in his only WrestleMania appearance, he took on Dino Bravo. The match started slowly, but the two veterans soon quickened up. The crowd were very anti-Bravo, loudly chanting, "You." USA! 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 Despite Garvin also being from Montreal. But Bravo got the win with a side slam. It was the right call as Bravo would soon feud with the Ultimate Warrior over the IC title. Post-match, Rugged Ronnie hit the famous Garvin stomp on Bravo's manager, Frenchie Martin, to give Hands of Stone his heat back. Number 286, Taz and the APA versus Right to Censor at WrestleMania X7. A thinly veiled dig at the parents' television council, the Right to Censor hated all things fun in WWE, namely violence, knockers, and swearing, and were a pain in the ass to the majority of the lower card in the early 2000s. Their last ride came at WrestleMania X7, as the team of the good father, Bull Buchanan, and Val Venus took on the APA and Taz. Unfortunately, this was Taz a little past his prime, and he didn't do much but brawl with the RTC before Bradshaw took Goodfather's head off with a clothesline from hell for the win. Number 285, Mark Henry vs Ryback at WrestleMania 29. Ryback was being built back up after his bungled booking against CM Punk, and engaged in a big willy-waving competition with Mark Henry on SmackDown. I mean, not literally, but bench press challenges, hitting their finishes on Drew McIntyre in a I'm a harder than you display, things like that. It's all led up to Wrestle Mania, where the two had a lumbering eight-minute-long match. Ryback tried hitting the shell shock to no avail. Henry won by.
by falling on Ryback, but Ryback got his momentum back post-match. You know when something just doesn't feel like a WrestleMania match? This was that. Number 284, Braun Strowman vs Goldberg for the Universal title at WrestleMania 36 Night 1. Do you know what's great? When Goldberg comes out of retirement, takes the Universal title off an up-and-coming superstar, then drops it easily at WrestleMania, devaluing the previous champ in the process. It happened to Kevin Owens in 2017, and it happened to The Fiend in 2020, with Goldberg squashing the monster with ease for the Universal title before dropping it to Braun Strowman in two minutes. The match was fun but limited, a bit like Goldberg and Braun themselves really, but it shouldn't have been for the Universal title, and it sorely needed a live crowd or wacky stipulation. At least Braun finally got his hands on some serious gold after so many abandoned pushes before this one. Number 283, Billy Jack Haynes versus Hercules at WrestleMania 3. Look, it's Dr. Death Steve Williams on his way to a Swiss disco. Oh wait, sorry, it's Billy Jack Haynes on his way to a Hoss fight. Hoss's Haynes and Hercules competed in a full Nelson challenge at Mania 3, with the two beating the bollocks off of each other in a battle for full Nelson superiority. Haynes eventually locked it in outside the ring and both men got counted out, a lame ending to a fun match. Afterwards, Hercules and Bobby Heenan beat Haynes to a bloody pulp with a chain, which was admittedly a visually striking beatdown. Number 282, Jeff Jarrett and Owen Hart versus D'Lo Brown and Test for the tag titles at WrestleMania 15. After winning a number one contender's battle royal earlier in the night on Heat, Test and D'Lo Brown took on champs Owen and Jeff, who were in the midst of their one and only run with the straps. This was Test's WrestleMania debut, but as he and D'Lo were thrown together on a whim, the likelihood of him coming out with a win was slim. The champs were a cohesive unit, using double team moves and ring generalship to gain control, eventually getting the victory while Test was distracted by Ivory, Deborah, Terry and Jacqueline having a big argument outside the ring. Number 281, Randy Savage vs One Man Gang WWE Title Tournament Semi-Final at WrestleMania 4. It's tournament time again! This was Savage's third match of the night and One Man Gang's second as he got a bye in the quarters. Could the Macho Man overcome the odds? Of course he could, it's only the One Man Gang. Gang gave it his all using his size and power to keep Savage at bay, but Macho soon came back with his typically intense offense. One Man Gang said bugger this and he and Slick decked Savage with a cane for the DQ loss. Gang mate, that's the closest you'll ever get to the WWE title. Savage was through to the final, but would he be able to compete? Well, yeah, yes he would. Number 280, Rick Martel versus Coco Beware at WrestleMania 6. A year on from his heel turn on Strike Force partner Tito Santana, Rick Martel was hitting his stride as the amazingly arseholish model and took on Coco Beware in WrestleMania 6's opener. The crowd absolutely loved Coco and Frankie, hated Martel, and were thoroughly invested in the match. The model and the Birdman went back and forth for a few minutes until Coco missed a running crossbody and soon tapped to the Boston Crab. Short, sweet, and to the point, good characters and a hot crowd, perfect choice for an opening match. Number 279, Lex Luger versus Mr. Perfect at WrestleMania 9. One of the greatest to have never won the WWE title took on another wrestler to have never won the WWE title in a fairly decent match. Luger was fresh in the Fed after the collapse of the WBF, and the story of Narcissist versus Perfectionist practically wrote itself. Interestingly, Luger called most of the match after Perfect blanked on the plan, the two playing a game of like for like with matching near falls and rope breaks. Luger eventually got the win with a backslide, while Perfect was attacked post match by Shawn Michaels and drilled with Luger's metal forearm. Rough night for Hennig. Number 278, Demolition versus the Colossal Connection for the WWE Tag Titles at WrestleMania 6. The two fellas you'd least like to upset in a bar, the Colossal Connection, had been tag team champions for four months, but previous champs Demolition wanted the straps back. This was basically a Haku versus Demolition handicap match, with Andre leaning in with a slap or two for good measure as the giant was in serious pain and didn't tag in once. This would be one of his final matches matches in WWE. Demolition eventually got the win and their third go with the gold after nailing a Demolition decapitation on Haku. After the bell, an irate Bobby Heenan slapped Andre before getting utterly pasted by the eighth wonder of the world. 
Number 277, the Colognes versus Miz and Morrison in a Lumberjack Tag Title Unification match on the WrestleMania 25 pre-show. If ever a pre-show match was worthy enough of the main card, it was this. WWE Tag Champs the Colognes defeating World Tag Champs Miz and Morrison in a title unification match. But no, to the pre-show with you. I get it, not everything can be on the main card, but surely they could have swapped this with Santina Morella's Battle Royal Triumph, eh? The build was more notable than the match, to be honest, with Miz and Morrison on the dirt sheet sporting anus masks. Because cologne sounds like colon, get it? That's not to say the match was bad, it just felt a little underwhelming. In fact, doubly so considering the stakes. Number 276, Tito Santana versus The Executioner at WrestleMania 1. The first ever match at the first ever WrestleMania saw Tito Santana take on The Executioner. Yep, we started the most important show in WWE. WWE's history to that point with an unknown heel. Tito was feuding with IC champion Greg Valentine, but the champ wouldn't defend against Santana. So in came the undefeated Executioner, aka Playboy Buddy Rose in a gimp mask. The Executioner was indeed undefeated as this was the first ever WWE match for the gimmick, and it also proved to be the last. Still, the crowd popped hard for Tito, who got the win with the figure four leg lock. It did its job as an opener, even if it wasn't very inspiring. Inspired. Number 275, Braun Strowman and Nicholas versus Cesaro and Sheamus for the Raw Tag Titles at WrestleMania 34. Big Braun needed a tag partner to take on tag champ Sheamus and Cesaro, and at WrestleMania 34, he sauntered through the crowd looking for the perfect ally, eventually choosing 10-year-old Nicholas. I mean, Braun, New Japan greats Okada, Tanahashi, and Suzuki were all in attendance, but whatever floats your boat. The match itself was pretty fun as the bar battered Braun and Cesaro threatened to eat Nicholas. Braun turned it all around though, and he and a literal child became tag champs. They relinquished the belts the next night on Raw as Nicholas had school commitments. Classic excuse. Number 274, The Undertaker versus Jimmy Snooker at WrestleMania 7. The Undertaker was the new monster on the block, having debuted four months before WrestleMania 7 and needed a credible victory over a big star to cement his status in WWE. Jimmy Snooker stepped up and the Superfly duly became the first victim victim of the streak, getting awkwardly tombstoned after four minutes to make the dead man 1-0. This was a glorified squash. Undertaker was in unstoppable monster mode, and Snooker bumped around to make him look absolutely mustard. It's worth noting that Snooker was the owner of his own WrestleMania streak, with the Superfly never winning a single match at the showcase of the Immortals. Number 273, WWE vs NFL Battle Royal at WrestleMania 2. The Chicago portion of WrestleMania 2 saw a 20-man WWE vs NFL Battle Royal take place. Featuring a whole host of future WWE Hall of Famers and some American football players. Look, I don't know anything about the NFL, let alone 1980s NFL. The Fridge was in there though, I've heard of him. Don't forget a name like that, do ya? Andre the Giant eventually got the win, last eliminating Bret Hart in what had been a prominent showing for the Hitman. Inexcusable though were the eliminations of both Pedro Morales and Bruno Sammartino. Two of the longest reigning WWE champions ever in their only ever WrestleMania match getting quietly tossed out of a battle royal. The disrespect. Number 272, China versus Ivory for the women's title at WrestleMania X7. Bored of battering all the men in WWE, China said, I've never fought for the women's title, have I? I'll be having a bit of that, and entered into a feud with champion Ivory. Leading up to X7, China broke her neck in a fairly tasteless storyline and had to promise not to prosecute Ivory if she re-injured her at WrestleMania. No worries there though, as China beat the literal arse out of Ivory, squashing the champ in a little over two measly minutes to begin her one and only run with the women's title. Number 271. Sheamus vs Daniel Bryan for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 28. The bro kick heard around the world as we saw Sheamus annihilate Daniel Bryan for the World Heavyweight title in 18 seconds. Now, before you get all angry all over again, just consider what this match achieved. This was ground zero for the Yes Movement, the driving force behind Bryan's evolution into one of the most popular wrestlers of all time, and the amazing events of WrestleMania 30. Who knows how Bryan's career would have gone without this match? This 18 second loss led to over 78,000 people chanting yes for the majority of WrestleMania and the night after on Raw. Vince and the powers that be 
had no choice but to notice. Number 270, Trish Stratus versus Christy Hemi for the women's title at WrestleMania 21. Look, it's Billy Jack Haynes on his way to a women's title match. Oh, wait, it's Trish Stratus dressed like a yodeler for some reason. Women's champ Trish was beefing with Diva Search winner Christy Hemi because the latter had done Playboy, so Christy enlisted the help of Stratus's rival Lita to coach her for this title match. Hemi was green and a little awkward, but did better than expected as Trish controlled the flow of the match. In a strange twist, the Playboy cover star lost at WrestleMania, Trish getting the win back with the chick kick in four minutes. Number 269, Team Johnny versus Team Teddy at WrestleMania 28. Two things no WWE fan cared about in 2012, SmackDown and Raw's rivalry and authority figures. Naturally, we were treated to a match that involved both on the grandest stage. John Laurinaitis and Teddy Long were feuding over who was the better GM and agreed to a winner runs both shows 12-man tag team match. This quickly became a messy brawl, with Zack Ryder running wild before an Eve Torres distraction caused him to get pinned and then kicked in the woo-woos after the match. Just remember, if Vince didn't make you a star, you are not allowed to shine. Ultimately, Team Johnny picked up the win and he took control of both brands. Number 268, Rick Rude versus Jimmy Snooker at WrestleMania 6. Ravishing Rick Rude was being earmarked for a WWE title feud in the summer of 1990, so in the days before Raw, a WrestleMania win was the best platform to make him look good and strong. His opponent? Jimmy Snooker. Superfly got the early advantage, even mocking Rude's swiveling hips, but Mustache Rick soon turned it around, taking advantage of a Snooker mistake before hitting the rude awakening and getting the win. Coming in at just under four minutes, it was a quick match, but it accomplished what it set out to do. Would have been better if it had gone on a little longer, though. Number 267, Roddy Piper versus Bad News Brown at WrestleMania 6. Roddy Piper is a true wrestling legend, one of the greatest promos and characters of all time, but what in the name of sweet Jesus was he thinking at WrestleMania 6? That's right, Hot Rod decided to paint half of his body black in all order to get under Bad News Brown's skin, and it is miraculous that Brown didn't beat Piper to a bloody pulp for real after that little stunt. The two did have a fun balls-to-the-wall brawl, complete with Piper putting on a Michael Jackson glove and disco dancing. Again, I don't even... Oh, this match will live on in infamy, and not for the right reasons. Number 266, Big Boss Man and Bull Buchanan versus The Godfather and D'Lo Brown at WrestleMania 2000. Grab your bitches, yelled Ice-T, as he heralded babyface sex trafficker Godfather and associate D'Lo Brown in a scene which has aged very, very well. The former nation teammates were taking on enforcers of the law, Big Boss Man and Bull Buchanan, and as this was the Attitude Era, the crowd were well up for it. It was a good choice for an opener, as both teams gelled well, and the crowd lapped up every second of it. The Law got the win after a gorgeous guillotine leg drop by Buchanan, before stalking the Godfather's hose to the back like a pair of Jerry Lawlers. Number 265, King Harley Race vs Junkyard Dog in a loser must bow match at WrestleMania 3. The first king of the WWE, Harley Race, felt disrespected by the Junkyard Dog, so the two engaged in a loser must bow match. JYD was all over Race, pummeling the legendary NWA champ with headbutt after headbutt. Race was looking old and some way past his best, but that didn't stop him going for a diving headbutt off the apron, the mad old sod. Eventually, Race's associates, Bobby Heenan and Fabulous Moolah, caused a distraction, leading to a lovely belly to belly and a win for the king. JYD bowed, walloped Race with a chair, then ran off with his cape and crown. Saw loser. Number 264, Ted DiBiase vs Don Morocco WWE title tournament at WrestleMania 4. One of the quarterfinal bouts of the WrestleMania 4 title tournament saw Don Morocco vs Ted DiBiase after the pair had defeated Dino Bravo and Jim Duggan, respectively. Morocco used his size and strength to his advantage and could smell blood in the water as Ted was flying solo thanks to Hogan disposing of Andre and Virgil earlier in the night. Morocco's strength was not enough, though, as Ted DiBiase used ring savvy and sneaky tactics to gain control of the match and get the win. As Hogan and Andre got double DQ'd, this win saw DiBiase skip the semis and head straight to the final. Number 263, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal on the WrestleMania 33 pre-show. The fourth Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal was easily the best because my best friend in the whole world, Mojo Rawley, won the match and the big shiny trophy. 
Okay, so maybe it wasn't the best, but it was still an enjoyable affair despite some weird creative decisions, like not only having Braun Strowman in this match, but not having him win the bloody thing. Mojo got the W with help from his second best friend, Rob Gronkowski, who jumped the railing to fight Jinder Mahal, despite the world's greatest security guard trying to stop him. Should have let her win the battle royal if you ask me. Number 262, Primo and Epico versus Justin Gabriel and Tyson Kidd versus The Usos for the WWE Tag Titles on the WrestleMania 28 pre-show. A five-minute multi-team pre-show tag match could be any WrestleMania in the last 10 years, to be honest. The tag division is now the go-to to get as many people on the card outside of Battle Royals. Despite only going for five minutes, the three teams packed a lot in, unfortunately including a nasty elbow injury for Justin Gabriel as the champs retained. A good match featuring six very talented wrestlers, but it was hard to get invested. WWE really hasn't been bothered about tag team wrestling for ages now, and if they don't book matches with some meat behind them, then why should we even care? Number 261, The Undertaker vs Big Show and A-Train at WrestleMania 19. Give it up for WWE's favourite band in the whole world, Limp Bizkit! Fred Durst and co played Undertaker down the ramp as he prepared for a tag match. Wait, did I say tag match? I meant handicap match. This was meant to be The Undertaker teaming with Nathan Jones, but WWE pooped the bed and had the big Aussie removed from the match at the last minute because he was rubbish. So it was up to Big Evil to defeat Big Show and Big Train on his lonesome. Jones did eventually turn up though, helping Taker on his way to a routine victory. Number 260, AJ Lee and Page versus the Bella Twins at WrestleMania 31. The Goths took on the popular kids at WrestleMania 31, as Page and AJ teamed up to take on the nefarious Bella Twins. Unfortunately, the two teams didn't mesh very well and everything just felt a bit off. Even worse, this match happened right after the Triple H Sting match, so the crowd were pretty worn out. Add the crap booking of AJ being incapacitated for half the match on the floor, and you end up with a fairly humdrum affair. A massive shame this, as it would prove to be AJ Lee's last WrestleMania. She retired the week after. Number 259, Samoa Joe vs Rey Mysterio for the US title at WrestleMania 35. Samoa Joe and Rey Mysterio had crossed paths a few times in the hunt for the US title, with the Samoan submission machine besting Rey, Andrade and our truth for the strap in March 2019. The stage was set one month later for a true dream match, Samoa Joe vs Rey Mysterio one on one. Joe destroyed him in a minute. While it could be seen as a damp squib, it was precisely the booking Joe needed to give his main roster run a kick up the bum, and necessary due to the fact that Ray was nursing an ankle injury going into the bout. Also, it's always fun to see Mysterio get thrown around like a little toy. Sorry, Ray. Number 258, Jake Roberts versus Andre the Giant with special guest referee Big John Studd at WrestleMania 5. Andre the Giant hated snakes more than Indiana Jones, Mice, and St. Patrick combined. More than those things hate snakes, we mean. We're not suggesting that Andre had a burning hatred for Harrison Ford. In this match, Jake Roberts' game plan was simple. Let Damian loose and score the cheap win on the eighth wonder of the world. Big John Studd was officiating, and he and Andre bickered throughout, leading to the two big men and leathering each other as Jake had a fist fight with Ted DiBiase. Damien eventually came out to say hi, Andre ran for the hills, and Stud called for the DQ. A bit of a mess, sure, but a fun mess. DiBiase and Jake's scrapping in particular was great, and the crowd enjoyed it. Number 257, Hunter Hearst Helmsley vs Goldust at WrestleMania 13. After a career low from the fallout of the curtain call, Helmsley was back on the up. He had dropped the IC title to Rocky Maivia, but picked up a new feud with Goldust heading into WrestleMania 13. Hunter had his new bodyguard China watching his back, and the two would ultimately be too much for Goldust and manager Marlena to handle. Goldie did enjoy spells of the match in control, but the Bizarre One's focus slipped, and China started ragdolling Marlena around like an excited toddler with a teddy after a can of Coke. Hunter dropped Dustin with a pedigree for the win. Number 256, Big Show and Kane versus Carly and Chris Masters for the World Tag Titles at WrestleMania 22. The WWE Tag Divisions in 2006 were a bit, well, pants. 
Kane and Big Show were Raw champs, defeating the likes of the Heartthrobs, Val Venus and Viscera, and Snitsky and Tomko before feuding with Carlito and Chris Masters. Not exactly legendary duos, are they? The champs easily disposed of the young fellas in a fun opening match, but lost the titles the next night to the Spirit Squad, making this whole affair seem rather pointless. Why job Carlito and Masters out? Could they not have won here? Or just bring the whole Spirit Squad angle forward by a few weeks if that's the end game? Odd. Number 255, the Women's Battle Royal on the WrestleMania 34 pre-show. The inaugural fabulous moolah uh, WrestleMania Women's Battle Royal was a much hyped affair, but due in part to the naming controversy, was quietly pushed to the pre-show. Featuring 20 women compared to the 30-man Andre Battle Royal, this was your standard Mania Battle Royal and featured a nice short showcase for the women of NXT. At the end, Bailey duped BFF Sasha Banks for the win, not realizing Naomi was still in the match. A flying ass to the face, and Naomi was the winner of the trophy, which incidentally looked like a big plastic uterus. Number 254, China and Too Cool versus the Radicals at WrestleMania 2000. Latino Heat had designs on China, but utterly repulsed the ninth wonder of the world, so naturally they both rounded up their mates and had a tag match. The crowd were hot for China, especially as she battered Dean Malenko and Perry Saturn like they were nothing. She even threw out some dance moves with Grandmaster Sexy looking quite like your mum drunk at a christening. After avoiding a beating for most of the match, the end came as Eddie got absolutely destroyed by China, who crushed his plums, powerbombed him, press slammed him, and sleeper slammed him for the win. Number 253, The Usos versus The Dudley Boys on the WrestleMania 32 pre-show. The Dudley's first WrestleMania in 14 years saw them forego the tables, seeking to prove that they were the best team on planet Earth on merit alone. Taking on perennial pre-show legends The Usos, Bubba and Devon were determined determined to win without enlisting the wood. They meshed well, it would be hard not to seeing as both teams are excellent, but only got five minutes to get their shtick in. Usos picked up the win with stereo super kicks, then gave the Dudleys a taste of their own medicine by splashing them through tables, making sure the crowd got some wood at least. Hmm. Number 252, the British Bulldog versus the Warlord at WrestleMania 7. Here come some beefy lads. They're gonna smack each other. Bulldog was the biggest he'd ever been and Warlord wasn't far off him. You would be fair in assuming that a match between such massive men would be slow and boring, but it was a great mixture of power moves and some surprising agility. The two went back and forth, displaying some neat chemistry and in-ring understanding of one another. Warlord eventually slapped on the full Nelson, the default big man submission hold, before Davey fought out and nailed the running power slam for the three counts. Number 251, the Hardcore Battle Royal for the Hardcore title at WrestleMania 2000. This was a battle royal with a difference. Instead of throwing people over the top, it was all about who could last the 15 minutes as hardcore champion. The action spilled all over the arena as the title was hot potatoed around, with perennial jobbers Pete Gas, Joey Abs, and Rodney all getting time as the champ. Says a lot about what WWE thought of the title. Hardcore Holly eventually reigned supreme, pinning Little Cousin Crash as the timer ran out in what was actually a botched finish. Oh, and by the way, Taz was in here too, just a few months after debuting against Kurt Angle at the Royal Rumble in Madison Square Garden. How the mighty had fallen. Number 250, Show Miz versus John Morrison and R-Truth for the unified tag team titles at WrestleMania 26. The odd on paper but good in reality pairing of Big Show with US champion The Miz were only together a few months, but managed to win the unified tag titles. At WrestleMania 26, Show Miz defeated Morrison and Truth in the opener, and while the match delivered, the four men didn't have enough time to put on a stellar bout, with this one over in around three minutes. Still, the two teams made the most of their time and couldn't have done much more. WWE should have arguably gone with Miz vs Morrison for the US title instead, but maybe that's just me. Number 249, Big Show vs Cody Rhodes for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 28. Despite being a multi-time world
world champion and bigger than three cows, Big Show's WrestleMania record was embarrassing, with Captain Insano failing to register a singles win. Until Mania 28. IC champ Cody Rhodes had been mocking Show for weeks for his crap Mania record, which is like mocking a grizzly bear for not catching enough fish. In both scenarios, you're likely to get eaten. Show was fired up, finally spearing Cody out of his shoes before sending his jaw to the moon with a knockout punch. A feel-good moment, a title change, and a shot of Big Show's lovely little grin. Ah. Number 248, Virgil vs. Ted DiBiase at WrestleMania 7. Long-term booking is nice, isn't it? It's a pity the WWE sometimes can't be asked doing it anymore. They made it work with Virgil of all people, with Ted DiBiase's bodyguard breaking free from his employer and fighting back after years of abuse. Virgil was coached by Roddy Piper in the run-up to this match and was dominant from the off, the crowd even chanting Virgil, Virgil, Virgil at one point, likely inspiring decades of convention hustling. Ted made his former employee look like a million bucks Bucks and lost by countout after brawling with Piper with Sensational Sherry getting involved too. Still a fun match even if the finish could have been more decisive. Number 247, Taka Mishinoku vs Aguila for the light heavyweight title at WrestleMania 14. While nothing on WCW's legendary cruiserweight division, WWE's light heavyweight division did have some good moments, including this match between Taka Mishinoku and Aguila. Taka was the centerpiece of the division and was the first and reigning champion heading into Mania 14, while Aguila was a 19-year-old S.A. Rios in a mask. The two had a very fast-paced high-flying match with plenty of dives to the outside, moonsaults, hurricane ranas, and the like. Taka got the win after five minutes and both competitors shook hands. Lovely stuff. Fun fact, this would actually be the only WrestleMania outing for the light heavyweight title and for Aguila. Number 246, Kane versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania 28. Randall Keith and the Big Red Machine produced an all right match at Mania 28, all stemming from the fact that Kane once shook Orton's hand and then realized he wasn't a monster anymore. Flimsy setup aside, this wasn't bad, and the reborn monster Kane got the win with a sweet second rope choke slam. But as with any match featuring Kane and Randy Orton, it wasn't the most fast paced. Not that it was plodding, but if this match didn't exist and I just said Randy Orton versus Kane, you would know what to expect. Second rope choke slam though. That was neat. Number 245, The Miz versus Wade Barrett for the Intercontinental title on the WrestleMania 29 pre-show. What a difference two years makes. From headlining WrestleMania 27 as WWE champ to curtain jerking the pre-show for the IC title, The Miz had slid right down the card. Even worse, this feud with Wade Barrett was about who was the better actor because of The Miz's role in the Marine 3. I kid you not. Still, we got a good back and forth match. Both men unsuccessfully went for their finishers before Miz locked in his piss poor figure four for the win, his second IC title, and also proved that he was the superior actor, I guess. Number 244, Victoria vs Molly Holly, women's title vs hair match at WrestleMania 20. For only the second time in WrestleMania history, hair was on the line as Molly Holly took on women's champion Victoria in a hair versus title match. Victoria had taken the title from Molly a few weeks earlier and the former champ was raging, channeling that aggression into her in-ring work. However, it would be to Molly's detriment as when she went to hit Victoria with the champ's own finisher, she was reversed and pinned, losing the match and her hair. To be fair to Molly, the shaved head actually suited her and the stipulation was one that she herself had pitched in order to make it on to the WrestleMania card. Number 243, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal on the WrestleMania 35 pre-show. The main story leading up to Andre Royal 5 was that Saturday Night Live stars Colin Jost and Michael Che were going to be involved. The comedians mixed it up with the likes of Way Too Good For This Match, EC3, Bobby Roode and The Hardys. At the end, Big Braun Strowman got hung up on the top rope with a big boot and it looked like Creepy Colin was actually gonna win, but luckily Braun composed himself and hurled Col over the top into the arms of the Hardys, Andrade, Apollo Crews, and Jinder Mahal. Nice that they stuck around to catch him, really. Number 242, Hercules versus King Haku at WrestleMania 5. The opening match of WrestleMania 5, Big Sweaty Hercules versus the world's actual most dangerous man, King Haku. 
Herc was in full babyface mode here and dished out loads of power moves from the off, only losing the advantage when he took his eye off Haku so he could try and hassle former manager Bobby Heenan. Scary Meng was in control for a while, but Hercules came back strong and got the win with a back suplex pin in seven minutes. A big win for Hercules here, but unfortunately he did not become king as Haku's monarchy was not on the line. Number 241, Yokozuna and Owen Hart versus the Smoking Guns for the tag team titles at WrestleMania 11. Owen Hart needed a partner, so called upon Yokozuna, because he once beat Bret Hart so was worthy in the Rocket's eyes. Despite being vastly outmatched, the guns put up a good fight using tag team offense and psychology to get the advantage over the thrown together team of Owen and Yoko. However, Yokozuna was a former two-time WWE champion at this point and wasn't going down without a fight. A Banzai drop on Billy Gunn later and Owen covered for the win and the gold. And there you have it, the right team won, even if they didn't wear cool matching cowboy hats. Number 240, the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov versus the US Express for the WWE tag titles at WrestleMania 1. America equals yay, non-America equals boo. And that concludes our intensive three-week course on 80s American pro wrestling. Wyndham and Rotunda were a very slick team and were treated like heroes as they attempted to stop the evil Sheik and Volkov. But never underestimate the sneakiness of heels, especially no good foreign ones, as Sheik struck Wyndham with Freddy Blassie's cane during a period of mayhem, leading to the win and the titles. This was the right call, as Wyndham and Rotunda were not long for the Federation, regaining the belts in June before slinking off to the AWA in August. Number 239, Hulk Hogan versus Sergeant Slaughter for the WWE title at WrestleMania 7. One of the most controversial storylines in WWE history saw Sergeant Slaughter turn his back on the USA and praise Saddam Hussein during the actual Gulf War. It was therefore up to the most American man ever, Hulk Hogan, to restore glory to the Stars and Stripes. This angle played out in front of a greatly reduced audience, Mania 7 taking place in a 16k seat arena, whereas WrestleMania 6 the year before had been a 68k sellout. The match itself was a fairly ordinary brawl, as a blood-drenched Terry dispatched Slaughter to start his third reign as WWE Champion. Not terrible by any means, but overshadowed by the storyline going into it. Number 238, The Can-Am Connection versus Bob Orton and Don Morocco at WrestleMania 3. The opener of WrestleMania 3 saw super white meat babyfaces Tom Zenk and Rick Martel take on the dastardly Bob Orton and Don Morocco. The connection worked well together, employing plenty of double team offense to keep the heels at bay before the baddies got control. When the connection got back on top, the crowd popped, and Mania started with a happy babyface win as Martel hit a crossbody on Morocco. A basic 80s tag match that didn't reinvent the wheel, but it didn't need to. The action was good, and the huge crowd enjoyed it. Number 237, Elias versus King Corbin at WrestleMania 36, Night 1. All that dastardly Corbin with his pantomime villain qualities and his ridiculous crown and cape. Oh, he's such a nasty so-and-so. So nasty that he decided to bash Elias off a balcony like Mufasa in one of the corniest WWE segments of the last decade. By the way, this was written before Orton, Wyatt, and Bliss decided to turn Raw into a weekly B-movie. But back to Elias and Corbin. Would the Drifter get his revenge at WrestleMania? Well, if you called getting a surprise roll-up pin revenge, then yes. Yes, he did. Number 236, Kane versus Triple H at WrestleMania 15. Kane was in the corporation, then wasn't, and attacked Triple H, who was with China, then wasn't. Both men tried to set fire to one another as backs were stabbed left, right, and center. The Attitude Era. Honestly, this was a confusing mess heading into WrestleMania, which got weirder thanks to a Pete Rose chicken attack on Kane, the Mean Street posse hanging around like a bad smell, and Trips and Kane fighting all over the place. China went to hit Triple H with a chair, but double-crossed Kane and blasted him with it before Hunter got the pedigree onto the steel and was disqualified. Neither man's finest hour, not helped by the million distractions. Number 235, Kalisto versus Ryback for the US title on the WrestleMania 32 pre-show. Oh yeah, Kalisto was United States champion for a bit, wasn't he? Forgot about that. The Lucha Dragon actually had a successful run with the strap, beating Alberto Del Rio before crossing paths with a refocused Ryback. The big guy was back to his jobber squashing ways, but fell victim to the all-conquering Kalisto after a Salida del Sol at around the 9 minute mark. 
Ryback was done. There was no coming back from this. Several months later, he was gone from WWE, while Kalisto dropped the strap to Rusev at Extreme Rules. Number 234, Kane and Rikishi versus D-Generation X at WrestleMania 2000. Kane was courting Tori, who ditched him for his best mate X-Pac, who attacked Kane with a flamethrower. Completely normal, that. Wanting retribution, Kane teamed with Rikishi to take on the DX team of Waltman and Road Dog, and the two big men quickly knocked the stuffing out of the crotch-chopping rascals. This all led to the big post-match angle of Kane attacking the San Diego chicken, thinking it was Pete Rose, as the baseball legend ran in with a bat, but was promptly chokeslammed and stink-faced for his trouble. Number 233, Diamond Dallas Page vs Christian for the European title at WrestleMania 18. Despite being one of WCW's hottest stars, DDP was turned into mid-card fodder by WWE, saddling him with the positively Page life coach gimmick. DDP mentored Christian and got him to stop having tantrums, but Christian soon turned on Page and set his eyes on the European title. They had a good but basic match, with each man reversing out of the other's finisher before the diamond cutter was hit out of nowhere for the three. Christian, understandably, threw a wobbler in the ring. Trivia time! This was DDP's first WrestleMania appearance since chauffeuring Rhythm and Blues at WrestleMania 6. Number 232, the Cruiserweight title open at WrestleMania 20. And now for something completely different, a 10-man gauntlet match for Chavo Guerrero's Cruiserweight title. A match of two halves, this. The first saw Jamie Noble punking everyone out, while the second half was the Rey Mysterio show. Quick and fun with some big spots, the New York crowd were absolutely into this, loudly chanting Guido at ECW alumnus Nunzio and popping for Tajiri's Tarantula. The final two were Rey and Chavo, with Charvito getting the win with a sunset flip reversal, added leverage supplied via his dad, Chavo Classic. Number 231, The Usos vs Los Matadores vs The Real Americans vs Rybaxel in a tag team elimination match on the WrestleMania 30 pre-show. One benefit of being on the WrestleMania pre-show is that you may get more time than if you were on the main card. Such was the tag title elimination match at WrestleMania 30. Going a hefty 16 minutes, tag champs The Usos successfully defended against The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, pinning The Real Americans after a double superkick to retain the tag titles. Cesaro and Swagger did most of the work in the match, getting the other two eliminations, but their loss led to an argument and a breakup of the team. Number 230, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 32. The strangest armbar was the third one. Down from 31 men to 20 men, we saw usual suspects like Heath Slater, Curtis Axel and The Ascension rubbing shoulders with legends like DDP and Tatonka. Oh, and only bloody Shaquille O'Neal too! Yes, after years of what-ifs, we finally had Shaq in a WWE ring squaring off against Big Show. It all boiled down to Kane and NXT star Baron Corbin back when he still looked like Argus Filch from Harry Potter. The up-and-comer got the win to everyone's surprise back before everyone was sick of him. Poor Corbin, he's only doing his job. Number 229, Razor Ramon vs Jeff Jarrett for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 11. Is this the most new generation mid-card match ever? Razor and Jeff worked well together, going back and forth for the best part of 13 minutes, but that pesky roadie just had to keep getting involved. 1-2-3-Kid ran in dressed like a B-rate Kung Lao, and Karate kicked the two country music fellas in the chops until refs and agents came out to break it up. A good match, an even better post-match brawl, but it didn't feel like a proper WrestleMania blow-off. Number 228, Randy Orton vs Bray Wyatt for the WWE title at WrestleMania 33. Now for a reading from the big book of WWE missteps. For years, we wanted Bray Wyatt to be taken seriously by management, and when they finally gave him the WWE title, we all rejoiced. Randy Orton soon joined the Wyatt family, where he wore a sleeveless hoodie and talked a little bit less. Then he set fire to Sister Abigail's resting place. I know, said Bray. I'll project pictures of insects onto the canvas three times. That'll show him. It didn't work. Orton won the belt, and the status quo was restored. Blech. 
Number 227, Billy and Chuck versus the APA versus the Dudley Boys versus the Hardy Boys in a tag title elimination match at WrestleMania 18. WWE's run of show-stealing tag title matches ended at WrestleMania 18, with this confusing mess of a Four Corners elimination bout. Billy and Chuck were champs and had to deal with the Dudleys, Hardys, and the APA. Luckily, the APA were quickly eliminated after a 3D, but then it became a bit messy as people were in and out, and not even JR knew who was legal. Devon took a massive bump from the top through a table on the outside in the only real talking point of the match, as the Hardys eliminated the Dudleys before the champs retained with a belt shot. Not awful, but considering the standard set in the previous two years, you expected a little more. Number 226, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 31. It's time for Andre 2, Electric Boogaloo, as the Memorial Battle Royal made its second appearance at Mania 31 on the pre-show. Big Show won so they could have him pose next to the statue of his kayfabe dad, WCW kids, that one's for you, but the fans wanted the Miz's stunt double Damian Mizdow to be the winner. The master of acting even lasted until the final two, eliminating the Miz as the crowd went absolutely berserk with joy. The wrong man won, but I suppose the Big Show visual was kinda cool. And oh look, there's Hideo Itami! Moving on. Number 225, Brock Lesnar vs Roman Reigns for the Universal title at WrestleMania 34. The Roman Reigns experiment, take four, action! Surprise, surprise, Roman was in the main event again, and the crowd still weren't buying it, booing the big dog without mercy. To be fair to the crowd, this was a repetitive match at the end of a very, very long show. A match that seemingly consisted of only spears and F5s, like a weird demo mode of a WWE 2K game. Brock eventually got the win after a sixth F5, as the crowd chanted boring, CM Punk, and whatever else they could think of. Not a patch on their match three years earlier, and a flat note to end the show on too. Number 224, Big Boss Man vs Mr. Perfect for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 7. Cobb County's favourite son had his hands full when he took on Mr. Perfect, but was he bothered? No, as he not only wiped his ass with Perfect's towel, but spat in his face. Just a quick reminder, Bossman was the baby face here. This was as you would expect, fire and brawling from Bossman, top-notch wrestling and antics from Perfect. Bobby Heenan eventually attacked Bossman, only for a returning Andre the Giant to come out and even the score to a big ovation. Haku and Barbarian then rushed Bossman for the DQ, as everyone brawled around the ring. Number 223, the ECW Originals versus the New Breed at WrestleMania 23. Ah, WWE CW, you poor misguided thing, you, with your lack of authenticity and your abundance of crowd apathy. Strange to think that the reborn ECW got a place on the WrestleMania 23 card, doubly so considering Ric Flair was in the goddamn dark match. Still, was surreal to see Sandman and Sabu at a WrestleMania teaming with RVD and Tommy Dreamer to silence the new breed of Marcus Corbin. Vaughn, Elijah Burke, Matt Stryker, and Kevin Thorne. The eight men had an ordinary tag match without a table or crowd brawl in sight, ending when RVD nailed Stryker with the five-star frog splash. Number 222, Greg Valentine versus Ricky Steamboat in the WWE title tournament at WrestleMania 4. Ah, oh, look at Ricky Steamboat with his baby son in matching outfits. I hope he wins. The Dragon took on the hammer in the first round of the title tournament, and the two worked well together at one point chopping the absolute fart out of one another. Steamboat went for a big crossbody, but Valentine rolled through, grabbed the tights, and advanced in the tournament. So why did Ricky lose, especially after his epic with Savage the year before? Well, after Steamboat won the IC title at WrestleMania 3, he took a sabbatical to witness the birth of his son. WWE buried Steamboat on his return, and this loss here robbed us of Savage Steamboat 2 in the next round. Number 221, Randy Savage vs Crush falls count anywhere at WrestleMania 2. Ten. Angered that real-life mate Randy Savage didn't save him from a mauling by Yokozuna, Crush turned his back on the WWE fans becoming heel, him and Macho battering each other for months on end. The two had the first Falls Count Anywhere match in WWE history at Mania 10, where you had to reach the ring in 60 seconds after being pinned or lose the match. Despite the intensity of the feud, this felt a little heatless, going nine minutes until Savage tied Crush upside down backstage for the win. This would be Savage's final test televised WWE match ever. Number 220, Jazz vs Lita vs Trish Stratus for the women's title at WrestleMania 18. 
Three of the best wrestlers in WWE's women's division squared off as women's champion Jazz defended against future Hall of Famers Lita and Trish Stratus, with Trish getting that sweet hometown Toronto pop upon her arrival. Unfortunately, this match was in the death spot, coming after Rock vs Hogan, and the crowd were very tired and thus very quiet. Thankfully, the match didn't suffer too much as it went on, with all three women beating the hell out of each other. Jazz got the win with a crisp top rope fisherman suplex, and left with her belt still firmly around her waist. Number 219, Shawn Michaels vs Tito Santana at WrestleMania 8. The heartbreak kid had finally arrived as Shawn Michaels took on El Matador Tito Santana in his first solo WrestleMania outing. Three months after the barbershop window, and Michaels was still finding his feet as HBK, but he delivered with the veteran Santana here. Tito had control of the match early on, only to eat a pre-sweet chin music superkick as the two went back and forth. Michaels was the up-and-comer, but he bumped his sexy boy backside off for Tito before reversing a scoop slam into a pin for the victory. Number 218, Yokozuna vs Bret Hart for the WWE title at WrestleMania 9. In 1993, Bret Hart was the new face of the WWE in a post-Hogan world and was in the midst of his first world title reign. The Hitman was on a collision course with the 1993 Royal Rumble winner, the undefeated Yokozuna, in a highly anticipated bout. The match itself was okay, as Hart did everything he could with an exhausted Yoko, the latter sometimes missing spots and rushing towards the finish as he gasped for air. Brett eventually locked in the sharpshooter, but received a face full of salt from Mr. Fuji as Yokozuna got the pin and the WWE title. Not bad, but the aftermath, of course, ruined it. Thanks, Terry. Number 217, Hulk Hogan vs. Andre the Giant in the WWE title tournament quarterfinal at WrestleMania 4. No, not that one. The match a year later at WrestleMania 4. Hogan and Andre were inserted straight into the quarterfinals and wasted no time in beating the living heck out of each other. This was a straight up brawl, with the two old foes using every trick in the book to try and get the advantage. Hogan clobbered Andre with a chair, and instead of DQing Hogan straight away, the ref waited for Andre to do the same before before DQing them both. Utter bollocks, referee. Hogan then smacked around Andre and Virgil before doing his usual poses, seemingly not bothered that he was out of the tournament. Number 216, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog versus Mankind and Vader for the tag titles at WrestleMania 13. Owen and Bulldog were tag champs, but tensions were simmering, as two-time Slammy winning Owen was getting too big for his boots. Would they be able to put everything to one side and defeat Vader and Mankind? No prizes for anyone who guessed this this match would be a hard-hitting affair, as Vader and Mankind slugged the champs for the best part of the match. The action spilled outside, and Mankind locked the mandible claw on Bulldog in front of Stu Hart as the ref counted both men out. The champs retained by DQ, but their problems as a cohesive unit were only just beginning. Number 215, Trish Stratus vs Victoria vs Jazz for the women's title at WrestleMania 19. Jazz, Trish, and women's champion Victoria were three of the best women's wrestlers in WWE at the time, and this match is a good example of their talents, with everything from moonsaults to Michinoku drivers on display here. Although this started with the sometimes annoying three-way trope of throw someone to the outside and then have a one-on-one -on -one match, it soon became a well-worked battle, with the trio of ladies working with and against each other at various points. Eventually, Victoria's boyfriend Stevie Richards went for Stratus with a chair, but eight Stratus factors before Trish nailed Victoria with the chick kick for the win and the title. Number 214, The Undertaker vs Mark Henry in a casket match at WrestleMania 22. Mark Henry cost Undertaker a world title match against Kurt Angle, so the dead man massively overreacted and challenged Henry to a casket match, because apparently if you cost the phenom a title, he's going to kill you. Henry was being morphed into the Hall of Pain monster that we know and love today, so of course he lost the match in under 10 minutes. Maybe if it hadn't been at WrestleMania, eh, Mr. Henry? The bout itself was good enough, with Taker nailing his yearly over-the-top rope tope, as well as a massive last ride. But in the grand scheme of the streak, it wasn't really a match of major significance, and was easily eclipsed by streak bouts both before and after it. Number 213, Jake Roberts vs. Rick Martel in a blindfold match at WrestleMania 7. The build to this one started when the model was a bit of a bell end and blinded Jake Roberts by spraying his arrogance cologne into his eye. 
eyes. Roberts was irate, but said a snake has six senses and wanted to see how Martel would react without sight himself. So they signed off on a blindfold match. Not an eye for an eye match, thank God. This was pure theatrical fun, with the crowd going ballistic for Jake, while Martel fell over a lot and acted like a coward. Roberts eventually got his hands on Martel and planted him with the DDT to a monster pop. A big payday for less bumps than you have fingers on one hand. Number 212, Batista vs. Umaga at WrestleMania 24. The battle for brand supremacy saw SmackDown's Batista take on Raw's Umaga, while the crowd were all like, we watch both shows anyway, so who cares? Both men were great, but surely they could have been given something better to do at WrestleMania. That's not to say this was a bad match, it was fine, but the lack of real stakes or a proper storyline hurt it. Batista got the win with a somewhat clumsy Batista bomb in seven minutes, SmackDown reigned supreme, and this match was quickly forgotten. Speaking of brand supremacy, where was ECW's candidate? This could have been Colin Delaney's time to shine! Number 211, Mark Mero and Sable versus the artist formerly known as Goldust and Luna Vachon at WrestleMania 14. Goldust was going through his difficult attention-seeking weirdo phase here as he and Luna got mixed up in Mark Mero and Sable's toxic relationship. Mero was jealous of all the attention Sable was getting and worked with Goldust to humiliate her. But when Goldie put his hands on Sable, Mero snapped, leading to this match. The bits with Mero and Goldust were fine as both men were good workers, but when Sable got in the ring, it all went a bit pear-shaped. In fairness to Sable, she gave it her all, hitting a somewhat sloppy Sable bomb and a TKO for the win. Number 210, John Cena and Nikki Bella versus The Miz and Maurice at WrestleMania 33. Big Match John became Medium Match John as he and Nikki Bella fought to prove they were the most in love couple who were ever in love. The build-up was great, with Miz and Maurice playing Cena and Nikki in their skits, and as a legit married couple with kids, it was sort of hard not to root for them. The WrestleMania audience agreed, cheering Miz like a hero as he soaked it all up. But Cena and Nikki eventually won the match, and John popped the question in a nice moment. Come on, even the cynics amongst us can admit it was a nice moment, can't we? Number 209, Road Dog vs Goldust vs Ken Shamrock vs Val Venus in an Intercontinental Title 4 Corners match at WrestleMania 15. 1999 was a very fast and loose time for the IC title, with 11 different reigns occurring throughout the course of the year. Road Dog was champ of the moment heading into WrestleMania 15, defending against Goldust, Shamrock and Venus in a Four Corners match, where you had to tag in and out even though that makes absolutely no sense. The world's most dangerous man dished out some beatings before he and Val got counted out, leaving Road Dog and Goldust as the two remaining competitors. Road Dog overcame a distraction by Ryan Shamrock, reversed a Goldust power slam and managed to retain the belt. Number 208, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal on the WrestleMania 34 pre-show. Andre 5, Assignment Miami Beach, and it was pretty much the same as the other matches. However, this one had a development that would play out beyond WrestleMania. There were no celebrity guests this time, and what on earth were the Revival doing in there? The final three were Woken Matt Hardy and previous winners Mojo Rawley and Baron Corbin, proving that an Andre Battle Royal win won't necessarily propel you up the card. Everyone's favourite spooky lunatic Bray Wyatt turned up and in a shocking state of affairs assisted Matt for the win as the two weirdos became BFFs. Number 207, The Hart Foundation vs Greg Valentine and the Honky Tonk Man at WrestleMania 5. Before they were Rhythm and Blues, they were just Honky and Greg and there was no way the duo were beating The Hart Foundation at WrestleMania 5, was there? Brett and Anvil were the more established team and were in vintage form here, Brett dishing out Manhattan drops and Russian legs sweeps until the cows came home. Honky and Greg got the advantage, but a hot tag to Anvil put the foundation back in control. Brett came in for another go, bopping Honky in the head with Jimmy Hart's megaphone for the cheeky three. Number 206, The Shield vs Kane and the New Age Outlaws at WrestleMania 30. It wasn't hard to book The Shield, but it was maybe a touch harder to give them credible opponents. For some reason, WWE decided the best thing for The Shield to do at Mania 30 was to face an aging Kane and a reunited New Age Outlaws. Luckily, The Shield flattered the Attitude Era stalwarts in a little under three minutes, with Roman Reigns doing the majority of the work. Incidentally, this would be the last WrestleMania where the big dog wouldn't get booed out of the building. 
Although now he's a mega heel, there's every chance he'll get cheered again because wrestling fans are a contrary bunch. Number 205, Cesaro versus Drew Gulak on the WrestleMania 36 Night 1 pre-show. Sami Zayn and Daniel Bryan were feuding, so their respective best pals Cesaro and Drew Gulak thought, I have nothing to do. Fancy a scrap? The internet wrestling nerds all collectively licked their lips at this. Cesaro versus Gulak. This was a match with the potential to steal any show, and considering it was on the pre-show, you would assume that it would be given time to deliver. Unfortunately though, it only got about four minutes, and ended weirdly when Cesaro won with an airplane spin like it was 1964. Number 204, Ricky Steamboat versus Matt Bourne at WrestleMania 1. Ricky Steamboat? Yes please. Matt Bourne? Yes please. The first WrestleMania? Oh, go on then. This was a Steamboat exhibition match to make him look good, but Bourne was a great worker who not only made the dragon look fantastic, but also got a few moments to shine himself, most notably nailing some nice suplexes on the steamer. Workers of Steamboat and Bourne's caliber were always going to deliver the goods, and despite only going four minutes, managed to have the in-ring match of the night, with Steamboat getting the win with a top rope diving cross body. Number 203, Randy Savage versus Greg Valentine in the WWE Tournament quarterfinal at WrestleMania 4. Yep, back to the WrestleMania 4 tournament. Don't worry, only two entries left on it, as Randy Savage took on Greg Valentine. The two were well matched, Savage's unpredictability against the Hammer's temper, never mind the potential for outside shenanigans from Jimmy Hart, the sneaky little knacker. Valentine was determined to lock in the figure four, but Macho had other ideas as the two brawled around the ring and wrestled intensely. Valentine looked to be in control, but when he went for the figure four a final time, Savage countered into a small package for the win. Number 202, the League of Nations versus the New Day at WrestleMania 32. So instead of a tag title match at Mania 32, WWE instead decided to have reigning champions The New Day take on the ineptly booked League of Nations in a six-man tag. This match was greatly overshadowed by a number of things, such as the Dragon Ball cosplaying New Day emerging from a giant box of bootios, as Michael Cole explained who Vegeta was on commentary. And then, of course, we had the post-match, where the dastardly foreign heels got battered by Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, and Mick Foley, because WWE loves old-timers and still think that foreign menaces draw. Number 201, Brutus Beefcake versus Mr. Perfect at WrestleMania 6. Mr. Perfect was undefeated, at least on television, heading into WrestleMania 6 when he crossed paths with Brutus Beefcake. Unfortunately for Perfect, Beefcake brought his A-game and the barber was all over him from the start. Perfect sold like a hero for the beefster, making him look fantastic, as did his manager, the underrated genius. What made Beefcake look even better was actually getting the win over Perfect, becoming the first man to beat him in WWE. This feud was meant to continue throughout 1990 before a parasailing accident put Brutus on the shelf for two years. Number 200, Nia Jax versus Alexa Bliss for the Raw Women's title at WrestleMania 34. One of the feel-good moments of WrestleMania 34 was Nia Jax finally getting her hands on former friend-turned-bully Alexa Bliss. Two years later, and this seems very strange considering how much goodwill Jax has lost, but there you go. The story told was very effective, with Bliss and new mate Mickey James taunting Nia over her size. Jax was painted as a sympathetic character, and when she finally met Alexa in the ring, she had the air of someone who was genuinely hurt by her former friend. That didn't stop Nia smashing through Alexa though, picking up the win with a second rope Samoan drop. Number 199, the Bludgeon Brothers vs. the Usos vs. the New Day for the SmackDown Tag Team titles at WrestleMania 34. They finally did it! The Usos escaped the purgatory of the pre-show to make the actual WrestleMania card. The reigning tag champs put their belts on the line against rivals the New Day and smelly lunatics the Bludgeon Brothers, and got a whopping 5 minutes 50 seconds to try and put on a clinic. Sadly, a clinic this was not, but it was still good for the allotted time. Harper and Rowan picked up the win with a huge powerbomb. Number 198, Hardcore Holly vs Al Snow vs Billy Gunn for the Hardcore title at WrestleMania 15. Before it jumped the shark, the hardcore title was fun and fresh, and a good way to breathe new life into stale characters, with its greatest success story arguably being Hardcore Holly. 
Bob and Al Snow regularly clattered each other for the title across WWE programming, and Billy Gunn soon got involved as well, scoring the hardcore title in the process. At Mania, the three tussled for the ramshackle belt, with Snow successfully keeping Billy at bay for the majority of the match. The badass soon got involved, battering Al, but bombastic Bob blasted Billy for the win and the title. Number 197, Dean Ambrose vs Baron Corbin for the Intercontinental title on the WrestleMania 33 pre-show. Baron Corbin decided he wanted a slice of IC title action after clashing with champ Dean Ambrose inside the Elimination Chamber. The two then pummeled each other with pipes and forklifts leading up to the big day. But a year after stinking up the joint with Brock Lesnar, Ambrose was shoved into the dark depths of the pre-show. The feud was decent, but the Mania showdown was nothing special, and the two went 10 minutes until Captain Wacky hit the Dirty Deeds for the win. It would be his last WrestleMania. Number 196, Alberto Del Rio vs Jack Swagger for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 29. The WWE title match at WrestleMania 29 was The Rock vs John Cena. What massive stars would therefore be fighting for Big Goldie? That's right, two of the greatest world champions of all time, Alberto Del Rio and Jack Swagger. This was a damp squib of a matchup as no one was bothered about Del Rio or Swagger, with the latter winning the Elimination Chamber for this title opportunity. For all their faults, both men can go and did put on a half-decent showing, but this always felt like more of a US championship matchup than a world title clash. Number 195, Tyson Kidd and Cesaro versus Los Matadores versus The New Day versus The Usos for the tag team titles on the WrestleMania 31 pre-show. With the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal being deemed an attraction, the tag titles became pre-show fodder, which is a shame considering the history of tag title matches at WrestleMania. I mean, look at this. Kidd and Cesaro, The Usos, and The New Day were far too good to be on the pre-show. We got a nice quick-paced tag match with tons of interplay between the teams and lots of quick tags. Standard multi-man stuff. Natalia even locked a sharpshooter in on El Torito, which I think may have technically been animal abuse actually, before the champs retained. Number 194, Jinder Mahal versus Randy Orton versus Bobby Roode versus Rusev for the US title at WrestleMania 34. I don't know what was weirder, the fact that Randy Orton was US champion in 2018 the fact that WWE expected a Jinder Mahal victory to be a big deal, he'd only recently been WWE champion after all, but most baffling was the treatment of Rusev. He wasn't even originally in the match, despite Rusev Day being almost as over as me. Four good to great workers, including the wasted opportunity that was main roster Bobby Roode, but this was pure afterthought material. The match was alright, I suppose, but it felt like it should have been on SmackDown or a B-show pay-per-view instead. Part of the problem was the far superior IC title match that happened earlier in the night, which totally overshadowed this one. Oh, and naturally, the Bulgarian brute ate the pin. Number 193, Brock Lesnar versus Dean Ambrose in a street fight at WrestleMania 32. And the award for the most disappointing match of WrestleMania 32 goes to... This boring street fight between Brock Lesnar and Dean Ambrose. And leading up to it, we were all very excited. Dean Ambrose, a madman with a literal chainsaw gifted to him by Terry Funk. Brock Lesnar, a sentient lump of meat that adores violence. Both men enjoy working snug, so this had the potential to be a brutal slugfest. But on the night, it was distinctly... Eh. Brock repeatedly hit the German suplex to diminishing returns, this being one of the first matches where Suplex City started to feel stale. There was a visible lack of chemistry and the suspicion that the Beast just could not be bothered. Wacky Dean didn't even get to use any of his cool weapons. I mean, yes, none of us thought he was going to go all Leatherface on Lesnar and actually chop his head off, but at least give us something. Number 192, Lawrence Taylor versus Bam Bam Bigelow with Pat Patterson as special guest ref at WrestleMania 11. The unlikeliest WrestleMania main event ever pitted NFL star Lawrence Taylor against Bam Bam Bigelow in a match solely designed to get mainstream media attention. Taylor was the recently retired megastar of the New York Giants, and Bam Bam Bigelow was in the right place at the right time, I suppose. Let's not beat around the bush, a classic Mania main event this was not. But to be fair to Taylor, he did well, very well considering this was his first ever wrestling match. Bam Bam made LT look great and still managed to get opportunities to look good himself. But the crowd were firmly behind LT, 
and after a few customary NFL star shoulder charges, he hits a diving forearm off the second rope for the win. Number 191, Naomi versus Alexa Bliss versus Becky Lynch versus Carmella versus Mickey James versus Natalia, SmackDown Women's Title Six Pack Challenge at WrestleMania 33. This match saw Alexa Bliss take on practically the entire SmackDown Women's division in a bid to prove that she was the absolute best. But time was tight as WrestleMania 33 had already gone on for 16 days, so everyone got a clipped version of their entrance, except for Naomi who got the works. Could that have been a clue as to the winner of the match? A Horizon Zero Dawn themed Becky Lynch was the MVP here, exploding everyone and their dog. The match soon picked up with everyone hitting their finishers before Naomi forced Bliss to tap, winning her second SmackDown Women's title in the process. A feel-good hometown win for Naomi, which is a rarity in WWE, but it still felt far too short. Number 190, The Undertaker vs Psycho Sid WWE title no DQ match at WrestleMania 13. We all love a wrestling urban legend. Who was behind GTV? Who raised the D to the WWE in the King of the Ring ladder match? Did Sid really poo his pants at WrestleMania 13? It's the first thing we think of when we hear Taker vs Sid, with potentially messy undies overshadowing this match, for better or for worse. The bout itself was a long, slow, muddled affair with a newly healed Brett Mr. Complainy Pants Hart constantly getting involved. He eventually cost Sid the match as Taker nailed the tombstone, claiming his sixth WrestleMania win and his second WWE title. Not great, but historical the same as this was the start of Undertaker's first proper run with the WWE title after his one week reign back in 1991. Plus, you know, there's always the thought that maybe Undertaker got the worst of it with Sid's arse in his face during the tombstone. Number 189, Booker T and Rob Van Dam versus the Dudley Boys versus Garrison Cade and Mark Jindrak versus La Resistance for the World Tag Team titles at WrestleMania 20. Booker T's momentum dropped after his world title match with Triple H at Mania 19, but he was still very over. With nothing to do for him or the equally popular RVD, WWE thought, eh, bung the tag titles on him, I guess. T&D put the titles on the line here against established teams like the Dudleys, um, La Resistance, and Garrison, Cade, and Mark Jindrak. The crowd only really cared for the champs and the Dudleys, with the others merely acting as fodder for the established stars. The champs retained after a book of scissor kick and an RVD frog splash on Rob Conway. Number 188, The Miz vs John Cena for the WWE title at WrestleMania 27. John Cena took on the rocker, oh wait, no, sorry, he fought the the Miz. But despite, you know, being in the main event, the WWE Champion got completely overshadowed in the run-up to WrestleMania 27. While the returning People's Champion and Big Match John engaged in a game of handbags, Miz was forced to stand on the sideline and occasionally remind us that he existed too. As the Mania main event came around, Rock's shadow was looming large. Cena and Miz duked it out for a bit, then in a move that made the internet connectively cheer, The Rock came out, Rock Bottom Cena, and Miz crawled over for the three counts. Miz, still annoyed that he was a passenger in his own WrestleMania main event, laid Rock out with a skull-crushing finale and started celebrating in front of 70,000 screaming Mizzle maniacs. Oh no, wait, he ate a people's elbow and Rock posed to close the show. Number 187, the Twin Towers versus the Rockers at WrestleMania 5. Early in their careers, the Rockers mainly existed to make other teams look good. They were smaller and faster than most and could sell better than practically any team before them. This match was no exception as the Twin Towers pummeled Sean and Marty and looked like killer giants in the process. But this was no squash match as the Rockers did get in some of their trademark double team offense. Marty soon ended up on the receiving end of a Twin Towers beatdown but got the hot tag to Sean and the crowd went wild. But unfortunately it wasn't enough as Boss Man folded Sean with a huge powerbomb before Akeem got the splash and the win. Number 186, Tatonka vs Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 9. The Rockers explode as Shawn Michaels takes on Marty Jannetty. Oh wait, no, that didn't happen here. Marty got fired instead. 
again. Never mind, IC Champion HBK instead took on the undefeated Tatanka with Sean's ex-valet Sherry on the Native American side. Sean tried to cut corners to get the win, including having Luna Vachon attack Tatanka to no avail. The War Eagle was on fire here, hitting chop after chop after chop, but HBK took the count out loss and kept the title, much to Tatanka's dismay. It was refreshing to see Tatanka gutted that he didn't win the title, rather than the usual trope of moronic babyface celebrating the count out win. Good man. A cheap and unsatisfying ending, sure, but this was still one of the best matches at WrestleMania 9. Yeesh. Number 185, the Iconics vs. the Boss and Hug Connection vs. Nia Jax and Tamina vs. the Divas of Doom for the Women's Tag Team titles at WrestleMania 35. Inaugural Women's Tag Champions Bayley and Sasha Banks decreed that they would defend their straps on all three WWE brands. A noble move, but not smart as they painted a massive target on their backs. A fatal four-way was set for Mania. Bayley and Sasha, Tamina and Nia Jax, the Iconics, and the reformed Divas of of doom. Nia and Tamina were taken out straight away and spent a ridiculous amount of time down outside the ring. The three remaining teams didn't care and had a good match in which Natalia actually successfully executed the double sharpshooter, an absolute rarity. Tamina and Nia soon woke up from their nap and came into clear house before taking another nap outside the ring. A top rope glam slam from Beth onto Bailey looked like it would be enough, but the Iconics ran into a big ovation, got the win and the titles. Number 184, the British Bulldog Owen Hart and Vader versus Ahmed Johnson, Jake Roberts and Yokozuna at WrestleMania 12. Back when he wasn't broadcasting his comically steadfast views about wrestling, Jim Cornette was one of the best managers in the game. Along with that, his Camp Cornette stable in WWE was absolutely fantastic, if a little underappreciated. Yokozuna had been kicked out of the group by new member Vader, so turned face and enlisted fellow good guys Ahmed Johnson and Jake Roberts to take down Cornette's boys in WrestleMania 12's opener. This was always bound to be good considering who was involved, and as this crowd was a snark-free pre-attitude era crowd, they ate up every last second. Jake Roberts looked to have the match won, but went to slap the DDT on Cornette, got clobbered by Vader instead, and took the Vader bomb for the loss. Number 183, Steve Austin vs. Scott Hall at WrestleMania 18. A scenario we'd wanted for years, Steve Austin vs. the NWO. The WWE's crown jewel vs. WCW's hot commodity. So naturally, Austin took on the third biggest star of the group. Austin and Hall did work well together. Both were better in ring than they get credit for, never mind their bucket loads of charisma, but something fell off here. And while Scott Hall is a true legend, no doubt about it, he wasn't on Steve Austin's level in 2002. But regardless who Austin fought, WWE's NWO just didn't feel like a threat. They needed more violence, more attitude, and you know what? Maybe a little more buff Bagwell. Still, we got at least one iconic moment moment out of this match, Hall selling the absolute bejesus out of the Stone Cold Stunner. Number 182, Dusty Rhodes and Sapphire vs. Randy Savage and Queen Sherry at WrestleMania 6. The Common Man vs. Royalty is an easy enough story to tell, as Dusty Rhodes matched up well against Macho King Randy Savage. So, of course, this was instead a mixed tag featuring Sweet Sapphire and Queen Sherry. Dusty, Sherry, and Savage were great. Sapphire was not, but still managed to make the Mega Royals look like buffoons as she bopped Sherry around with her bottom. Miss Elizabeth watched on from ringside as Dusty and Sapphire continued to make a mockery of the Macho King and Queen. Sapphire eventually threw Sherry outside, who was then thrown back in by Liz to a massive pop. Sapphire got the win with the roll-up, and the good guys danced with Liz for some much-deserved cheer. This was a bit of a comedy filler match, really, but why on earth was it not just Dusty versus Savage? Now that could have been an all-time WrestleMania great. Number 181, Roman Reigns versus Triple H for the WWE World Heavyweight title title at WrestleMania 32. Now we've reached the Roman Reigns experiment part 2, and they were almost there with this one, with Roman battering Sheamus and clocking Vince McMahon in late 2015. It actually looked like the WWE Universe were going to get behind Roman. Regrettably, Triple H got involved, won the title in the Royal Rumble, and got more cheers consistently than Roman because it's Triple H. And of course, Trips just couldn't resist being in cool mode. Crotch chops, leather jacket, the look. 
lot. Throw in the fact that many people wanted Dean Ambrose as the guy, and things weren't looking great for the big dog. The Mania match itself was your traditional overly long Triple H ego trip, going nearly 30 minutes with not much of note happening. Stephanie ate a spear, that was pretty good, but the rest was so-so. Reigns eventually vanquished the evil hunter, and was booed so loudly you'd have thought he punched a kitten. Number 180, Alistair Black versus Bobby Lashley at WrestleMania 36, Night 2. Time for a big game of who can legitimately knock the other person's head through the roof. As kick-throwing goth miserablist Moody Alistair Black took on Bobby, I am ridiculously solid, so do not mess Lashley. Why were they fighting? It doesn't matter. All we needed to know was who was going to twat the other, and in the end it was Black when he sent Bobby's jaw into another dimension. Bobby almost had it won slightly earlier, and was going to go for the Dominator until Lana told him to do a spear instead. Terrible shout. Number 179, Mr. Perfect vs. The Blue Blazer at WrestleMania 5. Perfect vs. Owen? Thank you, wrestling gods! Owen had been in WWE for roughly a year, working as masked superhero The Blue Blazer, while Perfect was undefeated since debuting seven months earlier. The two worked very well together, much to the surprise of absolutely no one, with Blazer zipping around the ring as Perfect tried to ground him. A big superfly splash from the Blazer was met with knees, but it didn't halt his momentum momentum as he launched Perfect with a belly-to-belly -belly as the two bounced off one another. Perfect eventually got the win with his Perfect Plex and continued his undefeated streak. Perfect winning was the right call as the Blue Blazer would soon be gone from WWE and Perfect would move up to the IC title scene. And to the minority who chanted boring during this, get to Newcastle ASAP so I can fight you. Number 178, Randy Savage vs. George Steele for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 2. When lovable turnbuckle eater George the Animal Steele had a soft spot for Miss Elizabeth, you can bet your house on the fact that Randy Savage was not best pleased. In fact, he was absolutely apoplectic. Savage regularly clashed with Steele heading into WrestleMania 2, with the pair having a title showdown on the New York section of the show. This was Savage doing what Savage does best, bumping like a king when on the back foot, and dishing out furious frenzied offense when on the front foot. Savage bumped all over the place for Steel, and the animal became the first man to ever kick out of the big elbow drop, which is positively bonkers when you think about it. Savage eventually got the win with a roll up and continued his incredible IC title run. Number 177, Bret Hart versus Bob Backlund in an I Quit match, Roddy Piper, special guest referee at WrestleMania 11. The surprise of 1994 was Bob Backlund beating Bret Hart for the WWE title, then jobbing to Diesel in seconds a few days later, making the Hitman look a bit of a chump in the process. To make Bret look good again, WWE booked Hart vs. Backlund in an I Quit match at WrestleMania 11, with guest referee Roddy Piper there to keep order. Bret and Bob were elite level workers and put on a believable, almost collegiate style submission match. Unfortunately, it did fall a little flat and wasn't helped by Piper constantly yelling, what do you say, down the mic at any given opportunity. The match also failed to have a clean ending as Bob lost without saying the two magic words, then proceeded to be all weird and vacant when Jim Ross attempted a post-match interview. Hard to say what this all accomplished, really. At least they were good at the rolling around, though. Number 176, The Shield vs. The Big Show, Randy Orton and Sheamus at WrestleMania 29. Debut time once again as The Shield made their first trip to Mania, defeating the historic trio of uh, Randy Orton, Sheamus, and Big Show. It wasn't a bad match, in fact it was pretty good as it featured six top draw workers and the new guys got the rub, but still it did feel a little bit thrown together. At least everyone got their chance to shine though. Sheamus and Reigns knocked lumps out of one another, and Orton hit an RKO on a springboard Seth Rollins. Reigns speared a hole through Orton, Ambrose picked up the win, and Big Show looked on with a face like a smacked ass. Upset that Orton and Sheamus felt like they could win the match without him, Show saw this as a valid reason to dish out some naps, chinning Orton and Sheamus, and turning heel once again, as is tradition. Number 175, Chris Jericho versus Ricky Steamboat, Roddy Piper, and Jimmy Snooker in a handicap elimination match at WrestleMania 25. This was meant to be Chris Jericho taking on the wrestler star Mickey Rourke, but Rourke's management got cold feet and pulled him from 
from the match. WWE changed tack for the better and instead gave us Jericho against Hall of Famers Ricky Steamboat, Roddy Piper and Jimmy Snooker. The old lads were accompanied by Ric Flair but that didn't stop Jericho making short work of a knackered looking Snooker and Piper. And then it happened. Ricky Steamboat in his first match in 15 whole years went the distance with Chris Jericho, nailing Y2J with his trademark crossbody and even a bloody dive over the top rope. The dragon even skinned the cat at 56 years old. It was amazing to see and had everyone on their feet. Jericho ruined everything by winning, of course, but Rourke hopped the rail to meet Jericho face to face and crumpled him with a swift punch. Number 174, Hulk Hogan versus King Kong Bundy in a WWE title cage match at WrestleMania 2. The monster of the week heading into WrestleMania 2 was the gargantuan King Kong Bundy, who loved beating up the big boys. Bundy had crushed Andre the Giant without breaking a sweat and savagely attacked Hogan on Saturday night's main event, injuring the Hulkster's ribs. This would be the biggest test to date for Hogan's WWE title. Would he be able to escape the blue cage with the gold? Well, yeah, it's 80s Hulk Hogan. There is no other outcome. The LA crowd were at fever pitch and they got a good old school match with blood, peril and violence. Despite Hogan being up against the odds, he eventually escaped the cage for the win and beat up Bobby Heenan as the crowd went berserk. The strange thing about this match is that, to date, it remains the only steel cage match in WrestleMania history. Is it just me who thinks that's weird? It definitely is. Number 173, the Steiner Brothers versus the Head Shrinkers at WrestleMania 9. Rick and a pre-freakzilla Scott Steiner made their WWE debuts in early 1993 and in their one and only WrestleMania appearance took on the Head Shrinkers, Samu and, I'm not quite Rikishi yet, Fatu. This was the Steiners at their prime, multicolored singlets and college jackets, and as such they put on a hell of a bout with the Head Shrinkers, who were a great team in their own right. It was a back and forth match, but at the end of the day, this was the Steiner show, as Rick and Scott suplexed and Steiner lined Fatu and Samu like they were nothing. Scott eventually hit the Frankensteiner for the win at the 14 minute mark. This was easily match of the night at WrestleMania 9 and also featured the spot of the night when Rick spectacularly reversed a doomsday device into an elevated power slam. Lovely stuff. Number 172, Kurt Angle vs Kane at WrestleMania 18. Look at Kurt and Kane here, both men were at their absolute physical peak, and in Kane's case, he was arguably at his in-ring peak too. Coming into the match, Kurt was terrified of Kane, but a ring bell shot to Kane's mush and a thousand suplexes later, the Olympic hero was firmly in control. Kane soon got back into the swing of things, getting a close two count from a choke slam. Kurt fired back, slipped the straps down, the big flirt, and went at Kane's ankle, severely hampering the big red machine. Angle then landed a sick top rope belly to belly on Kane, but this too was not enough. Kane eventually went for another choke slam, but Kurt awkwardly rolled him up for the win. A really good match, but the botchy ending did ruin it a little. Number 171, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross versus the Kabuki Warriors for the women's tag team titles at WrestleMania 36, night one. When Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross first teamed, we all assumed it was only a matter of time before Bliss turned on Nikki to set up a singles feud. Facing off against the always impressive Kabuki Warriors, this seemed like it could be the last roll of the dice for the team, but apparently we know nothing as they emerged victorious as the new champions. The four put on a decent match, but it felt jarring as the opener of the crowd-free WrestleMania 36. You couldn't help but feel that the wrestlers themselves were probably a little put off, but it didn't throw things too much with Bliss and Cross winning the gold after a twisted Bliss on Sane for the win. Such a shame too that the pirate princess didn't get her big piratey entrance. Thanks for that, COVID. Number 170, The Undertaker vs Jake Roberts at WrestleMania 8. After teaming together to make Randy Savage's life hell, The Undertaker had a change of heart and turned on Jake Roberts. Jake wasn't scared of Taker and hit him with everything he had, but Taker no-sold the lot and just kept on coming at him. The dead man went for the tombstone, but Jake slithered out and hit a DDT to a huge reaction. But then Taker sat up to a monster ovation and not even a second DDT could get the job done as Undertaker rose again like some kind of, well, zombie. Jake had had enough and went to take his frustrations out on Paul Bearer, but Taker intercepted the snake, tombstoned him on the ringside mats, then rolled him in for the three. 
Number 169, Ricky Steamboat versus Hercules Hernandez at WrestleMania 2. For the second WrestleMania in a row, Ricky Steamboat had the best singles match on the card, this time taking on Hercules Hernandez. Although maybe that wasn't too hard when you consider the state of WrestleMania 2. Also, Steamboat could have fought his own coat and it would have been a contender for match of the night. Semantics aside, this was a Ricky Steamboat match, and as one of the best performers of the 1980s, you knew you were in for something good. And Hercules was no slouch either, and the two engaged in a nice big man versus slightly smaller man fight, Steamboat using his technical mastery to keep Hercules at bay, before Huge Herc took Dragon's head off with a stonking lariat. Steamboat turned things around though and hit a trademark diving crossbody for the win. How on earth would he top that at WrestleMania 3? Oh, right, yeah. Number 168, Edge vs Booker T at WrestleMania 18. The biggest feuds blow off at WrestleMania, title contenders reaching for the gold, former friends putting it all on the line, and rivals fighting over a Japanese shampoo commercial. So the premise for the match was utterly ridiculous, but it was Booker T vs Edge in 2002, so you knew it was going to be at least decent regardless. This was Booker's first WrestleMania outing, as well as the only Mania outing for Edge's Rob Zombie theme, remember that? As expected, the two worked together very well and put on a decent match that never lost the crowd. The Toronto audience went wild for the Spinner Rooney despite Booker being a heel, prompting hometown boy Adam to have a go at a Spinner Rooney of his own. A for effort, C for education. Get it? Still, Edge got the win and remained the King of Shampoo! Number 167, Eddie Guerrero vs Test for the European title at WrestleMania X7. On a Mania 17 card filled with bangers, this match sticks out a little. It wasn't bad because, come on, it was an Eddie Guerrero match, but it just lacked that certain something. It also didn't help that Test got trapped in the ropes like some kind of buff blonde badger in a bear trap and needed Eddie and the ref to free him, but that's neither here nor there. Still, Latino Heat and Test put together a decent match, with the big man giving as good as he got while having to deal with outside interference from Dean Malenko and Perry Saturn. Perry Saturn in a frankly out outrageous hat, I should say. Eddie did what Eddie did best, lied, cheated and stole, nailing Test in the mush with the European title while the Radicals distracted the ref. Number 166, Hulk Hogan and Mr. T versus Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff at WrestleMania 1. Here we have it, the reason why WrestleMania exists. The spectacle of Hulk Hogan and Mr. T versus Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff. And of course, we also have to mention celebrity guests Liberace, New York Yankees Billy Martin, and Muhammad Ali at ringside. A true triumph of spectacle over grappling, this was a success before the bell even rang, with Madison Square Garden going absolutely bananas. The match itself was okay at best, and was basically a 13 minute long brawl, also featuring corner men Bob Orton and Jimmy Snooker. The New York crowd especially loved Muhammad Ali getting into it with Piper, as Orton accidentally hit Orndorff with that darn cast, allowing Hogan to get the pin on his rival. This was exciting, it was loud, it was brash, and it set the tone for WrestleManias to come. Number 165, Randy Orton vs Cody Rhodes vs Ted DiBiase Jr at WrestleMania 26. Legacy explodes! Yes, Legacy. Remember them? Cody Rhodes, Ted DiBiase Jr. and Randy Orton decided they weren't mates anymore and had a big falling out leading to this triple threat. No sign of Manu though, he'd already been kicked out of the group. Unfortunately, the crowd just didn't care. Well, they didn't care for Cody and Ted anyway, and were only bothered about Mr. RKO. The youngsters did their best to beat the Viper, but seeing as Randy is one of the most winningest wrestlers in WWE history, you knew the legend killer would turn it all around. A vintage Orton comeback got a reaction from the crowd at least, as Ted watched in horror while Randy gently punted Cody's young little face. An RKO on Ted followed, and that was all she wrote. Also, we have to shout out Matt Matt Stryker on commentary with the worst prediction of the night. Perhaps a future WrestleMania main event right here! Rhodes vs DiBiase! Nah. Number 164, The Honky Tonk Man vs Jake Roberts at WrestleMania 3. 
The ultimate question was asked at WrestleMania 3. Which was better, rock and roll or heavy metal? In rock and roll's corner was Honky Tonk Man with Jimmy Hart. In metal's was Jake Roberts with Alice Cooper looking like that weird auntie you only see twice a year, thankfully. Roberts wanted the DDT early, but Honky did what he could to avoid it. The crowd were on board though, loudly chanting DDT as they got right behind Jake. After another DDT attempt was thwarted by Jimmy Hart, Honky hooked in a roll-up, used the ropes for leverage, and got the shocking win. The crowd were furious. Roberts proceeded to take the loss well by smashing Honky's guitar before Auntie Alice came in with Damien and the good guys made Jimmy Hart wee himself with fear. Number 163, Floyd Mayweather versus The Big Show, no disqualifications at WrestleMania 24. Celebs and non-wrestling sports stars don't usually have the best matches at WrestleMania, as detailed in a lot of the opening portion of this video, but the same can't be said of Floyd Mayweather. The Money Man came in to face Big Show in a bloody hell look at the size difference there match, and was instantly healed because he's cocky, talented, and rich. We all thought this would be a two minute dud where the boxer would make the wrestler look like a tit, but when Mayweather legitimately broke Show's nose at No Way Out, he made us all go, okay, I'm definitely invested now. The match was far better than it should have been, and it was nice to see undefeated athlete of a generation Mayweather need to use foreign objects to see show off, making the actual wrestler look pretty strong in defeat. See, it can be done! Number 162, Roman Reigns vs Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania 35. When Roman Reigns beat leukemia and returned to WWE in February of 2019, it was only right that he got a big return at WrestleMania, and the man for the job was Drew McIntyre. Drew beat Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose in the run-up, claiming he had destroyed the Shield, then made some unnecessary comments about Reigns his illness and his family. Unfortunately, perhaps again due to the length of these modern manias, the match itself was quite heatless. Rather than getting in there and smashing each other in the face like Rock'em Sock'em Robots, Drew and Roman just had a regular wrestling match, complete with the obligatory long submission spot in the middle. Drew slapped Roman in the mouth, chatted a load of wham about the Hounds of Justice, and received a Superman punch and a spear for his troubles. These two worked well together, but beyond seeing Roman return to the ring, the crowd weren't too invested in the match itself. Number 161, The Orient Express vs The Rockers at WrestleMania 6. Here, Sean and Marty were up against Tanaka and Saito, The Orient Express, with Mr. Fuji in their corner as well. But you better know that The Rockers had the power of the fans behind them. Yeah, baby! Seriously, the crowd loved The Rockers here, and it was hard not to. Stereo drop kicks, kip ups, even planches onto The Express. Not many wrestlers performed these kinds of moves in WWE in 1990, and it made Sean and Marty really stand out. Sean soon got his ass handed to him and tagged out, but Fuji proved to be the difference maker, twatting Marty with his cane and giving Saito salt to throw in his eyes. Cue Marty running around all wound up and temporarily blinded, bumping over the guardrail into several crotches and sadly being counted out of the match. Number 160, Stone Cold Steve Austin vs Savio Vega at WrestleMania 12. Ah yes, the WrestleMania debut of the most important star in WWE history, Savio Vega. Oh, and it was Steve Austin's first Mania too. Austin was still yet to find his feet in the Fed and was still rocking the Ringmaster gimmick, despite now having the Stone Cold prefix. Austin and Savio had been feuding for a couple of weeks, with the Million Dollar Champion clashing with the Bariqua on Raw and Superstars. This match started off heated as both men wasted no time in pounding on each other, but soon played second fiddle to two Roddy Piper phone calls to Vince. Yes, this was in the midst of the Hollywood backlot brawl saga. Talk about a distraction. Referee Tim White took a bump and several belt shots and a million dollar dream later, Steve Austin was your winner. Anyway, what's going on with Piper and Gold Dust? Can we get a cameraman over there quick? Number 159, Triple H versus Booker T for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 19. Is this maybe the worst point of the Reign of Terror? I'm not saying that Booker T should have won the match, but... No, I am saying it. Booker T should have won the match! We all know the horrific racial undertones to this story, with Triple H saying people like Booker shouldn't be champion, but for all storyline faults, the match itself was alright. It had a big fight feel and was very 80s NWA, despite being a little too slow and self-indulgent at times. Booker was riding a wave of popularity going into the bout, and the crowd were just waiting for him to overcome the odds and prevail for his first world title win in WWE. 
But they would have to wait as the game hit one, yes, one pedigree. Took about 25 minutes to crawl over and then pinned Booker with one arm. The ending killed the crowd and made Booker look like a bona fide sucker! Number 158, Team Hell No versus Big E Langston and Dolph Ziggler for the tag titles at WrestleMania 29. A year removed from the Brian Sheamus match, and Brian's rehabilitation was in full swing thanks to his great Team Hell No run with Kane. Dolph Ziggler was in a good place too as Mr. Money in the Bank, long before we were all far too used to him. Add a fresh from NXT Big E, and this had all the ingredients to be a grand old time. Ziggler started out by giving AJ Lee a lovely kiss to mock Brian and received an absolute pasting from the goat for it before Big E manhandled Kane as Michael Cole gushed about his strength and power. Clearly, Vince was in his ear at this point. Eventually, Ziggler went to smash Kane with the Money in the Bank briefcase, but ate a big boot, a choke slam, and a flying headbutt from Brian, and the champs retained. Number 157, the Nasty Boys versus the Hart Foundation for the tag team titles at WrestleMania 7. Nobs and Sags had only recently jumped ship from WCW and were on a mission to nasticize the WWE. Along the way, they picked up Jimmy Hart as their manager and headed straight for WWE tag champions, the Hart Foundation having won a number one contender's battle royal. Jimmy used to manage the foundation, so the nasties had the edge, not that this bothered the anvil and the hitman. This match was basically a Bret Hart showcase, as the hitman used every move in his arsenal to keep the challengers at bay. Bret was absolutely battered, leading up to a Neidhart hot tag, but one swift megaphone strike to the back from Jerry Sags, and the nasties were your new tag champions. The Hart Foundation's second tag reign was over, and soon the team would be too, as Bret launched his solo Solo run. Number 156, Fandango versus Chris Jericho at WrestleMania 29. Another entrant in the, oh yeah, that actually happened, didn't it, Annals, saw the debuting Fandango take on Chris Jericho, all stemming from the fact that Jericho kept mispronouncing Fandango's name on purpose. That's a bit mean, isn't it? I can't imagine anybody mispronouncing a surname like Pachiti, for example. Dango got the full Mania entrance treatment, not bad considering he was yet to actually compete on main roster TV. Jericho wasn't intimidated and absolutely belted Fandango all over the ring with no reply. The future fashion policeman eventually got some licks in, including his big top rope leg drop for two, as well as a sister Abigail of all things. But this was still Y2J's match, with the crowd firmly behind the former undisputed champion. Shockingly though, as he went for the walls of Jericho, he was rolled up for the upset loss. A hell of a rub for the handsome dancing bastard. Number 155, Finn Balor versus Bobby Lash for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 35. You know the way that Finn Balor only unleashes the demon when he's pushed too far? Well, it turns out to be a load of rubbish, really, because he brought it out against Bobby Lashley for no other reason than it's WrestleMania and I want to look cool. Lashley did get some nice moves in, like a spear through the ropes, but it wasn't enough with Balor nailing the coup de grace to win back his IC title. This felt oddly flat and further showed that WWE had no idea what to do with Lashley at this point, and it would still take a little while longer yet. Number one. 154, Sami Zayn versus Daniel Bryan for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 36, Night 1. The 2009 indie scene came back for one night as Daniel Bryan took on Sami Zayn for the IC title, and we all licked our lips expecting a clinic. But this was Zayn in annoying yet brilliant wimp mode, so he spent the majority of the match avoiding Bryan as his lackeys Cesaro and Nakamura protected him from his opponent. Zayn wanted a count out loss to keep his title, but Bryan was not going to abide, and when he finally got his hands on Sammy, he beat him like he owed him a Greenpeace donation. Zayn eventually weaseled his way to victory though, hitting a scintillating halluva kick to a flying Brian, retaining the gold in 9 minutes. A good match for sure, but it wasn't given nearly enough the time that it should have. Number 153, Rob Van Dam versus William Regal for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 18. You've already heard me prattle on about a good choice for a WrestleMania opener, but it's an important part of any WrestleMania, or any show for that matter. Get some popular, decent performers out there and get the crowd warmed up. In 2002, there were few wrestlers more popular than Rob Van Dam. The only new face overtly cheered during the invasion, he was a shoe in for the opener, and William Regal was obviously a capable enough opponent to give him a decent match. Regal went for the brass knuckles straight away, but Van Dam hoofed them out the ring. The two settled into a back and forth encounter, lots of kicks from Van Dam, lots of technical maneuvers from Regal. Regal went for the knucks again, but the ref caught him and confiscated them, 
only for Big Willy to produce a third set which RVD booted into his mouth. Five Star Frog Splash, new IC champion, and on with the rest of the show. Number 152, Matt Hardy versus Rey Mysterio for the Cruiserweight title at WrestleMania 19. Speaking of openers, Rey Mysterio's WrestleMania debut saw him take on Cruiserweight champion Matt Hardy version 1 at Mania 19. Now, Broken Matt Hardy is great, but if you for a second think he's better than version 1, then you need locking up. This started fast and exciting and never let up, with Rey busting out all his greatest hits to keep Hardy and that little MF of Shannon Moore at bay. That stands for Mattitude Follower, by the way, kids. It is a bit weird that Matt was Cruiserweight champion, though, as in no way, shape, or form was he a Cruiserweight. Still, he gave as good as he got, using his size advantage to throw Rey all over the shop. Matt and Rey worked well together, and the crowd were absolutely buzzing for Mysterio. But V1 was always one step ahead, and got the pin with a little rope leverage, escaping with the gold. Number 151, John Bradshaw Layfield versus Chris Benoit for the US title at WrestleMania 22. People like to think WWE's sometimes tasteless use of Eddie Guerrero's name was a Rey Mysterio problem, but as shown with this match, it was a Chris Benoit problem too. Benoit was US champion heading into Mania 22 and inducted Guerrero into the Hall of Fame the night before. To play off this, JBL realized he could get a lot of heat by disparaging Latino Heat's name, and he did. There were the promos where he bragged about beating Eddie in the past, and then in this match he did several of Eddie's mannerisms to a chorus of boos. Benoit joined in, hitting his own rendition of the Three Amigos for a big pop after JBL earlier had a go himself. Benoit looked like he had the match won, locking in the Crip lacrosse face, but JBL rolled over, grabbed the rope for leverage, and was the new US Champion. Number 150, John Cena vs John Bradshaw Layfield for the WWE title at WrestleMania 21. It's weird to think of a time before Big Match John was a world champion, and even weirder to think it's been over a decade and a half since he first won the WWE title at WrestleMania 21. Cena had organically gotten over with his Doctor of Thugonomics gimmick, and a few successful runs with the US title set him up for the big one. Cena won a number one contenders tournament for the honor, but JBL wasn't gonna let a no good rapping punk take his gold. Yeah, right. The in-ring action was so-so, as this was before Cena was the polished in-ring general we know today. But this match was all about the moment and the crowning of a new face of SmackDown. Cena nailed the FU for the win, the crowd already willing to accept Cena as the guy they would soon change their tune. Number 149, John Bradshaw Layfield versus Finlay in a Belfast brawl at WrestleMania 24. Bloody hell, it's the JBL section of this video, so it seems. Love him or hate him, you can't deny that he's consistent. Despite it being his lowest profile solo outing at Mania, his Belfast brawl with Finlay was arguably JBL's most entertaining. You knew these two would rather batter each other than put on a grappling clinic, so why not let them do it? Two old Tough bastards going ham on each other's faces. What's not to love? The crowd enjoyed it too, as a good old-fashioned brawl always elicits a reaction, especially when Donkey Kong Layfield barrel-hurled a bin at Hornswoggle. This was a satisfying and fun way to start a WrestleMania, and the effort went a long way, especially when Finley attempted a suicide dive, only to get a bin lid straight to the face. Number 148, Roman Reigns vs The Undertaker, no holds barred at WrestleMania 33. Right, we need to get Roman over, but how? Let him break the streak. The streak's gone, Kevin, goddammit. Okay, let him beat Undertaker at WrestleMania anyway, and we'll pretend he broke the streak. So the Roman Reigns experiment still wasn't working, but WWE persisted as the big dog and the old dog fought in a no dogs barred match at Dogmania. The whole affair was seemingly inspired by ownership of a yard, or something. The two kicked lumps out of each other, but it was clear that Taker was far past his best, as the two blew several spots during the match. Still, it certainly had the feel of a huge match. Reigns hit his two moves a bunch of times, eventually getting the win with the spear, becoming the second man in history to beat the dead man at WrestleMania. Post-match, Taker left all his clothes in the ring, well, not all of them, but you know what I mean, and buggered off like he was retired, only to wrestle at the subsequent WrestleMania. Oh, and Reigns still wasn't cheered, by the way. Number 147, Triple H versus Batista, no holds barred at WrestleMania 35. Give me what I want! Big Dave was back, and he wanted to beat the hell out of Triple H because, well, why wouldn't he? The build
build was great, with Batista wrecking Ric Flair and doing everything he could to get under Hunter's skin. The game eventually gave Batista what he wanted, a big fight at the showcase of the Immortals. But if Trips lost, he would be forced to retire. This was fun and violent, with Triple H going all CZW and pulling Batista's nose ring out with a pair of pliers. There was even a nice callback to the pair's 2005 Hell in a Cell match as Triple H powerbombed Batista onto the steel steps. Flair came out for some revenge, giving Tripper the sledgehammer so he could smack Dave with it and nail the pedigree for the win. This match was too long at 25 whole minutes, but it's Triple H at WrestleMania, so what did you really expect? Number 146, Street Profits vs Angel Garza and Austin Theory for the Raw Tag Titles at WrestleMania 36 Night 2. Mania debut time for everyone involved in this matchup as tag champs the Street Profits defended their Raw Tag Titles against the thrown together team of Angel Garza and Austin Theory. Theory was subbing in for Andrade, who was out with injury, and the commentators constantly reminded us that these two had been a team for about four minutes and were no match for the tag champs. And, as it turns out, they were right. But Zelina's boy still gave it a good crack, with Garza and Theory busting out some crisp offense like some sort of wrestling CV. The tag champs were in no danger of losing, despite Montez Ford shouting, WrestleMania! every three seconds like an excited toddler, getting the win after a huge springboard frog splash. Number 145, The Funks vs Junkyard Dog and Tito Santana at WrestleMania 2. Time for some real wrestling, as legendary NWA stars Terry Funk and Dory, sorry, Hoss Funk, took on beloved babyfaces JYD and Tito Santana. It was The Funks' only WrestleMania appearance as a duo, and in fact, it would be another 12 years until we saw Terry again, but more on that later. The Funks brought their patented intensity to this one, brawling all over the place with the faces, and the crowd loved it. Terry especially was on fine form, bumping for the good guys to the delight of the fans one minute, then strangling his opponents with a big rope the next. JYD was still massively over and got a great pop when he slammed Terry onto a table, but those darn funks weren't going down without a fight, and after nailing JYD with Jimmy Hart's megaphone, they picked up the win. A good, solid, old-school tag match with plenty to enjoy. Number 144, The Undertaker vs John Cena at WrestleMania 34. A year after seemingly retiring at the hands of Roman Reigns, Undertaker said, Hey, one more match won't hurt, after John Cena shamed him into fighting again. At first, we weren't sure if he would turn up, with Cena sat in the Mania crowd nursing exactly one pint, waiting for the dead man to appear. But after an Elias red herring, the lights went out and lightning struck. The Undertaker reappeared as Cena filled his undies and and we were on. Taker vs Cena one on one for the first time in a decade. Undy hit his greatest hits and dominated Cena before nailing a chokeslam and the tombstone for the win. And it was over in three minutes. What the hell? Taker's entrance was about ten times longer than the match, but hey, it was still fun, and also ensured that the legend could leave with his head held high after the previous year's disappointing performance. Number 143, Edge vs Randy Orton in a last man standing match at WrestleMania 36 Night 2. One of wrestling's true feel-good moments was when the rated R superstar made his triumphant return to the ring after nine years away. Coming back at Royal Rumble 2020, he eliminated his old rated RKO teammate Randy Orton, and the two laughed like familiar friends. But Orton was secretly fuming and decided that Edge needed to stay retired, hitting him with a concerto. Things heated up further as Orton attacked Edge's wife Beth Phoenix, while Edge sent a message by giving MVP a concerto of his own. The second longest match in WrestleMania history was, at times, tough going, made worse by the fact that there was no live crowd as the two veterans walked around hitting each other with whatever was lying about. Edge got the win with a concerto on top of a truck after 36 minutes, but trim 15 minutes and it would have been far better. Number 142, Team Angle vs Chris Benoit and Rhino vs Los Guerreros for the WWE Tag Team titles at WrestleMania 19. WrestleMania 19 was stacked. I mean, look at this. Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero in the tag title scene. But I suppose it made sense seeing as the IC title had been temporarily decommissioned and the US title wasn't a thing yet. This match only lasted eight minutes, but by gum they packed a lot in, with Eddie and Benoit rattling off their signature stuff as Rhino ran around a lot. The match had one goal and one goal only though, make Hart and Benjamin look good as Kurt boys gave as good as they got and didn't look out of place with the four established and more experienced stars. Everything 
soon broke down into utter chaos as finishers and signature moves were being dished out left, right, and center, and Rhino ran around some more, goring whatever moved. In the confusion, Benjamin pinned Charbo for the win as the young champs retained. Number 141, Demolition vs. Strike Force for the tag titles at WrestleMania 4. Here comes the axe, and here comes the smasher, as Demolition took on WWE champ Strike Force for the gold at WrestleMania 4. Strike Force had been champions for over 150 days leading into this match, but Demolition were the mean new baddies in town. And let's be frank, they were as cool as Power Rangers and Pogs and Sunny D and all the other cool things you can think of. Axe and Smash did what they did best and walloped Tito and Martel with a number of power moves, cutting Santana off in classic 80s tag style. A hot tag to Martel wasn't enough, and a cane shot to the back gave Demolition the win as pandemonium ensued. A meat and potatoes match, but it's still enjoyable over 30 years later. Also, this would prove to be one of the most important tag title switches in WrestleMania history, as it was the starting point of Demolition's record-breaking 478-day reign. Number 140, Ahmed Johnson and the Legion of Doom versus the Nation of Domination in a Chicago street fight at WrestleMania 13. Ahmed Johnson was riding high in WWE, but weird future gladiator Farouk Assad beat him up and put him on the shelf for months. When Johnson returned, Farouk had left the Roman Empire and set up the Nation of Domination, and the two picked up where they left off. Johnson enlisted surly Chicago powerhouses, the LOD, to take on the team of Farouk, Crush, and Savio Vega in a plunder-filled brawl. This was pure carnage with barely a wrestling hold in sight, as the six men went all over the arena, even passing by a teenage Colt Cabana in the crowd. Hey Colt Cabana, how you doing? Yes, we all enjoy that reference. After bruising each other with anything they could get their hands on, the good guys won after Animal and Ahmed crushed Crush, oh the irony, with a big plank for the win. Number 139, Shane McMahon vs X-Pac for the European title at WrestleMania 15. Everyone got involved in this match. Match, Test, The Mean Street Posse, Pat Patterson, Gerald Briscoe, the lot. The story was that Shane was a coward who wasn't a wrestler, as opposed to the all-conquering reincarnation of Frank Gotch that he'd become, and he needed loads of help from his corporation buddies. Test proved the difference maker early in the match, attacking X-Pac before Shane whipped him with a leather belt as the ref did bugger all. X-Pac fought back with a reunited DX watching his back, but swerve of swerves as Triple H planted Pac with a pedigree defecting to the corporation as Shane retained. Number 138, Christian vs. Chris Jericho at WrestleMania 20. We all remember high school fondly. Hell, some of you will be currently living it. My mate fancies your mate. Your mate fancies me. I fancy someone else. All the complicated messiness of teen romance. It's slightly weirder when grown wrestlers get involved in love triangles, though, as was the case with Chris Jericho, Christian, and Trish Stratus. See, Jericho wanted to get to know Trish, oi oi, and Trish felt the same. But Y2J's best mate Christian weaseled it so they would never be together and turned into a full-on jealous creepy weirdo. The former tag partners settled their differences at WrestleMania 20 and had themselves a crisp flowing match. Trish came down to have a look at what was going on, accidentally elbowed Jericho in the nose, and Christian got the roll up. Post-match, Trish slapped Jericho and snogged Christian, and none of it really made a lot of sense. But if it led to more matches like this, so be it. Number 137, Triple H vs Sheamus at WrestleMania 26. Sheamus' first year on the main roster was glittering, winning the WWE title from John Cena in his first pay-per-view singles bout, defending against Randy Orton, and so on. But obviously the highlight was taking on Triple H at Mania, if you ask Triple H, that is. The Cerebral Assassin had cost Sheamus the title in the Elimination Chamber, so the Celtic Warrior repeatedly assaulted Triple H on the road to WrestleMania. Surely he would overcome the game and be cemented as a legit star. Well, no. Triple H one instead. It was weird seeing Hunter in the middle of the Mania card as opposed to main eventing, and the veteran did his best to make Sheamus look great, giving the Irishman plenty of offense. But do you know what would have made him look even better? Giving him the win. Instead, the game kicked out of one bro kick, recovered from another, and got the win with a pedigree. Number 136, Roddy Piper versus Adrian Adonis, hair versus hair at WrestleMania 
three. Former allies Piper and Adonis had fallen out and routinely beat the crap out of each other leading up to WrestleMania 3. Naturally, they decided that a hair versus hair match was the only logical outcome to their animosity, with the added spice of Piper retiring after this match was done. The two worked very well together, and the match was super intense, with Piper whipping Adonis like a government mule, and Adonis dishing it out as good as he received it. Unfortunately for Adrian, the newly faced Brutus Beefcake ran in to wake Piper from a sleeper hold, Piper soon knocked Adonis out with a sleeper of his own, Beefcake did the post-match haircut, and so, the barber was born. Number 135, The Brainbusters vs Strike Force at WrestleMania 5. The only WrestleMania match for the team of Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard. The Brainbusters acted up to their reputation and utterly dismantled Strike Force. Yes, we all know how incredible Arn and Tully were, but credit is also due to Strike Force, easily one of the most underrated teams in WWE history. Despite the Busters demonstrating why they were the best damn team on the planet, the focus of this match was the Babyface team. After an accidental flying forearm from Tito Santana, Rick Martel had enough, abandoning his partner and turning heel in the process. The crowd were furious and their anger only intensified as the Brain Busters continued to work over a helpless Tito, hitting him with everything from the patented best spine buster ever to the trademark spike pile driver for the win. Number 134, Triple H versus The Rock versus The Big Show versus Mick Foley in a WWE title elimination match at WrestleMania 2000. This was meant to be Triple H versus The Rock, but the end to the Royal Rumble was botched, so Big Show was added, and Mick Foley joined in for a laugh as well. There was also a McMahon in every corner, but it's not about them, I swear. Big Show was quickly eliminated, making it a three-way. Foley hung on for a little bit, unfortunately missing an elbow drop on Rock through a table before eating a pedigree on a chair. Thanks for stopping by, guys. Now it was down to Triple H and Rock. Hunter had Steph in his corner, Rock had Vince, and the two old rivals went at it all over the arena, until Vince swerved Rock in a surprise to absolutely no one, and Triple H retained his WWE title. Number 133, Chris Jericho vs William Regal for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania X7. Ah, toilet humour, where would we be without it, eh? Well, Jericho vs Regal at WrestleMania X7 wouldn't have a reason to exist anyway, as Commission Commissioner Regal wanted revenge for Jericho draining the main vein in his cup of tea. Weird setup aside, this was always going to deliver in ring since Jericho and Regal are masters of their craft. The commissioner used a variety of suplexes and throws and worked on Jericho's arm and shoulder so the Regal stretch would have a bit more oomph. The crowd were well behind Y2J though as he fought back with kicks before attempting the walls of Jericho, but Regal reversed it into his signature stretch. Jericho fought out, nailed the lion salt and retained the IC title. Short and sweet at a little over seven minutes, but it did the job. Number 132, Triple H versus Randy Orton for the WWE title at WrestleMania 25. Randy Orton is never happy. Despite winning the Royal Rumble and guaranteeing himself a title match at WrestleMania, he just had to go and viciously assault Triple H's loved ones. This proved to be a silly mistake as Trips broke into Orton's house and beat the hell out of him in front of his wife. Yes, some more McFamily drama at a WrestleMania main event, but luckily it didn't overshadow the actual match this time. The match itself was your overly long Triple H mania affair, as he and Orton did the whole let's build this thing slowly routine. But at 25 minutes, it was too long, and the crowd weren't always invested. To be honest, they were probably still knackered from watching one of the best WrestleMania matches ever earlier in the night. Hunter finally vanquished that naughty Orton, blasting him with a sledgehammer before sealing the deal with a pedigree. Number 100. 31, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder vs The Revival for the Raw Tag Titles on the WrestleMania 35 pre-show. While on paper this might seem like a WWE main event match, Mania 35's pre-show tag title bout was a surprising hit as Hawkins and Ryder took on the Revival. Dawson and Wilder were their usual badass old school selves, and seeing Hawkins as a joke requested he tag out so they could fight Ryder instead. The crowd were into it as the two teams clashed, with the heels firmly in control. Ryder eventually broke free of the Revival and got the hot tag to Hawkins, who cleaned house before taking a sick brain buster on the outside. Revival thought thought they had it won, but Hawkins played possum and got the shock roll up for the win. Despite being announced two, yes, two days before WrestleMania, this match really delivered and the jubilation as Hawkins finally got the win and ended his 269 match losing streak was great. 
Number 130, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania 30. As the first in a series, this battle royal was easily the most prestigious and featured a strong lineup including Dolph Ziggler, Alberto Del Rio, The Miz, Rey Mysterio, and a pre-New Day New Day, among others. There were some good moments here, Fandango fandangoing with the crowd before Sheamus absolutely bludgeoned him, Kofi doing a ridiculous Kofi spot before getting spun for about 200 rotations by Cesaro, Dolph running Riot, Del Rio being a wanker. This was a genuinely good battle royal. It eventually came down to just Big Show and Cesaro, with Show the favourite to get the win, but Cesaro slammed him over the top rope as the crowd exploded. A true WrestleMania moment. Naturally, WWE did nothing with the momentum Cesaro got from this win, but it was nice while it lasted. Number 129, Roddy Piper vs. Goldust in a Hollywood backlot brawl at WrestleMania 12. One of the most notorious WrestleMania matches in history. Originally slated to be Goldust taking on Razor Ramon until the latter was suspended, this became Goldust vs. Roddy Piper. It was a hellacious, realistic brawl, with Piper twice punching Goldie square in the face, legit breaking his hand on the second. Goldust got revenge when he sped off in his golden Cadillac, crashing into Piper's knees as Hot Rod got into a white Ford Bronco to give chase. An absolute car crash of a match, literally and figuratively. This was an excuse to shoehorn in actual footage of the OJ Simpson police chase and pretend it was Piper instead of the juice. But you know what? In the weirdest way, it was also amazing. Okay, so it wasn't really good, but still a spectacle and something you couldn't take your eyes off. Well, maybe look away at the part when Dustin Runnels is stripped down to a thong, actually. Number 128, Triple H versus Owen Hart for the European title at WrestleMania 14. Post Montreal Screwjob, the only remaining Hart in WWE was beefing with DX and in particular Triple H, the two trading the European title for the early part of 1998. Triple H's secret weapon was China, who just couldn't stop punching people in the plums. So Commissioner Slaughter handcuffed himself to the ninth wonder of the world in an effort to stop her knob knocking. I mean, she had smashed Owen in the ankle with a baseball bat as well, so it was probably for the best. Owen's ankle was still knackered, but it didn't slow him down and he nailed Hunter with Hurricane Ranas and kicks, while China tried to crack his jaw. Hunter got control with his classic offense, but Owen wouldn't stay down. Owen regained the advantage, but China threw powder in Slaughter's eyes and popped Owen in the balls so Hunter could hit the pedigree and retain the title. Those sneaky degenerates. Number 127, Kane versus The Big Show versus Raven for the hardcore title at WrestleMania X7. Wonderful hardcore title nonsense now as Raven, Kane and Big Show brawled all over Houston's Astrodome, destroying everything that wasn't nailed down. Raven went through a window, Big Show went through a wall, and Raven almost went through the power supply for the whole bloody building, which would have killed WrestleMania on the spot. Luckily, he didn't, and the three violent weirdos had a nice little fart about with some golf carts before coming back out to the arena. Big Show threatened to body press Raven into a load of electrical stuff, but Kane big booted them both off the stage, then dropped onto both and walked away hardcore champion. Fun, bonkers, and interesting. Is this the best hardcore? core title match ever? If not, it's certainly up there. Number 126, Triple H versus Chris Jericho for the undisputed title at WrestleMania 18. Despite being the first ever undisputed champion, Chris Jericho played second fiddle to Stephanie McMahon during his reign because the world needed more McMahon family drama, damn it. Steph wanted to get in the face of her estranged husband, Triple H, who was recently back from his quad tear and was cheered like a king of kings. Jericho spent the majority of the match working Hunter's taped left knee, even busting out the Bret Hart turnbuckle figure four. The crowd finally woke up when Steph got involved and ate a pedigree before Jericho gave Hunter a nasty chair shot to the head. It wasn't enough though, as the challenger nailed the pedigree to become undisputed champion. This match was really a missed opportunity, and despite the talent in there, it just meandered about really. It didn't help that the crowd was still buzzing from Rock vs. Hogan, with the Toronto faithful loudly chanting for the Hulkster during this main event. Number 125, Bobby Lashley vs. Umaga in the Battle of the Billionaires hair versus hair match with Steve Austin as special guest referee at WrestleMania 23. We all know that WrestleMania is as much about 
about spectacle as it is about wrestling, if not more so. And there has been no bigger spectacle than the Battle of the Billionaires at WrestleMania 23. The two old rich villains had fallen out for some reason or another, and put their hair on the line at Mania, with each man picking a proxy to fight in their place. Vince went for the rarely defeated IC champion Umaga, Trump went for ECW champion Lashley. Steve Austin came in as ref and we were all set for some outrageous entertainment. The two bruisers had a good match, but it took a backseat to the post-match angle that was to occur, many of us hoping that Umaga would win so we would finally know if the future president's hair was real or not. Alas, Vince ended up in the barber's chair and Steve Austin capped things off with the worst stunner ever on the Donald. Number 124, Chris Benoit versus Montel Vontavious Porter for the US title at WrestleMania 23. Long before he was hurt business CEO, MVP was a mainstay of the US title scene, memorably feuding with Matt Hardy over the strap. But before then, he had to get through the grizzled Chris Benoit. And arguably, MVP's best US title encounter was when he faced Benoit at WrestleMania 23. The Crippler was the elder statesman of the division and was in the midst of a 220-day reign with the belt. We all assumed the technical master would dismantle the flashy MVP, but we were wrong. MVP kept up with Benoit throughout the match, the earlier stages especially featuring some crisp chain counter wrestling between the two. MVP worked Benoit's shoulder so he couldn't lock in the crossface, and it worked. But unfortunately, Benoit had many other tools in his arsenal, hitting a few German suplexes and the diving headbutt to put away the upstart. Number 123, Matt Hardy versus Jeff Hardy in an Extreme Rules match at WrestleMania 25. Sick of being overshadowed by little brother Jeff, Matt Hardy decided to set fire to Jeff's house and kill his dog. If you thought Broken Matt was over the top, then you clearly didn't live through this whole episode. While we all wanted the inevitable Matt versus Jeff match, this build wasn't the way to go. It was too evil, too pantomime, and more than a little uncomfortable. The match didn't fare much better, and although it wasn't bad, we all expected far too much. This was maybe due to the Hardy's previous exploits in TLC matches, never mind the fact that Matt killed Jeff's dog! Make no mistake though, the Hardys put on a show and took some harsh bumps, before Matt got the win with a nasty twist of fate through a chair. But the story was so extreme that anything short of someone getting put through a meat grinder was a bit underwhelming. Number 122, Bailey versus Lacey Evans versus Naomi versus Sasha Banks versus Tamina, SmackDown Women's Title Elimination match at WrestleMania 36, Night 2. Five-way matches are rarely a good idea. They usually feel thrown together and rushed. But this was a nice surprise, as we got a well-worked and brilliantly booked five-way for the SmackDown Women's Title. Obviously, Tamina was treated as the big threat, in the same way that Big Show suddenly becomes unbeatable around Royal Rumble time, but was the first to be eliminated. Naomi soon followed after a bank statement, and we were down to three. We were all wondering if WWE was finally going to pull the trigger on Bailey versus Banks, but surprisingly they held on. Dissension was teased as Bailey accidentally nailed Sasha with a knee to the chops, but all was seemingly forgiven as Banks took a women's right for the team while Bailey simply watched on. Bailey eventually retained and their story went on. Number 121, Cody Rhodes vs. Rey Mysterio at WrestleMania 27. Dr. Doom vs. Captain America here, as grotesque masked Cody Rhodes took on red, white, and blue sporting Rey Mysterio. Mysterio had broken Cody's nose with his knee brace, forcing Rhodes to get reconstructive surgery. No longer feeling dashing, Cody became a twisted lunatic, donning a creepy plastic mask and seeking revenge on Rey, attempting to rip off the luchador's mask. Cody took control early on, but Rey soon fought his way back into the match, eventually taking off Cody's masks and 619ing his once dashing face. Cody recovered though, smacked Ray with his own knee brace, and hit crossroads for the win. Number 120, Rick Rude versus The Ultimate Warrior for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 5. Tea and toast, macaroni and cheese, Ultimate Warrior and Rick Rude. Some things just go together perfectly. In the case of Rude and Warrior, the pair did some of their best work together, with the always reliable Rude proving to be the perfect foil to the erratic Warrior. The two were feuding because they both wanted to be seen as WWE's top beef boy, and the jealous Rude wanted to take Warrior's dignity as well as his IC title. Rude was the business. Look at him, the moustache, the mullet, the airbrush tights, simply ravishing. Warrior 
Victoria started like a house on fire, obviously. But Rude soon got the advantage with thumbs to the eye and bites. Not enough biting in wrestling these days for me. When Warrior was in control, Rude made him look a million dollars. However, Rude turned it around with the help of Bobby Heenan, reversing a Warrior suplex as the weasel held Warrior's feet down. One, two, three, new Intercontinental Champion. Number 119, John Cena versus Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania 30. Ah, uh, Bray Wyatt, how different things would have been for you had you won this match. Everyone's favorite greasy, spooky sociopath made his WrestleMania debut trying to get Cena to embrace the hate. No, not like that time with Kane and Zack Ryder, this was totally different. The crowd were hot as Wyatt repeatedly tried to get Cena to unleash on him, but good guy John overcame the odds as per usual and won in 22 minutes. This was your classic good versus evil encounter, but probably one that evil should of one. Wyatt needed a big scalp to stop him from becoming a simple monster of the week, while Cena needed to show some vulnerability and freshen up his act. But alas, lol, Cena wins, and Wyatt looked like a chump for the time being. Number 118, The Undertaker vs Kane at WrestleMania 14. After Undertaker vowed to never fight Kane, the newcomer pushed his older brother too far, locking him in a casket and setting it on fire. And so the match was set for WrestleMania 14, and the crowd were absolutely electric trick as the Brothers of Destruction finally faced off. The two went back and forth, basically just digging each other in the face for 17 minutes and brawling around the ring. Not even Taker missing his big dive and crashing through the Spanish announce table could finish things as neither man would stay down. The dead man needed three, yes, three tombstones to just about put his younger brother away. Taker was 7-0, but this wouldn't be their last WrestleMania encounter. Number 117, The Undertaker vs Kane at WrestleMania 20. Six years later, and they were at it again. What are they like, eh? This time round, Kane had had enough of the American badass and decided to bury him alive. It didn't really work. Undertaker stopped being a spooky biker and became some kind of undead zombie cowboy instead and scared the bejesus out of Kane for weeks on end with the help of little more than a gong and a dimmer switch. Come Mania 20 and the dead man made his proper return, flanked by Druids and Paul Bearer as Kane overacted and pretended that the Undertaker was a figment of his imagination. Great stuff. Taker basically annihilated Kane here, although the devil's favorite demon did get some hits in, but Moody Mark sat up, said boo, and tombstoned Kane in the center of the ring for the three. Number 116, Triple H versus Sting in a no DQ match at WrestleMania 31. The match we had all been waiting years for, Sting versus the Undertaker. Triple H. Sting insisted that he was in WWE to stop the game and the McMahons, but Triple H changed the story to WCW is crap, Roffle, because WWE will never get over the Monday Night Wars. Both men were some years past their prime, but still knew two important things, how to work work a crowd and how to tell a story. DX soon turned up because the click, while the NWO came to Sting's aid in a move that makes about as much sense as Vince McMahon going for burgers with Tony Khan and Ted Turner. Eventually, Triple H got the win with the sledgehammer as the commentators pondered whether this was the end of the WWE versus WCW war. Ugh. Meanwhile, as entertaining as the match was, wrestling fans the world over kicked their televisions in frustration. You might have been better losing this one, Paul. Number 115, Randy Savage versus Ted DiBiase in the WWE title tournament final at WrestleMania 4. Finally, the final of the WrestleMania 4 title tournament, Savage versus DiBiase, with both men vying for their first WWE title win. As this was Macho's fourth match of the night and DiBiase's third, the odds were stacked against Savage, especially as Ted had Andre the Giant in his corner. That didn't stop Randy changing into his fourth outfit of the night though. What a showman. This went how you would expect it would, with the always fantastic Savage and DiBiase working well together and the threat of Andre being a thorn in Savage's side. Sadly, the crowd chanted Hogan at times, meaning that the entirety of New Jersey is cancelled. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. 
After tons of interference, the crowd got their wish as Liz brought Hogan out to even the score, and Savage nailed the elbow drop for the win. Now, let's never speak of WrestleMania 4 again. Number 114, Randy Orton vs CM Punk at WrestleMania 27. The Nexus just couldn't catch a break, could they? Even with CM Punk as leader, they never got wins when it mattered. Punk decided that Orton was to be the group's target of choice, as he and the new Nexus smashed Orton's knee, revenge for when Orton punted Punk and forced him to vacate the World Heavyweight title in 2008. The anonymous Raw GM then made the match official because 2011 was a weird time. Punk focused much of his offense on Orton's knee, taking the punt out of action. The pace intensified, with Punk going for a GTS, Orton dodging it and going for an RKO, which too was dodged. Punk went for the springboard clothesline, and Orton got his customary jaw-dropping WrestleMania RKO, catching Punk in midair for the win. A good match, but Punk probably needed the victory more. I wonder how the rest of his 2011 panned out for him. Number 113, Becky Lynch vs Shayna Baszler for the Raw Women's title at WrestleMania 36 Night 1. Shayna Baszler is hard as nails. I know this, you know this, NXT knows this, and for about 10 minutes, WWE knew this. After turning up on Raw in early 2020, Shayna demolished the women's division, single-handedly eliminating the five other competitors in the Elimination Chamber to earn a crack at Becky Lynch's title. The man turned up to the Performance Center in Optimus Prime, having been champion since WrestleMania 35, and the two went right at it. This was Becky's biggest challenge since becoming champion, and as Shayna slammed Becky's head into the announce table, we all thought Lynch's reign was coming to an end. But Becky got the roll up and escaped with the title. A good match and a good win for Becky, but her run had become stale, and Shayna beating her would have surely been the right decision. Number 112, The Undertaker vs Diesel at WrestleMania 12. As the two largest lads in WWE, Taker and Diesel collided throughout 1996 to prove who was the biggest boy, or something along those lines. Scraps at the Rumble and In Your House 6 led up to Mania 12 as Taker looked to secure win number 5 at the granddaddy of them all. Rather than your usual big man match, we had a good back and forth between two men who happened to be big. Diesel and Taker were evenly matched, but Big Daddy Cool dominated a portion of this bout, making Taker look almost human in the process. But Mania to Taker is like a fat toadstool to Super Mario, and the dead man survived two jackknifes to come back, hit the tombstone, and do his knee pose thing. Diesel soon left WWE for WCW, which never came back to haunt Vince in the slightest. Number 111, Dangerous Danny Davis and the Hart Foundation versus the British Bulldogs and Tito Santana at WrestleMania 3. We all love a corrupt referee angle. Nick Patrick, Shane McMahon, and Scott Armstrong all spring to mind, but none had as much heat as Danny Davis. Everybody wanted to see him get the taste slapped out of his mouth as he teamed with the Pink and Black Attack to take on Tito Santana and the Bulldogs. Now, no offense to Danny and Tito, but just imagine if this had been the Foundation versus the Bulldogs. It was instead made a six-man to take the pressure off an injured Dynamite Kid. Pandemonium reigned supreme here, as when everyone was brawling about and the ref was distracted, Davis grabbed Jimmy Hart's megaphone and blasted Davy Boy Smith with it for the win. Another Jimmy Hart megaphone finish? I never realized WrestleMania was so chock full of them. Number 110, The Rockers vs The Barbarian and Haku at WrestleMania 7. After a couple of WrestleManias spent taking losses against the big lads, the Rockers finally got their time in the sun, as they got the win over the awesome duo of Barbarian and Haku. Sean and Marty were getting more popular as the weeks went by, and it was obvious that they were going to one day be tag champs. Spoiler, they never officially won the gold. As the Rockers went up the card, they had to get through the faces of fear, and the two teams gelled nicely. This was your typical Rockers match. Plenty of tandem offense before Marty got the living snot beaten out of him, leading to a Sean hot tag as the crowd went wild. A missile dropkick from Marty and a Sean flying crossbody onto Haku was enough for the win. The match was nothing revolutionary, but it didn't need to be. Number 109, The Usos vs. Alistair Black and Ricochet vs. Rusev and Shinsuke Nakamura vs. The Bar for the SmackDown Tag Titles at WrestleMania 35. It's the battle of the thrown together team. Teams, and the Usos, they know each other quite well, actually, so they probably don't fall under that category. I mean, WrestleMania was already 55 hours long, but there surely should have been a way to get Ricochet, Black, and Nakamura in singles matches. Maybe that's asking too much, I don't know. Regardless, with this level of talent between the ropes, it was always bound to be a good match, and the eight men went hell for leather in the 10 minutes they were given. 
This was a relentlessly quick match with lots of quick tags and even quicker action. The crowd enjoyed it, going especially mad when Sheamus bludgeoned everyone's chests as Cesaro swung Ricochet 400 times. After a fun segment where everyone got to hit each other with big kicks, the Usos used their years of tag experience to pick up the win and retain the titles. Number 108, Otis vs Dolph Ziggler at WrestleMania 36 Night 2. Let's give the little nerds some hope for their pathetic little lives said Vince McMahon, probably, as massive meat-obsessed weirdo Otis battled Dolph Ziggler for the love of Mandy Rose. On paper, this should have been crap, but it worked tremendously well, with the WWE Universe legit invested in Otis's awkward attempts to woo Mandy. Sonya Deville meddled in their budding romance and Dolph got involved too because he ruins everything, and we all thought that Mandy would turn on Otis and go with Ziggler. In the match itself, the veteran Ziggler out-wrestled Otis for the majority of it, but the big man came back strong, using his power to dominate. Deville tried interfering, but Mandy appeared, slapped her former BFF, and punched Ziggler's manhood as Otis got the win and the girl. Unfortunately, this was one of Mania 36's matches that desperately needed a crowd. Imagine the reaction when Otis and Mandy finally kissed. Oh yeah! Number 107, The Undertaker vs Shane McMahon, Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania 32. Shane McMahon came back, said something about a lockbox, and was put into a Hell in a Cell match against The Undertaker by mean old Vince, who said the dead man had to win or he would never fight at Mania again. As soon as this was announced, we all thought they've just done this so Shane can jump off the top of the thing, haven't they? And you know what? We were right. The match was okay, and Shane looked pretty good considering he hadn't been in a ring for nearly a decade, but this didn't make a whole load of sense. I mean, why would The Undertaker give a toss about McMahon family drama, trademark? But honestly, who cares? Shane did his big stuntman bump, and Taker got another win at Mania, and that's good enough for me. Number 106, Diesel vs. Shawn Michaels for the WWE title at WrestleMania 11. Two dudes with attitudes explode as Diesel and Shawn square off for the WWE title. Diesel was Vince's new boy and was in the middle of an underwhelming WWE title run. Sean had binned him off and picked up Sid as his new muscle as the former friends battled over championship gold and the affections of Pamela Anderson. The two traded the advantage, fighting all over the ringside area as Sid did absolutely bugger all to secure the win for HBK. Sweet Chin Music could have sealed it, but the ref was down, allowing Diesel to hulk up, hit a horrible looking jackknife, and retain the gold. It wasn't exactly too sweet, but it wasn't bad either. Number 105, Edge vs Alberto Del Rio for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 27. 13 years on from Hogan vs Goldberg, and the big gold belt was curtain jerking the Georgia Dome as Edge put the title on the line against Alberto Del Rio. That's sad really, isn't it? Del Rio earned this match by winning the 40-man Royal Rumble and proceeded to make Edge's life hell with pre-dinosaur Brodus Clay by his side. Edge got Christian in his corner to even the score, which makes sense. Despite a strong start from Alberto, Edge eventually overcame the odds, retained after a spear, and smashed up Del Rio's Rolls Royce like the special stage in Street Fighter 2. At the time, it felt underwhelming, but it proved to be Edge's last match for nine years. In hindsight, it was a decent way to bow out and a perfectly acceptable way to start WrestleMania. Number 104, Tony Nese vs Buddy Murphy for the Cruiserweight title on the WrestleMania 35 pre-show. The Cruiserweight title on the pre-show for the third year in a row? Almost like WWE doesn't properly care about it. To be fair, a balls-out, high-work-rate cruiserweight match is the perfect way to warm up a crowd, and Nice vs Murphy was a great choice for the spot. The two went from 0 to 60 in about 20 seconds and barely slowed down from there. They went back and forth, hitting high spot after high spot, cheeky Nando's kicks, reverse go-to-sleeps, poison Frankensteiners. Slow down, fellas! After a barrage of moves by both men, Nice hit the running Nice in the corner and won the title. This was a very good match, albeit a bit of a spot fest, but the lack of importance shown by WWE hurt it slightly. Number 103, Mickey James vs Trish Stratus for the women's title at WrestleMania 22. Oh yes, the match that made Mickey James a star, and made many teenagers get a tingle in their trousers. Mickey was Trish's biggest fan, but soon became a little unhinged. Trish decided that she'd had enough, and after James finally snapped, the match was set for Mania 22. 
What unfolded was one of the most notorious matches in WrestleMania history, and at the time, the greatest women's match to take place at Mania 2. Nikki and Trish worked amazingly together, which isn't hard considering they were two of the best in their division, but things went up a notch as Mickey suggestively pinned Trish and had a little taste of her hands afterwards. The crowd absolutely loved it, but Vince McMahon was allegedly raging backstage. Mickey eventually got the win with the Mick Kick and was apparently given an earful about her salacious taunt behind the scenes. Number 102, the British Bulldogs versus the Dream Team for the tag titles at WrestleMania 2. The main event of part two of WrestleMania 2 saw the British Bulldogs take on tag champs the Dream Team. The two teams had been feuding for months, with Dream Team manager luscious Johnny V usually proving to be the difference maker. The Bulldogs drafted in Lou Albano to even the score, and Ozzy Osbourne was there too in a lovely pink suit, probably high as a kite and full of tasty bat meat. These two teams knew each other well and put on match of the night, with the power of Davy Boy and Dynamite's technical proficiency proving too much for the champs. Dynamite took a terrifying bump from the top to the floor, and Davy Boy got the win in the confusion. With Dynamite Kid and Ozzy Osbourne in the same room, I dread to think what the celebrations were like afterwards. Number 101, The Undertaker vs Bray Wyatt at WrestleMania 31. Old Goth vs Young Goth was on for Mania 31, after weeks of Bray claiming that he was WWE's new chief spooky ghoul. Taker lost at Mania 30, Bray Wyatt lost at Mania 30, both men badly needed this win, but who would get it? Undertaker controlled Wyatt as the commentators gushed about him, Bray got his shots in, but at no point did he ever look like he would actually end up winning. Taker let him kick out of a tombstone, which was nice of him, but soon kicked out of a sister Abigail before a second tombstone sealed the deal. Unfortunately, the Eater of Worlds simply needed this more, and this loss completely killed his character at the time. Number 100, Bailey vs Charlotte Flair vs Nia Jax vs Sasha Banks Raw Women's Title Elimination Match at WrestleMania 33. WWE just love a multi-person match for their women's titles, don't they? We had two at WrestleMania 33, with hometown girl Naomi winning the SmackDown title from a host of opponents. The Raw Fatal 4-Way, however, was a far more developed contest. Predictably, everyone ganged up on Nia to eliminate her first, doing the deed with a triple Tower of Doom powerbomb. The match kicked into second gear, with Charlotte hitting a beautiful corkscrew moonsault to the outside, before eliminating Sasha after flinging the boss into to an exposed turnbuckle. Bailey and Flair ended the match, with the hugger being the first to defeat Charlotte at pay-per-view a month earlier. Charlotte missed the moonsault but kept control, locking Bailey into the figure eight. But Bailey fought on as Charlotte sort of fell into the turnbuckle, allowing Bailey to hit the Macho Man elbow drop for the feel-good win. Number 99, Ted DiBiase versus Jake Roberts for the million dollar title at WrestleMania 6. This was certainly one of the greatest feuds of Jake Roberts career. The snake was disgusted by Ted DiBiase's flaunting of his wealth and vowed to humble him. Ted just laughed, as always, since he could afford to. The crowd were at fever pitch for this match, with both men starting very intensely. Ted soon got control, and the crowd got even louder when he locked in the million dollar dream. Jake worked his way out, and when he readied for the DDT, the roof nearly blew off the Sky Dome. But then Virgil had to ruin everything, as he and DiBiase double teamed Jake outside, winning by count out and taking the million dollar title back. Don't worry though, Jake got his heat back, hitting the DDT and throwing a few DBSE dollars out to the crowd. Number 98, The Rock vs Ken Shamrock for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 14. Nation of Domination era Rock was amazing, and as IC champion, he was one of the most hated men in WWE. For his part, Shamrock was also getting serious fan momentum, sometimes due to a lot of screaming and being a very angry boy. Rock had been boiling Shamrock's blood for ages, memorably caving his head in with a chair on Raw. Shamrock was fuming at the best of times, but this turned him another shade of furious. In the match itself, Shamrock soon got the upper hand, but Rock soon bludgeoned Ken with a chair. But that only made Shamrock angrier, as the former UFC champion suplexed Rocky before slapping him in an ankle lock. And leave it to Ron Simmons to rub salt in the wound. Farouk had beef with his stablemate, and
and flipped off the Brahma bull after his submission loss. But still, Mad Ken wouldn't break the hold and was DQ'd, leading to referees reversing the decision and keeping the IC title on The Rock. Number 97, Evolution vs The Rock and Sock Connection at WrestleMania 20. Randy Orton and Mick Foley had a heated feud in 2004 that helped turn the legend killer into a legitimate player in WWE. Orton routinely belittled and battered Foley with the help of his buddies in Evolution, leaving the mixer with no choice but to bring The Rock back from Hollywood. Given the way things are often booked these days, it's a little weird to see WWE bring Rock back for a tag match in the middle of the show, rather than shoving him straight into a main event. But the crowd certainly didn't seem to mind, cheering wildly as The Rock and Sock laid the smackdown on Orton, Flair and Batista. The faces took it in turns to have the spotlight, but the numbers game eventually caught up to them, with Mick eventually falling victim to the RKO. This finish wasn't just a case of protecting Rocky either. It made sense going forward as the issues between Foley and Orton only intensified, leading to their excellent hardcore match the following month at Backlash. Number 96, Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon versus Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn at WrestleMania 34. Daniel Bryan was finally back after three years and it's fair to say that everyone was absolutely buzzing. Better yet, he was against great in-ring talents like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. Get in! Oh, yeah, and Shane McMahon was in there too. A last-minute addition to the Mania card, this came about because Owens and Zayn were giving the heads of SmackDown grief, assaulting Brian and Shane, and eventually getting themselves fired. If the bad guys won here, they would be rehired. Kevin Sammy bum-rushed the faces, powerbombing Brian into the apron before the bell rang. Our boy D. Bry was stretched out to the crowd's disappointment, while Shane held his own because he's harder than Bruce Lee, the Terminator, and your dad combined. After Shane was booted in the diverticulitis, Brian came back out to dish out a beating, and the faces triumphed. This was a good match and a genuine feel-good moment, but Shane going all Muhammad Ali on Kevin Sammy was a tad farcical. Number 95, Drew McIntyre versus Brock Lesnar for the WWE title at WrestleMania 36 Night 2. WrestleMania 36 was the mania of short three-move world title matches. Night 1 saw Braun and Goldberg put on a clinic, while Night 2 got this four-minute encounter between Drew McIntyre and Brock Lesnar. Both guys went in hard, Drew withstanding three German suplexes and three F5s before nailing Lesnar with three huge Claymore kicks to finally win the WWE title. At four minutes, this was probably the perfect length. Drew looked dominant and was crowned as the new guy, capping off a fantastic build which had begun at the Royal Rumble. You had to feel for Drew though, after the way in which he'd built himself back up after being released in 2014, to have this huge crowning moment without a crowd to cheer him on must have been rough. But still, it was a great start to his first WWE title reign. Number 94, Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie vs The New Age Outlaws Tag Team Title Dumpster Match at WrestleMania 14. The Outlaws hadn't been a top team for too long before they provoked the ire of Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie, locking the two two old foes in a dumpster and sending it off the Raw stage. This was a good enough excuse for the first ever dumpster match, aka a casket match, but in a big bin. This was utter chaos as everything from ladders to forklifts were used, as well as a few nasty falls here and there. The action soon spilled into the back where Terry Funk drove a forklift around, eventually tossing the outlaws in and mechanically holding down the lid to win the titles. This was a great brawl that arguably made the outlaws, plus it was nice seeing Terry Funk get his first and only title in WWE. That was until they lost the titles back to the Outlaws the next night on Raw. Number 93, Shane McMahon versus The Miz in a Falls Count Anywhere match at WrestleMania 35. Shane McMahon was crowned best wrestler in the world because of course he was, and Miz started buddying up to him with the two becoming tag champs. We assume Miz would turn heel out of jealousy, but instead it was Shane who went to the dark side as this became a story of my dad is better than than your dad. We were curious to see how Miz would fare as this wasn't his usual wheelhouse, especially with the Falls Count Anywhere stipulation. As expected, the two fought all over the arena.
arena with Shane splatting from the roof of a golf cart but having the fortitude to keep going. As the scrap reached a crescendo, Miz nailed a huge superplex off a camera rig through a platform below. Unfortunately though, Shane landed on top and he got the pin despite both men being KO'd. This was all about big George Mizanin though, especially when he squared up to Shane and got duly trounced. Classic. Number 92, John Cena versus The Big Show for the US title at WrestleMania 20. Big match John's first proper big match on the biggest stage against The Big Show. Big. Cena had gotten over with his freestyles and general attitude and was cheered immensely upon his arrival to MSG. Big Show was heel, for a change, and firmly took control of the encounter. It's weird going back and seeing a time when the hardcore New York crowd was solidly behind Cena, but it happened here. They chanted loudly for him and lost their minds when he nailed the FU for a two count, as Show became the first ever person to kick out of it. Cena grabbed his big obnoxious chain and threw it to distract the ref, allowing him to nail Show with his brass knucks, hit a second FU, and win his first title in WWE. Number 91, Cedric Alexander versus Mustafa Ali in the Cruiserweight title tournament final on the WrestleMania 34 pre-show. A year on from the great Austin Aries vs Neville match, and the Cruiserweight title was even more of an afterthought than we thought possible. Everyone's favourite human, Enzo Amore, had been stripped of the title and fired, so the vacant belt was up for grabs in a tournament. Cedric Alexander and Mustafa Ali were the final two and were both babyface, so it was time for a good old fashioned bout of sportsmanship. The in-ring action was fast and crisp, but the storytelling was a bit too cheesy, with Ali shouting, I'm the heart, and Cedric with, I'm the soul every 40 seconds. The crowd weren't really asked, which is a shame, but what can you really do? After some more shouting about hearts and souls, Cedric put Ali down with a lumbar check to win his first Cruiserweight title. Number 90, Bret Hart vs Yokozuna WWE title with Roddy Piper as special guest ref at WrestleMania 10. The end of a grueling WrestleMania saw Bret Hart and Yokozuna going at it for the WWE title. Both men had fought earlier in the night, Bret losing against his brother Owen in a classic while Yoko beats poor hapless Lex Luger. Burt Reynolds introduced the returning Roddy Piper to officiate the match, and luckily Hot Rod did a far better job than he would at WrestleMania 11. Both competitors were exhausted, with Brett selling an injured knee. Yoko used his large frame to dominate Hart, as managers Mr. Fuji and Jim Cornette attempted to distract Rowdy Roddy. Cornette took a smack to the jaw before Brett mounted a comeback, pinning Yoko after he made a mess of the bonsai drop and starting his second reign as WWE Champion. The locker room emptied and celebrated with Brett while Owen looked on dejected. Number 89, Brock Lesnar versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania 30. Brock Lesnar has won everything there is to win, but there was one prize he wanted more than any other, The Undertaker's streak. Squaring off for the first time in 11 years, things started slowly as Taker took control of Lesnar before Brock wore down the dead man as the two battled around ringside. Lesnar slugged Taker with little reply, but we all knew Taker would come back, right? The match built as the two traded submissions and finishers with a somewhat subdued crowd watching it on. It later transpired that the sluggishness of the performers was likely due to Taker suffering a concussion early on. A third F5 ended it and the New Orleans Superdome was stunned. The streak was over. We all knew that the streak had to be broken one day, but nothing would have prepared us for its eventual end. Was Brock the right man to end it? It's more than a little arguable, but you cannot deny the power and magnitude of this moment. Number 88, Seth Rollins versus Triple H in a non-sanctioned match at WrestleMania 33. After being Triple H's pet project for a number of years, the game turned his back on Seth Rollins. Rollins was miffed, called Hunter out at NXT TakeOver, got arrested, called Hunter out on Raw, got dismantled by Samoa Joe, and luckily made it to Mania in one piece. Unfortunately, the match didn't live up to the build as Hunter and Seth slugged it out for over 25 minutes, a running theme with Papa H at WrestleMania. Mania. It wasn't a bad match, mind you, and it's always good to see Stephanie take a table bump, but it wasn't violent enough to warrant the stipulation. It got Seth over as a face, and that's all that mattered. CrossFit Jesus getting the win with a pedigree. Also, how angry do you reckon Goldberg was when Triple H made his entrance surrounded by police? It's not like Big Bill was wrestling on the same card or anything. Number 87, Chris Benoit versus Chris Jericho versus Kurt Angle for the Intercontinental and European title in a two-falls match at WrestleMania 2000. Has 
anyone had a better rookie year than Kurt Angle. Barely five months into his WWE career and he was already a double champion, holding both Intercontinental and European gold as he walked into his first WrestleMania. Angle was forced to defend both titles in a double falls match, first fall for the IC title, second for the European. If you like suplexes, then this is the match for you, with all three competitors dishing out various throws. Benoit got the first fall with a diving headbutt on Jericho, then Jericho returned the favour with a lion salt for the European title. Angle lost both belts without being pinned or submitted, and was rightly gutted. As three of the best of their generation, they worked incredibly well together, but only got 13 minutes. Give it another five at least, and this could have been a real show stealer. Number 86, Randy Orton versus John Cena versus Triple H for the WWE title at WrestleMania 24. Despite swathes of fans being sick of him, everyone popped hard when John Cena returned and won the 2008 Royal Rumble. Triple H then won the Elimination Chamber, and both men set their sights on WWE Champion Randy Orton, even though Cena blew his shot initially at No Way Out. When the game went for a sleeper on Orton after about 45 seconds, we expected the worst, but we were wrong, especially when Hunter and Randall hit a doomsday device on Cena out of nowhere. Nothing flashy here, but these were three elite workers who knew how to build a match. The crowd were invested, with the dueling Cena chants ringing around for the majority of the contest. The in-ring action wasn't the most exciting, sure, but it all built to those final moments as Cena and Triple H battled for supremacy. Hunter got a pedigree, but Orton punted him and pinned Cena to retain. Number 85, Neville versus Austin Aries for the Cruiserweight title on the WrestleMania 33 pre-show. The first Cruiserweight title match at WrestleMania since Mania 20, and it was the pre-show curtain jerker, of course. But look at it, Neville versus Austin Aries, an indie dream match on a Mania card. The crowd were well up for it, chanting Aries from the get-go. Neville was in his moody King of the Cruiserweights phase and was determined to ground and pound the high-flying Aries. The two went to war, with Neville nailing several nasty German suplexes. Aries looked to have things won with Last Chancery, but that dastardly Nev poked his eyes and hit the red arrow to retain. Truth be told, this should have been on the main card. Aries and Neville were two of the best on the planet at the time, and this bump to the pre-show and subsequent omission from the Mania 33 Blu-ray hastened both men's exit from WWE. Number 84, John Cena vs The Big Show vs Edge for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 25. Edge beat Cena for the World Heavyweight title, and his wife Vicky Guerrero promised Big Show he would get a title shot at WrestleMania. Cena revealed that Vicky and Show had been playing hide the sausage and blackmailed his way into this match. Unfortunately, this followed Taker vs HBK, so the crowd were absolutely exhausted, and not even Cena's army of geeks could get them adequately hyped. They woke up for the closing stages though. Vicky and Chavo got involved, with Edge accidentally spearing Vic off the apron as the crowd roared. Super Cena eventually got the win after an AA on show, then an AA on Edge, on to show. Makes sense. Number 83, Rey Mysterio vs Randy Orton vs Kurt Angle for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 22. Now don't get us wrong, we love Rey Mysterio, he is a bona fide wrestling legend, but his ascent to the world title left a bitter taste in the mouth. Mysterio won the Royal Rumble, dedicating his win to his late friend and former tag partner Eddie Guerrero. Runner-up Randy Orton got involved and said that Eddie was in hell, while champion Kurt Angle was basically a passenger in the feud. Orton pinged Kurt with the belt straight away, so it was essentially Randy versus Ray, but the Olympic hero came in and suplexed everything in sight, before Ray nailed Orton with the 619 for the win, celebrating with Chavo and Vicky Guerrero. This was good, but too short at only 9 minutes long, and the storyline was tasteless at times. Number 82, Money in the Bank at WrestleMania 26. The sixth and final WrestleMania Money in the Bank was also the busiest, with 10 participants battling for the briefcase. Everyone set their sights instantly on Mr. McMahon's pet project Drew McIntyre, downing the Scotsman with a parade of finishers. This was your standard ladder spectacle, but it was nothing new, and with 10 people, it didn't flow brilliantly. Born, Kofi, and regular Money in the Bank star Shelton were in there solely to add excitement, and we all knew there was no hope of them winning. But credit where it's due, this match type was always a fun, exciting affair, and could be counted on for a WrestleMania moment or two. Ultimately, the All-American American climbed highest, even if it did take him a little while to unhook the briefcase. Number 81, John Cena vs The Rock for the WWE title at WrestleMania 29. Once, uh, sorry, twice in a lifetime. Yes, 
this, just a year after their only WrestleMania encounter, Rock and Cena squared off once more, this time for the WWE title. Now, there's a strong argument to be made that CM Punk should have been in this match, or that Punk should have never dropped the belt to the great one in the first place. No wonder he left town, the poor bugger. But yes, yeah, Cena versus Rock for the title. In fairness, you can't really blame them for trying to replicate the record-setting buy rate from the year before. And while their first encounter felt far bigger, this still managed to have that big fight feel with the crowd hot from the start. Rock and John didn't reinvent the wheel or anything, they just did what they do best and had the crowd lapping up every moment. Far too many finishes though, as Cena won after his third AA. Number 80, The Undertaker vs Ric Flair, no DQ at WrestleMania 18. The first time the streak was emphasised was when The Undertaker took on Ric Flair at Mania 18, after being briefly mentioned the previous year. Big Evil was 9-0 and had battered Nature's associate Arn Anderson and his son, WCW icon David Flair. This match was intense from the off, with the two legends brawling all around ringside. Flair did his customary blade job as his bleach blonde hair went bright red and Taker beat the dog out of him. Flair came back, smacking Taker with a lead pipe and then QR Arn Anderson with the greatest spinebuster in wrestling history. Seriously, that spot alone is enough to get this match comfortably into the top 100. The Enforcer's involvement was not enough to swing the momentum back in Flair's favour though, and soon Taker busted out the tombstone for the win and to go 10-0. That spinebuster though, might get it tattooed on my stomach. Number 79, Rey Mysterio vs Eddie Guerrero at WrestleMania 21. Eddie and Ray were tag champions and, without anything better to do, decided to have an exhibition match at WrestleMania 21. I mean, they could have defended their tag titles, but whatever. I'm not complaining too much about these lads deciding to wrestle each other, you know? Eddie and Ray had wrestled many times before, with their Halloween Havoc 97 bout being a certified classic. We all knew what they were capable of, and this was a fine entry into their series. Ray's knees were yet to turn to peanut butter, so he could still fly around the ring with glee, and Eddie was no slouch either. As friends and partners they were evenly matched, but Eddie took a few liberties as the match wore on. Ray eventually got the victory with a Hurricane Rana and the two old mates shook hands post-match. But Eddie was secretly fuming and this union would soon disintegrate. Unfortunately, this would prove to be Eddie's final WrestleMania appearance. A fine final Mania chapter in an amazing career. Number 78, John Cena vs Rusev for the US title at WrestleMania 31. Ratings not stellar, only one thing for for it, USA versus Russia, starring a Bulgarian and his American wife in the role of Russians. Rusev was on a tear through WWE, bludgeoning everything before him before getting his mitts on the US title and disparaging the red, white and blue. John Cena suddenly decided he was the new Jim Duggan and that he was America's last hope. Rusev entered the bout in a tank in one of the coolest entrances in WrestleMania history. Cena got a big Yay America video and was greeted with John Cena sucks chant. The first W in WWE stands for World, not America, Vince. The entrances overshadowed the match, sure, but the bout was solid and told a good story, with America overcoming all adversity to defeat the undefeated Rusev and liberate the US title. It also led to Cena's celebrated weekly US title open challenge, which was ace. Number 77, AJ Styles vs Shinsuke Nakamura for the WWE title at WrestleMania 34. Is there anything more disappointing than something not living up to the hype? Nak Nakamura had won the Royal Rumble to set up a WWE title match against AJ Styles, and the internet collectively lost its mind. Wrestling fans were just salivating at the prospect of a Wrestle Kingdom 10 rematch. Even people who have never seen any New Japan were going, oh, a Wrestle Kingdom rematch. WWE further bigged it up as a dream match, and it was good. Not great, not bad, just good. It still delivered in the ring, it was always bound to, but the weight of expectation crushed this one. The crowd stayed involved throughout, but anything short of it being the best match ever was always going to be disappointing. Harsh, but true. AJ won after 25 minutes before Shinsuke turned heel by punching him in the flat earths. Number 76, Shawn Michaels vs Mr McMahon in a no holds barred match at WrestleMania 22. Do you like violence? Do you like old men taking unnecessary risks? Do you like 
love bulging middle-aged muscles, then you'll love every Vince McMahon match. Vince just loves getting his head kicked in at WrestleMania, and Shawn Michaels had a go at number 22. Vince had decided to take HBK down a peg or two, repeatedly screwing him over while making allusions to the Montreal screw job. Shawn beat the absolute arse out of Vince, despite interference from the Spirit Squad and Shane, with the big spot of the match being a huge elbow drop from the top of a gargantuan ladder onto a bin wearing Vince through a table. A sweet chin music later, and HBK got the win on the practically lifeless genetic jackhammer. At one point, Vince did Bret Hart's pose, but the miserable hitman didn't show up, despite being inducted into the Hall of Fame the night before. Also, Vince was 60 here, the complete and utter lunatic. Number 75, Hulk Hogan versus Mr. McMahon in a street fight at WrestleMania 19. What did I just say, eh? He bloody loves it, does Vince? Leading into Mania 19, it was Hulk Hogan's turn to give the WWE owner a savage beating. The two were arguing about who was more vital to WWE's growth. Hogan saying he made the company a global phenomenon, Vince saying without his vision, there would be no Hulkamania. This was an intense garbage match, but it was great fun. Vince was bleeding, Hogan was bleeding, even Spanish announcer Hugo Savinovich was bleeding, as McMahon and Hogan just wailed on each other all over the gaff. Vince even did a leg drop off a ladder through a table, because he's insane. In a shocking moment, Roddy Piper appeared out of nowhere, grabbed a pipe and smashed Hogan in the face. But Hogan will never stay down or lose, and hit three leg drops on Vinnie Mac for the win. Mayhem. Brilliant mayhem. Number 74, AJ Styles versus Randy Orton at WrestleMania 35. The best storylines blur reality and fiction, and this felt pretty real as Randy and AJ bickered about their careers. Orton threw shade at AJ for getting a tan with Dixie Carter and Bullet Club's two sweeting. Styles, in return, ripped into Orton's knockoff diamond cutter. The crowd were game and the competitors were also, and it felt like there was genuine animosity between the two. Orton soon slowed things down with a submission because he was in arrogant bad guy mode, and that's his modus operandi. A back and forth clash between two veterans, AJ and Orton both performed their greatest hits, and the crowd went wild as Orton went for the draping DDT. Actually, in reality, they were cheering at the stadium lights being turned off, but anyway. The RKO couldn't put AJ away, as Styles hit a massive phenomenal forearm to the outside, then one inside the ring to seal the win. Number 73, Rey Mysterio vs CM Punk at WrestleMania 26. Miserable Phil had issues with Rey Mysterio, and instead of settling it like a normal person, he decided to creep out his family, call Rey a coward, and sing happy birthday to Aaliyah Mysterio like a drug-free Charles Manson. Punk was flanked by Str Great Edge Society goons Gallows and Serena, and delivered a sermon on his way to the ring. If Ray lost, he would have to join the stable. Punk was firmly in control for most of this match, outmuscling Ray and having his cronies attack when the ref was distracted. Ray would get pockets of momentum, but Punk's numbers advantage always went against him. However, Ray eventually got the upper hand, dispatched Gallows, and hit the 619 for the feel good win. He didn't have to join the group, but his issues with Punk would continue. Number 72, Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley for the NXT Women's Title, WrestleMania 36, Night 2. Rhea Ripley was NXT's rising star. Successfully defeating Shayna Baszler for the NXT title, it seemed like the sky was the limit. But then, Charlotte Flair happened. The Queen won the 2020 Royal Rumble, and in an unconventional move, decided she wanted to go for the NXT title at Mania. Great, we all thought. This will put Rhea over like Rover and get some much needed eyes on NXT. XT, but we forgot that WWE has something of a flair fetish. Charlotte didn't take Rhea seriously, trash talking her as she firmly took control, but Rhea got into the match and the two went hold for hold. Charlotte's veteran instincts kicked in and she targeted Ripley's knee to set up the figure eight, locking it in after 20 minutes to win the NXT women's title. Ripley put up a good fight and it was a great match, but she really should have won this. Charlotte gained nothing from the victory besides the title and Ripley's momentum was stalled. Number 71, John Cena versus Batista for the WWE title at WrestleMania 26. The two faces of a generation squared off when Cena and Batista locked horns at Mania 26. Big Dave was in his amazing douche Tista mode, jealous that Cena was pushed as the man. Cena was his usual babyface self, of course, and still thought that he was
was a soldier. Surprisingly, this was just a standard wrestling match. No shortcuts, no brawling outside, just two hefty thoroughbreds throwing it down in the ring. Batista outmuscled John for a good portion, but Cena came back with his five moves of doom and his best Jerry Lawler impression with a top rope five knuckle shuffle. Most surprisingly, the two main eventers went into a nice counter wrestling segment, putting those you can't wrestle chants to bed. Cena eventually got the win with the STFU, securing the first WWE title change at Mania since WrestleMania 21. Cena won it then too. Number 70, the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 25. This was the fifth annual Money in the Bank and we all knew what to expect. You had Kofi and Shelton to once again do all the mad stuff and a mix of mid-carders and main eventers vying for that guaranteed title shot. We've no idea why Mark Henry was in this though. We love you Mark, but there's no way you were winning here. Henry and Kane did some power moves while the other lads did all the graft. Shelton hit a scary swanton on the outside and nearly landed on his head and Hornswoggle got a tadpole splash off of Henry's back. Everyone took huge bumps and performed career shortening spots until Punk eventually became the first two time winner. Although a lot of the crowd actually wanted Christian to triumph. Number 69, nice. Triple H versus Brock Lesnar, no holds barred at WrestleMania 29. Nine years after his dreadful WrestleMania 20 match, and Brock Lesnar was back at the granddaddy of them all. The Beast forged a path of destruction through WWE after returning in 2012, including beating Triple H senseless and breaking his arm on a whim. Trips wanted revenge and signed on for a no holds barred match against Brock, but if he lost, his career would be over. It's a Triple H match, so you can bet it was about 10 minutes too long. It was good though, as Lesnar leathered the game without mercy. There were suplexes, there were weapons, there was Brock screaming like a frightened horse after throwing Hunter through an announce table. Dynamite stuff. But never bet against Triple H, and after fighting out of Brock's arm-breaking Kimura lock, Hunter applied one of his own and nearly made Lesnar tap. A pedigree on the steps later, and the beast had been slayed. Brock would have a far more successful WrestleMania the following year, though. Number 68, Kevin Owens versus Chris Jericho for the US title at WrestleMania 33. Owens and Jericho's future was one of the best storylines in WWE for a very long time, with Universal Champion Owens turning on his best friend during the incredible Festival of Friendship. We were all ready for this to be an amazing Universal title bout, but Goldberg happened, so we had to settle for the US title instead. Things started fairly slowly considering the stakes, but built nicely with both men having spells in control. The crowd grew into it as Owens and Jericho traded finishers, including a heart-stopping one-finger rope break from Owens after a code breaker. Owens folded Y2J with an apron powerbomb for the win and his first US title. This was a very good match, but it was just missing that certain something. Probably the Universal title, to be honest. Yes, I'm still bitter about that. Vince McMahon wasn't a fan of this though, likely because the wrestlers involved didn't have a combined age of 175. Number 67, Chris Jericho versus AJ Styles at WrestleMania 32. The match we thought we would never see. Jericho versus Styles. But unfortunately, it already happened twice before on Raw and Fastlane. But still, Jericho versus Styles. Styles had beaten Jericho on his Raw debut, and the two veterans shook hands and formed Y2AJ, complete with spangly shirts. But Jericho got envious of Styles' popularity, code-breaked him three times, and set up this bout. It didn't matter that we'd already seen these two go at it. This was WrestleMania, and everything just hits a little bit bigger. Unsurprisingly, Jericho and Styles put on an absolute blinder, with the audience noisy throughout. Both men were evenly matched, Jericho kicking out of a Styles clash, Styles kicking out of the code breaker, until eventually Jericho reversed a phenomenal forearm into another code breaker for the surprising victory. Number 66, The Undertaker vs Triple H at WrestleMania X7. What do you mean Triple H and Undertaker fought at WrestleMania X7? WWE clearly said that their match at Mania 27 was their first WrestleMania about. Surely they wouldn't rewrite history. But Taker and Triple H did indeed fight at X7, the first time the fair had faced off in singles competition on 
pay-per-view. Hunter had beaten everybody, but could the game topple the dead man? Taker was in full American badass mode, while Hunter was in the prime of his career, complete with Motorhead and Lemmy half-arsing his theme. This was a straight singles match, until the ref took a bump and stayed down for about two hours, so Taker and Hunter could fight all over the Astrodome, including a big chokeslam off a camera tower. This was prime Attitude Era madness, including the only sledgehammer shot in WWE history where Triple H didn't cover it with his hand, smacking Taker mid-last ride. Unfortunately, the gimmicked sledgehammer broke and ended up cutting Taker pretty deep. Despite leaking the red stuff, Taker nailed the last ride for the ninth win of the streak. Number 65, AJ Styles vs Shane McMahon at WrestleMania 33. The greatest in-ring performer of his generation took on, or I guess AJ Styles, in a match that was far better than anyone expected. Storyline-wise, the SmackDown co-GM was giving AJ the runaround with regards to a number one contender's position. Styles felt disrespected, spat his dummy out, and threw McMahon through a car window. Must have gotten tips from his years of working with Kurt Angle, I guess. The crowd were firmly on AJ's side, despite him being a heel, because he is that damn good. Shane kept up with AJ, possibly a little too much, as there was no way in hell he should be out wrestling the phenomenal one. After getting his face bopped in, Styles turned things around with the calf crusher, but Shane wouldn't say die and morphed into Dean Malenko as he got AJ in a number of submission holds before kicking out of a Styles clash. Behave. Shane would go on to hit a coast to coast, missed an elbow through the announce table, and a crisp shooting star press before underdog AJ got the phenomenal forearm for the win. For all that we take the mickey, Shane is a good performer when the match is right, but he should never ever be booked this strongly. Number 64, Shane McMahon versus Mr. McMahon in a street fight with Mick Foley as special guest referee at WrestleMania X7. Sticking with Shane for a second, and as we all know, he loves jumping jumping off and or through things. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon loves getting his head bashed in, and they both love it even more at WrestleMania. This was a recipe for something daft. This started as Vince threatening to divorce Linda and then drugging her so he could have an affair with Trish, don't ask. Soon, however, it became the culmination of the Monday Night Wars, as Shane turned up on Nitro announcing that he was WCW's new owner. Mick Foley was drafted in to oversee the action as Vince and his firstborn beat the living snot out of one another. And you know what? It was far better than it had any right to be. It was car crash trash TV, but it was entertaining as hell. There was Shane missing a huge elbow drop and splatting through the Spanish announce table. There was Trish and Stephanie having a real night out brawl at ringside, but it all led up to one of the loudest reactions of the night. Linda iconically snapping out of her comatose state to kick Vince in the grapefruits. Finally, Shane put Vince in the corner and hit a huge coast-to-coast -coast for the win, I think. Couldn't really see properly because Mick Foley's massive sheepdog head was in the way. Sorry, Mick. Number 63, Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant for the WWE title at WrestleMania 3. The irresistible force meets the immovable object. The first mega match WrestleMania ever promoted, a true dream match of its time, and one that is still fondly celebrated today. Hogan versus Andre. Hogan was the blue-eyed WWE champion, Andre was undefeated for 15 years, and turned heel for the first time under the watchful eye of the dastardly Bobby Heenan. The crowd were rabid for this, to put it mildly. The two icons slowly circled each other and did a bunch of basic offense. Shoves, punches, headbutts, that sort of thing. Hogan hurt his back trying to slam the giant and later tried pile driving Andre outside the ring to no avail. Andre was having a whale of a time and was tossing Hogan about with ease. Then it happened. Hogan hulked up, slammed Andre for the first time in Andre's career, shut up, and hit the leg drop for the win. Was this a Meltzer 8-star rated in-ring classic? No, but it didn't need to be. The story was so simple, but so effective, and it was played to perfection. When Hogan finally slammed Andre, the crowd absolutely lost it, producing a moment that will live on forever. Or at least until the next scandal. Brother. Number 62, Becky Lynch versus Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair, winner-takes-all match for the women's title at WrestleMania 35. 
Now we get to the first ever women's match to headline WrestleMania as Becky Lynch took on Raw Women's Champion Ronda Rousey and SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte Flair. This should have just been Lynch vs Rousey, but WWE have a weird obsession with Charlotte, so she was shoehorned in. Charlotte's inclusion didn't detract from the match in any way really, but it did feel unnecessary. However, the build was phenomenal. All three wrestlers had a legit claim to being the face of women's wrestling and routinely clashed, including a an amazing segment on Raw where they were fighting in and out of police cars. It was mayhem, and it was great. The animosity continued as this match started, as all three women kicked lumps out of each other, with Flair chopping layers off of Rousey. The crowd chanted for the man whenever she was in the match, celebrating when she got the win after 20 minutes with a bit of a botched crucifix pinfall on Ronda, a very disappointing ending to a good match. The start of the reign of Becky Two Belts was important and a rousing success. It's just a shame about the ending of the match and that the crowd were drained after such a long show. Number 61, John Cena vs Triple H for the WWE title at WrestleMania 22. This match had the backing of a weirdly subdued story for a WrestleMania main event, as Triple H won a tournament to face WWE Champion John Cena. Triple H was cocky, Cena was the underdog, and that was about it. Both men got big ridiculous entrances to make up for it though, Hunter coming out as a wonky Conan the Barbarian wannabe on Cody Rhodes' throne, while Cena came out with CM Punk and a load of lads dressed as the Ant Hill mob from Wacky Races. The crowd was sick of Cena after a year as the the man and loudly booed him from the second he appeared. Triple H started off in control and the crowd were buzzing in anticipation, but Cena eventually turned it around to a torrent of abuse. The two brawled all over the ringside area, going back and forth on offense until Hunter got the upper hand and clocked Cena with the sledgehammer, leading many to assume it was all over. But this was Super Cena, and after 20 minutes he got the win with the STFU, annoying many of those in attendance. It was a good match though though, lighten up guys. It wasn't a technical masterpiece, sure, but it enhanced the legend of John Cena and had the big fight feel required of a WrestleMania main event. Number 60, Steve Austin vs Shawn Michaels for the WWE title with Mike Tyson as special guest enforcer at WrestleMania 14. The main event of WrestleMania 14 saw one of the most significant changing of the guards in wrestling history, Michaels vs Austin, as the Attitude Era officially took flight. Austin was the most popular thing since drinking beer and telling your boss to F off as he clashed with Mike Tyson on Raw, getting tons of eyes on WWE and causing Eric Bischoff to pull his beautiful hair out in despair. DX enlisted Iron Mike as their muscle, so surely there was no way Austin was winning this one. Austin and Michaels traded blows all over the ringside area, HBK got his ass out because that's the sort of thing he liked to do, and took a ton of big bumps despite his back being in bits. Sean was clearly in a lot of pain, but was firmly in control until he went for the sweet chin music and Austin caught it, spun him, and planted him with the stunner to start his first WWE title run. The audience were ecstatic and got even louder when the baddest man on the planet knocked HBK clean out. Michaels was battered and bruised and was about to undergo major back surgery and retire, but rumour has it that Undertaker still needed to threaten him into doing the job. Number 59, The Undertaker vs Batista for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 23. In the mid-2000s, WWE just loved babyface versus babyface title matches at WrestleMania. Mania 23 saw two in the form of Cena vs Michaels and Batista vs Taker, as Undertaker won the Royal Rumble for the first time ever and challenged the animal. The two men were cordial, but soon broke down by regularly sneak attacking one another. Batista was in his second world title reign, but had never been defeated for the gold, dropping his first due to injury. Undertaker was undefeated at WrestleMania and and the streak was really starting to pick up steam, so intrigue for this bout was very high. The two men were evenly matched, and as the two biggest faces on SmackDown, it was no surprise. Taker got the crowd on their feet with his annual dive, but Big Dave came back with a huge power slam through the announce table. Batista kicked out of a last ride and a choke slam, while Taker kicked out of a Batista bomb as the match picked up serious momentum. But remember, it's WrestleMania, so Undertaker got the win with the Tombstone to go 15-0. By the way, in doing so, he became the first man in WWE history to have won the WWE title and the World Heavyweight title at separate WrestleManias. Number 58, Hulk Hogan vs Randy Savage for the WWE title at WrestleMania 5. Now, yeah? 
You sure? The mega powers explode as Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage clash for the gold. One of the greatest builds in wrestling history finally paid off after the best part of a year as former BFFs Randy Savage and Hulk Hogan went one on one. Things went sour when paranoid Randy thought Hogan had desires on Elizabeth, trashing a doctor's room in rage. Liz had enough and stayed out of things, saying she would be neutral for the match. The crowd were at fever pitch as the two biggest names in WWE went face to face. Savage played to his strengths, running around like a manic chicken, antagonizing Hogan, and using Liz as a human shield. Hogan did his usual Hogan shtick, and the two brawled all over the ringside area. With Savage in control, Liz went to her man, but Savage Savage rejected and manhandled her and she was escorted to the back. At this point, the crowd wanted Savage's blood as it looked like he was going to pull out the win. But Hogan kicked out of the elbow drop at one and a half, hulked up and, well, you know the rest. Number 57, Chris Jericho vs Edge for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 26. When Jericho and Edge teamed up to win the unified tag titles in 2009, it just made sense. But Edge soon ruptured his Achilles tendon and the short-lived alliance was over. Jericho didn't care though and routinely trashed his former partner, taking all the credit for their success. Edge returned at the 2010 Royal Rumble, eliminated Jericho and won the match. Jericho won the World Heavyweight title at Elimination Chamber and the story wrote itself. The two Canadians kicked lumps out of each other week after week with Jericho vowing to re-injure the rated R superstar. But despite the animosity between the two, this match started slowly as a typical wrestling match. Nothing wrong with that, but but perhaps it needed a little more aggro? The bout built solidly and the crowd eventually perked up a little, gasping at every counted finish and two counts. Edge worked towards nailing the spear, knowing that it could potentially net him his 10th world title. Jericho targeted Edge's Achilles and had the ultimate opportunist limping, but nothing could keep him down, kicking out at two after a Jericho belt shot. But Edge was worn out, and after a second code breaker, Y2J got the win and retained the title. Edge got the last laugh, though. Though, sort of, he hit a massive spear through a barricade. Probably rather have the title though. Number 56, the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 24. The fourth annual Money in the Bank was still a fairly stacked affair before it went decidedly more mid-card the following year. None of the competitors aside from Mr. Kennedy had won before, and apart from Chris Jericho, none had been a world champion, so it was a good opportunity to build some stars. You know the drill, this was a big old spot fest to get the crowd hyped. Morrison hit the first wow Wow move with a moonsault to the outside while holding a ladder, and just about everyone took some huge bumps in this one. Shelton Benjamin was the MVP, no disrespect to MVP, with the gold standard taking the bump of the match as he splattered through a ladder that was propped up at ringside. MVP looked to have it won, but longtime rival Matt Hardy returned from a knee injury and took him out with a huge twist of fate off the top of a ladder. With everyone lying in heaps around ringside, Jericho was the last man standing atop the ladder, but CM Punk came out of nowhere trapped Jericho's leg and claimed the briefcase for himself. Number 55, The Undertaker vs. Randy Orton at WrestleMania 21. The Legend Killer was on such a roll that many of us were totally convinced that he would be the one to end The Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania 21. Orton and his father, Cowboy Bob, had been prodding the dead man for weeks, and Randy showed his refound edge by RKOing Stacy Keebler, that horrible little bugger. After a flurry of offense by Taker, the two went back and forth, but Bob Orton made the difference using his trusty arm cast to floor the dead man. Taker fired back, but Orton was not to be written off, slithering out of a choke slam and connecting with a crisp RKO for a pants-wettingly close two count. Feeling unstoppable, Randy went for a tombstone pile driver, but Taker had his number and reversed it into one of his own, keeping the streak alive. Despite being on the losing end, this match did nothing to halt Randy's momentum and arguably even improved his stock. It was also his first solo WrestleMania match too, for those keeping score. Number 54. Batista vs Triple H for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 21. WrestleMania 21 was one of the most important WrestleManias of all time. We saw the continued rise of Randy Orton, the coming out party for John Cena as WWE Champion, and the ascension of Big Dave Batista to World Heavyweight Champion. The story told was brilliant. Batista won the Rumble, and Evolution buddies Triple H and Ric Flair tried to convince him to go after JBL's WWE title. Come contract signing time, 
time and Batista gave the iconic thumbs down, a throwback to Triple H's betrayal of Randy Orton, and we were on for a huge main event. Match time, and wouldn't you know it, it went over 20 minutes. It is Triple H after all. The two went back and forth, but Batista had spells where he dominated Hunter, with the game needing every trick in his book to survive. In the end, it was a Batista bomb that sealed the deal, and Triple H's reign of terror was finally over. For all the guff we give Triple H about his stranglehold on the title, the payoff was worth it, and WWE had a massive new star. Number 53, John Morrison versus Jimmy Uso versus Kofi Kingston SmackDown Tag Title Triple Threat Ladder Match at WrestleMania 36, Night 1. WrestleMania 36 was unique for a number of reasons, including a tag title match featuring three wrestlers. Originally pitting champs Miz and Morrison versus the Usos versus the New Day, the bout was changed when Miz fell ill beforehand. Despite the weird circumstances, any time you put Morrison, Kofi and Jimmy Uso in a ladder match, you are guaranteed results. Refreshingly, they didn't go for the ladders straight away either, doing some crisp choreographed counter-wrestling before grabbing the steps. It was also a nice change to have a Mania ladder match that didn't feature about 45 people after years of money in the bank and multi-man bouts. As a result, this flowed like an actual match rather than just a parade of high spots. That said, there were high spots though, the biggest of which saw Morrison plummet from the top of a ladder bridge, grabbing the titles on his way down for the win. It did seem unnecessary for these performers to put on such a dangerous high-impact match in front of no fans, but we more than thank them for it. They made the best of a bad situation, to say the least. Number 52, Kevin Owens vs Seth Rollins No Disqualification Match at WrestleMania 36, Night 1. Success got to Seth Rollins' head, and CrossFit Jesus began to decide that he was actual Jesus. Kevin Owens wasn't buying it, and picked a fight with Rollins for being, and I quote, an insufferable, miserable prick. Seth tried weaseling his way through this match, but Owens wanted a straight fight. The two had a heavy hitting back and forth encounter, but Seth took the easy way out, smashing Kev with the ring bell and taking the DQ loss. KO wasn't gonna go out like that though, and pandered to Seth's ego, tricking Rollins into restarting the match under no DQ rules. Seth obliged, the silly man. To be fair, Rollins easily took control, blasting Owens repeatedly with a chair and preparing to put him through the announce table. But Owens fought back, launched himself off the bloody WrestleMania sign and crushed Seth with a huge elbow drop through a table before hitting a stunner for the win. Number 51, Randy Orton versus Seth Rollins at WrestleMania 31. At one time, Randy Orton was considered the future of WWE, but in 2015, it was Seth Rollins who was being prepared for greatness. Orton and Seth were part of the authority, but Randy was annoyed by the new Golden Boy. Of course, they started fighting, with Seth curb stomping Orton into the steps in an attempt to end his career. Orton later rejoined the authority, only to RKO Rollins through a table and set up this match. The two flew out the gates, quickly counter wrestling for the opening stages, but Orton gained control and even took out J and J security on the outside. These two worked very quickly and very well, exchanging moves until Orton nailed the RKO for a two. Randy smelled blood and went for a punt, but J and J popped back up to save Seth, allowing him to hit a curb stomp for two. It all hurtled toward the final moments. Rollins missed a Phoenix splash but landed on his feet, went for a stomp, and you all know what happened next. Of all of Randall's RKOs over the years, for my money, it's the best of all. Sorry, Evan. Number 50, Seth Rollins versus Brock Lesnar for the Universal title at WrestleMania 35. The best moment of WrestleMania 35 was Paul Heyman interrupting Hulk Hogan's grand return to Mania and getting the Universal title match to kick off the showcase of the Immortals. Brock was the everlasting champion, while Seth had won the Rumble and vowed to end Lesnar's reign of tyranny. At this point in time, Brock's matches had become formulaic. German suplex, German suplex, F5 retain. But we knew that Brock liked working with more agile guys, and Rollins was only happy to oblige. Brock Brock nailed an F5 outside the ring straight away, with the two scrapping like mad dogs before the bell had even rung. Brock was on top, but Rollins wouldn't quit, and when the bell eventually did ring, Seth withstood the obligatory trip to Suplex City and stomped Lesnar's head off to win the title. This was a super hot opener and an almost perfect modern Brock match. Number 49, the Hardy Boys vs Gallows and Anderson vs Sheamus and Cesaro vs Enzo and Cass for the Raw Tag Team titles in a ladder match at WrestleMania 33. 
The Bar, The Club, and Enzo and Cass just could not stop fighting over the tag titles. Raw GM Mick Foley stepped in and made a three-way for Mania, but then they started hurling ladders at each other for no real reason, so it became a ladder match. Before the bout could kick off, WrestleMania hosts The New Day announced a fourth team would enter the fray, as the Hardy Boys returned to the biggest ovation of the night. I mean, I would know because I was there. I was half drunk and jet-lagged, but I was there. Orlando were given genuine goosebumps as the Hardys teamed together in WWE for the first time in seven years, fresh from their broken expedition of gold across the indies. This was your typical Mania ladder match. Lots of action, lots of bumps, and lots of high spots, especially as Jeff did his vertigo-inducing swanton onto the bar through a ladder. As Jeff went flying, Matt was alone in the ring, grabbing the titles to kickstart the Hardy's seventh WWE tag title reign, apparently the first WrestleMania tag title change since WrestleMania X7. The match was frenetic and didn't overstay its welcome at 11 minutes. And the right team won too, as anything other than a hardy victory would have been a monumental letdown. Number 48, Edge vs Mick Foley in a hardcore match at WrestleMania 22. For younger viewers who may have been unmoved by Edge's return last year, he was one of the most exciting, well-rounded wrestlers in WWE and regularly put his body on the line to keep us entertained. The same is also very true of Mick Foley, and when the two were booked in a hardcore match at WrestleMania 22, our bumholes collectively clenched in fear and anticipation. The two clashed after Foley officiated a WWE title match between Edge and John Cena. Edge was unhappy with Mick's performance, concertoing the hardcore legend in rage. Come WrestleMania, and the two put everything on the line. There were chairs, there were thumbtacks, and there was the pièce de résistance, a flaming table. The image of a blood-soaked Edge spearing Foley off the apron through a table is as incredible now as it was then, a true WrestleMania moment, and the first time flaming tables had been used in a WWE event, outside of spiritual ECW show One Night Stand, that is. Number 47, Kurt Angle vs Chris Benoit at WrestleMania X7. Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit were the two best pure wrestlers in WWE. Angle was determined to be seen as the best, and after Benoit made him tap during an interview segment, he was obsessed with proving he was the better man, denying the fact that he ever actually submitted. Angle came to the ring focused, but still managed to disparage Texas, cowboy hats, and yee-haws on the mic. What we were treated to here was furious technical counter match wrestling, something that the Attitude Era crowd weren't necessarily accustomed to, but hey, they were still appreciative here. This was their first really big singles match together, but the pair tangled like they'd wrestled a hundred times before. They barely took a single second to catch their breath, suplexing each other all over the ring. Angle bashed into the ref and was promptly caught in the crossface, tapping out as the ref was down. The Rabid Wolverine had the Olympian's number, and Kurt knew it, but managed to get a roll-up and a handful of tights for the sneaky sneak. Win. Number 46, Charlotte vs Becky Lynch vs Sasha Banks for the women's title at WrestleMania 32. As the women's revolution picked up steam, Charlotte's Divas title was launched into the sun, and the women's title was reinstated by Lita on the WrestleMania kickoff show. The winner of this match would be crowned the first women's champion, and it finally felt like women's wrestling in WWE had turned a corner. The crowd were hot, especially for Sasha, as the boss nailed a gorgeous top rope Hurricane Rana on Charlotte. Later, Sasha broke a figure eight with a frog splash and hit a flipping suicide dive to Charlotte, while Becky hit a dive of her own onto Ric Flair. The trio were evenly matched, but it was Charlotte's night, getting the win with the figure eight as the Nature Boy prevented Sasha from breaking the hold. This was a high-intensity, action-packed match, and the perfect way to re-establish the women's title. Number 45, Bret Hart vs Roddy Piper for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 8. Bret Hart's first run as IC champion came to an abrupt end thanks to the Mountie. Luckily, Roddy Piper was back in WWE after several hiatuses and injuries, and defeated the Mountie for his only IC title reign. When Bret returned, the two faces agreed to a match for Piper's strap at WrestleMania 8. But Piper, being Piper, couldn't stay squeaky clean for long, mocking Bret and the Hart family in promos leading up to the bout. Inside the ropes, the two were evenly matched from the get-go, with notorious brawler Piper keeping up and even chain wrestling with the Hitman. The action soon spilled 
spilled outside and Piper's mask started to slip, sucker punching Brett and busting him open. After the ref went down, Piper saw his opening and grabbed the ring bell ready to clock Brett, but had a change of heart and tossed it aside, locking in the sleeper hold instead. Brett then pushed off the turnbuckle and rolled Piper over for the win, and his second icy title as the crowd exploded. Piper was gracious in defeat and presented Hart with the belt, a huge rub for the excellence of execution. Number 44, Charlotte Flair versus Asuka for the SmackDown Women's title at WrestleMania 34. After demolishing the NXT Women's division for the best part of two years, Asuka finally made her way to the main roster, remained undefeated, won the first ever Women's Royal Rumble, and challenged Charlotte Flair for the gold at WrestleMania. We could all see it coming, Asuka getting the win over the most pushed women's wrestler of a generation, continuing her unbridled domination to become one of WWE's top stars. Right? Right? Well, never underestimate WWE's love for Charlotte Flair. Their bout had the big fight feel, and it certainly felt like a Mania match. This was a tightly contested affair as both women were evenly matched, their work showing why they're regarded as two of the best in the world. Charlotte went for the moonsault, but Asuka caught her in a triangle because she's incredible. She also nailed a ridiculous suplex off the apron and continued to wear down Flair. Charlotte came back with a top rope Spanish fly, nearly cut Asuka in two with a spear and got the shock win with the figure eight. A cracking match, no question about it, but everybody knows who should have won here. Number 43, Steve Austin versus The Rock for the WWE title in a no DQ match at WrestleMania 15. The first WrestleMania match between Austin and Rock was an overbooked mess, but it worked perfectly. Fans didn't want a well-worked, nicely paced technical affair. They wanted Austin opening up cans of whoop ass and Vince McMahon getting his comeuppance, and that's exactly what they got. Vince was determined to have his corporate champion retain, sending guest referee Mankind to the hospital and taking his place. Commissioner Michael stepped in and told Vince to get lost before appointing Mike Kyoda instead. Rock and Austin were instantly in the crowd battering one another, making their way around the Titantron area and back. Austin put Rock through the Spanish announce table with an elbow, and the crowd were on fire for every single thing they did. Cue ref bump number one, as Mike Kyoda took a chair to the head from Austin as Rock pulled him in the way. Now, ref bump number two as Tim White got Rock bottomed with the champ growing frustrated. And finally, ref bump number three as Earl Hebner got lightly slapped by Vince McMahon, leading to Mankind running out to finally officiate this match. Austin nailed a stunner for the win and pummeled McMahon. Prime Attitude Era booking. It wasn't a great WrestleMania overall, but it ended on the right match with the right result. Number 42, Bray Wyatt versus John Cena in the Firefly Funhouse match at WrestleMania 36 Night 2. Where do I even begin to start with this match, if you can even call it that? Remember before when we talked about Cena ruining Bray Wyatt? Turns out Bray didn't forgive or forget, and after his career renaissance as The Fiend, he wanted revenge. Cena was having none of it, promising the end of the most overhyped, overvalued, overprivileged WWE superstar ever. So it was time for the Firefly Funhouse match, whatever the heck that is. Cue a 13 minute long fever dream, co-directed by David Lynch and Jim Henson. Cena was made to relive his career and face his fears, from his failures as the bland ruthless aggression meathead, his reputation for burying opponents, and everything in between. We then return to Wyatt vs Cena at WrestleMania 30, as Bray finally convinced Cena to embrace evil and strike Wyatt down with the chair, leading to something we never thought we would see. Heal Cena. John joined the NWO and two-sweeted Bray Bischoff on Monday Nitro as Puppet Vince looked on. Cena had snapped and betrayed himself, and The Fiend ended the most overhyped, overvalued, overprivileged WWE superstar ever. See what they did there? This was a masterpiece in its own way, and for once, WWE fans were actually rewarded for following and knowing the product. Number 41, Money in the Bank at WrestleMania 23. 
Money in the Bank Episode 3, and no better way to open Mania than with some ridiculous ladder fun for the people. With 8 men, this was the biggest Money in the Bank match to that point, and look how stacked it was. Finley, of all people, got the first big spot of the match with a big splash to the outside, as old foes Edge and Matt Hardy lamped each other in the ring. The Hardys worked together to smack everyone with ladders, but clashed when going for the briefcase, and CM Punk had a whale of a time putting ladders on his head and spinning around like Terry Funk. Great stuff. The spot of the match saw Jeff leg drop Edge through a ladder, definitively taking the rated R superstar out as the crowd swore like naughty sailors. Everyone took harsh bumps and even Hornswoggle got involved, taking a huge plunge from the top of a ladder from Kennedy. In the end, it was the Leprechaun Killer's turn to be Mr. Money in the Bank, as he ladder bashed Punk off the top and grabbed the case to become Mr. Money in the Bank. Bank. Number 40, Zack Ryder vs Kevin Owens vs Dolph Ziggler vs The Miz vs Sami Zayn vs Sin Cara vs Stardust in the Intercontinental title ladder match at WrestleMania 32. WWE just love multi-man ladder matches, don't they? If it's not TLC, it's Money in the Bank, and if it's not that, then it's a big IC title smorgasbord. A year after Daniel Bryan's victory under the same circumstances, WWE did it again. Kevin Owens walked in as champion, but everyone just knew that Miz would be walking away with the strap. The crowd were electric as Owens and longtime rival Sami Zayn beat seven bells out of each other before everyone else got involved for a great big fight. Zayn had the crowd on their feet as he ran wild, but Stardust got a louder pop when he unveiled the polka dot ladder in tribute to Dusty. A host of huge spots later, it was time for Miz to climb the ladder and retrieve the IC title. However, Long Island Ice Z appeared out of nowhere, launched Miz, and claimed the belt for himself as the crowd went bonkers. This was a bona fide feel-good WrestleMania moment. Everyone liked Ryder, and it was nice to see Luck go his way as he celebrated with his dad. Then he lost the title to Miz the next night on Raw. Number 39, Daniel Bryan vs Bad News Barrett vs Dean Ambrose vs Dolph Ziggler vs Stardust vs Luke Harper vs R-Truth in the Intercontinental title ladder match at WrestleMania 31. The IC title needed some prestige back in its life after a few pretty rotten years. Barrett was champion, but every wrestler under the sun stole the belt off him and cosplayed as title holder, making it feel a bit meaningless. Fortunately, this match was just the remedy. The match itself started as it meant to go on, with all seven men wasting little time here, nailing dives left, right, and center before Ambrose hit a huge elbow onto everyone else. Wrestlers were dropping like flies, especially when Harper powerbombed Ambrose to the outside through a ladder, folding the lunatic fringe in half. Eventually, it was down to Debry and Z with Brian pasting his opponent with several fat headbutts to knock him down and take the strap. Great match, but bittersweet as well, as shortly after this, Brian would vacate the title and retire. Number 38, Seth Rollins vs The Miz vs Finn Balor for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 34. IC champion Miz had nothing to do at WrestleMania, so Seth Rollins and Finn Balor popped up and said, oh, go on then, we'll fight you. All three men had great chemistry and everyone was evenly matched, making the contest more exciting and unpredictable as a result. This was a frenetic, high work rate match, with Finn nailing a big tope in the opening exchanges before Rollins nailed him with a massive crossbody. The audience held their breath when Rollins threatened to powerbomb Finn into the barricade, the same move that dislocated Balor's shoulder at SummerSlam 2016, but luckily it didn't come off. Ultimately, though, it was Seth's night, as he scooped his first IC title with a stomp on The Miz. This was clearly thrown together to give all three men something to do, but we weren't complaining as it was always destined to be a good match. And despite Miz being heel champion, he was widely cheered alongside Rollins and Balor for taking part in one of Mania's best ever openers. Number 37, Brock Lesnar vs Goldberg for the Universal title at WrestleMania 33. What a difference 13 years makes. After stinking out Madison Square Garden at WrestleMania 20, here we had Goldberg and Brock Lesnar arguably putting on match of the night at WrestleMania 33. When Goldberg returned in 2016, he continually had Lesnar's number, squashing him at Survivor Series and throwing him out of the Rumble like it was nothing. He also took the Universal title off of Kevin Owens. Thanks for that, Bill. At Mania, the two powerhouses beat the hell out of each other, a fast-paced parade of spears, F5s, and suplexes. It was like a video game match, and it gave WrestleMania 33 a much needed shot of adrenaline. After a minute, Goldberg had already speared Brock through a barricade, then gave him a few more spears for good measure, and 
and a jackhammer or two. Brock evaded another spear, leapfrogging Goldberg with ease, and got the win with 100 Germans and an F5. It wasn't a technical masterpiece by any means, it was never going to be to be honest, but it played to both men's brutal strengths. Number 36, Shawn Michaels versus Bret Hart for the WWE title in a 60 minute Iron Man match at WrestleMania 12. 1995 was not kind to Shawn Michaels. He failed to beat WWE Champion Diesel at Mania 11 and got jumped by one or three or was it 25 Marines in Syracuse? It was 1996 though that would prove to be his year. After winning the Royal Rumble, HBK was determined to finally land the big one, challenging WWE Champion Bret Hart at WrestleMania. This was the story of two wrestlers at the peak of their powers gearing up for the match of their lives. It's also featured a clash of styles that complemented each other, Flashy Sean ziplining to the ring all bells and whistles, while Hitman simply walked out ready for a long fight. This may be the most polarizing match in WrestleMania history, with both men enjoying spells of control over the course of the following hour, but gaining no actual falls. As time ticked down, the match became more frenetic, as the crowd willed both men to seal the deal. With 30 seconds to go, Brett locked in the sharpshooter, but Sean held on as time ran out. Gorilla Monsoon then decided it would go to sudden death overtime. Sean was out on his feet, but finally nailed Sweet Chin Music to win his first WWE title. A Herculean effort from both men, this finally put Sean on top of the mountain. Number 35, Eddie Guerrero vs Kurt Angle for the WWE title at WrestleMania 20. Eddie Guerrero overcoming his demons and several professional setbacks to topple Brock Lesnar for the WWE title. It is truly one of wrestling's real feel-good stories. But not everyone was a fan. Kurt Angle was furious that Eddie was champ and vowed to defeat him and restore honor to the title. The people loved Latino Heat and were firmly behind him heading into this match with deafening air Eddie, Eddie, Eddie chants ringing throughout MSG. Kurt had no time for sentimentality and was in his amazing wrestling machine mode, suplexing Eddie all over the ring as Guerrero countered with throws of his own. Kurt was relentless as he locked in ankle lock after ankle lock, Eddie picking up more damage with each escape. As Kurt went for a final submission, he grabbed nothing but boots as Eddie had loosened his laces. He slipped out and successfully rolled up Kurt to retain. This was a wrestling clinic, but fittingly, it was settled by lying, cheating, and stealing. Number 34. Randy Savage vs Ric Flair for the WWE title at WrestleMania 8. After retiring at WrestleMania 7, then coming back to fight Jake Roberts, Randy Savage collided with WWE Champion Ric Flair. Flair got into Savage's head by claiming he used to have relations with Miss Elizabeth. Of course, Savage was fuming, and this played right into nature's hands. Flair and associate Mr. Perfect knew they had to exploit Savage's uncontrollable anger to overcome him. But before they could, Savage launched at Flair and the two beat the hell out of each other. Rick and Randy are two of the greatest ever and did everything to keep the crowd at fever pitch. Flair bent every rule, smashing Macho with chairs and brass knuckles as Perfect distracted the referee. Savage fought back, using his ferocity and explosiveness to bust Flair open, leading to a hefty fine from Vince McMahon as that was a big no-no at the time. After fighting out of the figure four, Savage got the win with a roll-up and a handful of tights while Flair was wooing at Liz. This was a blood feud and played out as such. No Greco Roman knuckle locks, just two bitter rivals going for the jugular. Oh, and despite this match being everything it needed to be and more, it still wasn't the main event, as Hulk Hogan and Sid just needed that slot, brother. Number 33, The Undertaker versus AJ Styles in a Boneyard match at WrestleMania 36 Night 1. AJ Styles was furious after Undertaker beat him in Saudi Arabia for the coveted two ache trophy. But AJ saw Taker as a broken old man and vowed to end his career at WrestleMania in a boneyard match, whatever the hell that was. Fans were apprehensive as Taker's form had noticeably dropped and prayed he would be able to take on AJ in a competitive match. But then COVID happened and WWE were allowed to get creative. And so the boneyard match became AJ versus Taker in a buried alive match, plus a sprinkle of cinematic magic. Styles emerged from a hearse laughing his ass off before Big Evil appeared 
appeared motorbike, bandana, the works. The two trash talked and brawled in and around an old barn, the match a succession of well choreographed set pieces. AJ got his shots in and battered Taker with the help of the Good Brothers, and it seemed like he was on the precipice of victory. But Taker came back strong and threw AJ off a roof. He then sent Gallows and Anderson to Impact Wrestling before chucking AJ Styles in the grave. Somehow AJ survived as if nothing had happened, and somehow WWE got away with offering us little to no explanation. While the Firefly Funhouse was cinematic insanity, the Boneyard match was cinematic wrestling, and allowed an aging Taker to look like the dead man of old for one last ride. Number 32, The Undertaker vs Triple H in a no holds barred match at WrestleMania 27. A year removed from Undertaker retiring Shawn Michaels, and Triple H decided that he would do what HBK couldn't, break the streak. Hunter and Taker silently nodded at a big sign in order to seal the deal, and the match was set. This was a fight between two grizzled old war horses, and they demolished everything in sight, with Undertaker plummeting through Michael Cole's coal mine after about 30 seconds. Taker did his big dive and nearly hurt himself, but Triple H fired back with a double-A spinebuster through the announce table. This was a proper knock down drag out brawl with both men kicking out of multiple finishers as the crowd grew louder and louder. Triple H was a man possessed, wailing on Taker with chair shots after three pedigrees failed to put the dead man down. Taker was out on his feet as Hunter looked on with pity, nailing Taker with a tombstone for a breathless near fall. The dead man still wouldn't stay down though, and as Hunter went for his sledgehammer, he got caught in Hell's Gate and passed out. Undertaker managed to keep the streak intact by the skin of his teeth, and you could bet that Triple H would want another shot. Number 31, Money in the Bank at WrestleMania 22. Money in the Bank was an unbridled success at WrestleMania 21, breathing new life into WWE's midcard as a whole, let alone the Mania lineup. Realizing they were onto a good thing, WWE decided to make it an annual occurrence, and this was the sequel. Similar to the first iteration, it was a six-man affair, and any of the participants would have been believable world champions. I mean, Ric Flair was in there for God's sake. No one says world champ more than Nate. Speaking of which, why was Flair in there? Nature Boy's inclusion was weird, but he gave it a good go, taking a huge superplex off the top of a ladder in one of the match's high points. As usual, Shelton Benjamin was the standout performer, but Matt Hardy and Rob Van Dam certainly gave him a run for his money. In the bank. <laughs> the crowd were firmly pro RVD as he blasted Lashley off one ladder with a chair, frog splashed Finley from another, before finally becoming Mr. Money in the Bank. Actually, while we're talking about Money in the Bank, number 30, the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania. 21. The first Money in the Bank ladder match is also the best. It was fresh, it was exciting, and it was unpredictable. Yes, ladder matches and WrestleMania had enjoyed a lovely partnership for the previous 11 years, but this was a kick up the arse, and with six competitors who could all viably be number one contenders, Money in the Bank number one just felt legit. Such a simple concept, it's a wonder it hadn't been done before, really. This wasn't just a parade of spots like many other Money in the Bank matches. It was better paced and featured a fair deal of actual wrestling before it became all-out ladder warfare. Everyone got their chance to shine, especially Shelton Benjamin, who used this match and several other Money in the Bank bouts to prove why he was one of WWE's most exciting talents. However, for all of Shelton's efforts, it was Edge's time to shine, becoming the first ever Mr. Money in the Bank and setting himself on course for the main event scene. Number 29, CM Punk vs Chris Jericho for the WWE title at WrestleMania 28. 2012 CM CM Punk was the best in the world, and very few took issue with that, aside from a returning Chris Jericho. The self-proclaimed best in the world at what I do felt that a whole generation of stars had ripped him off and weren't paying him due respect, especially Punk. Y2J and the world's most famous Pepsi fan clashed on the mic and the match was set for WrestleMania, best versus best. But before they could go at it, John Laurinaitis informed Punk that if he got DQ'd, he would lose the title. Y2J used this stipulation to his advantage, purposely enraging Punk and goading him into attacking him. But Punk resisted and took the fight to Jericho, the two going back and forth in and around the ring. Jericho was always one step ahead, doing immense amounts of damage to Punk's back to ready him for the walls of Jericho. Punk valiantly fought on, but Jericho had a counter for everything, including a huge codebreaker in midair as Punk was going for the springboard clothesline. In the end, all it took was an Anaconda vice and Punk retained, proving he was indeed the best in the world. Number 28, The Rock vs John Cena at WrestleMania 28. 
it's once in a lifetime, never to be repeated. The match we thought we would never see. Rock against Cena. Fans were electric for this match, booked a year in advance from when Rock cost Cena the WWE title at Mania 27. But would it deliver? After all, Rocky only had a handful of tune-up matches since his last bout at WrestleMania 20 eight years earlier. It didn't matter though. Class is permanent and Rock and Cena are undisputed masters at working a crowd, knowing all the right beats to keep them on board. There were your typical yay boo punches, lots of posturing and soaking in the atmosphere, and enough finishes to shake a stick at. Like the story from Mania 27 to 28, the match built slowly before a frantic crescendo that saw Cena go for a people's elbow, only to eat a rock bottom for the shocking loss. Another example of how good storytelling and an ability to work a crowd are worth their weight in gold. And money. This match made a lot of that too. Number 27, John Cena vs Shawn Michaels for the WWE title at WrestleMania 23. By 2007, Super Cena had overcome every obstacle. Triple H at Mania 22, Kurt Angle at Survivor Series 2005, but he was yet to face Shawn Michaels one-on-one -on -one in a big match setting. The two were world tag team champions together, but Michaels wanted the WWE title for the first time since 1997, beating Edge and Randy Orton to set up this match. Cena was determined to prove himself as the man in WWE, but defeating Mr. WrestleMania would be his biggest test. HBK used his experience to out-wrestle Cena, but John grew into the match using his brute strength to keep a bleeding HBK at bay. Mike Chioda took a super kick as Cena and Michaels brawled outside, Michaels nailing a stiff pile driver onto the ring steps. But again, Cena came back. Each man was desperate to land his finisher, and they went into a gorgeous nail-biting counter-wrestling sequence. Sweet chin music connected, but again, Cena came back, and HBK tapped to the STFU. We've said it time and time again that the Cena can't wrestle argument is absolute nonsense, and even though Michaels was the general here, it takes two to tango. Number 26, Kurt Angle and Ronda Rousey versus Triple H and Stephanie McMahon at WrestleMania 34. The transition from MMA to wrestling isn't always smooth, but Ronda Rousey took to the graps like a duck to water, surprising us all and putting in the best shift from a celebrity in WrestleMania history. Ronda popped up at the Royal Rumble, dramatically pointed at a sign for ages many, many times, and signed with WWE. The Helmsleys soon poked their noses in, and GM Kurt Angle revealed that they wanted to exploit Rousey for their gain. This was also Angle's return to WrestleMania to ramp up the stakes further. And even though some argued he'd lost a step since his heyday, he and Triple H were still master storytellers and worked their way around any shortcomings to keep the crowd invested. Everyone was there for one reason though, to see Ronda dish out some punishment, and when she finally tagged in, the crowd erupted. It got even louder when Steph finally felt Rousey's wrath, as it's always nice to see the billion dollar princess get her comeuppance. Then it was Triple H's turn, as Rousey pummeled him too, before Kurt Angle's greatest hits, and Ronda snapping Steph's arm in half for the win. Was this the best debut in pro wrestling history? There's certainly an argument to be made. Number 25, The Ultimate Warrior vs Hulk Hogan in a WWE and Intercontinental title winner-takes-all match at WrestleMania 6. The company's two biggest babyfaces were on a collision course, as WWE Champion Hulk Hogan and IC Champion Ultimate Warrior put it all on the line at WrestleMania 6. This was the first first time WWE had put on a face versus face match in the WrestleMania main event, but the gamble certainly paid off. This was a certified dream match at the time, building from the Royal Rumble with all of the wonderfully nonsensical promos you could wish for. The stakes were high, the anticipation even higher. To be fair, Hogan and Warrior didn't do much in the way of moves in this match, but they didn't have to. The crowd went wild for every little thing as these two living cartoon characters shoved, grunted, and clubbed each other about the place. Hogan and Warrior looked strong and were evenly matched, with both men enjoying periods of dominance. Hogan eventually hulked up, went for the leg drop, but missed. Warrior hit the splash and became the first ever double WWE and IC champion. Work rate, schmirk rate. This was a masterclass in storytelling and how the little things can make a wrestling match as much as a triple moonsault can. Number 24, Shawn Michaels versus Chris Jericho at WrestleMania 19. HBK was only away from the ring for four years, but in that time, a whole new generation of stars had emerged who owed a lot to the showstopper. Chris Jericho was one of them. 
Y2J idolized Shawn Michaels, but felt that HBK now stood for Has Been Kid. Michaels saw a lot of himself in Jericho, but was determined to let him know that he would never be him. To the surprise of nobody, Michaels and Jericho were gold together. They were evenly matched, chain wrestling in the early stages before cranking up the urgency of the bout. Jericho eventually took control of the fight and got under Sean's skin, copying Mr. WrestleMania's moves and mannerisms before folding HBK with a perfect sweet chin music. Michaels wouldn't say die though and fought his way back into the match, using his veteran instincts to get the win out of nowhere with a clever roll up. This was an incredible match between two of the greatest ever. The crowd were rabid throughout and applauded the efforts of both men, understanding that they were witnessing greatness. A crying Jericho agreed, giving Michaels a big hug before booting him right in the sexy boys. Number 23, The Ultimate Warrior vs Randy Savage in a retirement match at WrestleMania 7. After the Macho King cost Ultimate Warrior the WWE title, they realized that the company wasn't big enough for the both of them, and signed off on a loser retires match at WrestleMania. For all that Warrior gets criticized about his skills or lack thereof, this showed just how effective he could be when booked properly. It also helps to have an all-time great lead you through the match as well, of course. Savage and Queen Sherry did everything they could to win, but Warrior just wouldn't stay down, withstanding five elbow drops from Savage after a grueling fight. In the end, the might of the Warrior was just too much for the Macho Man, forcing him to retire. Sherry was enraged and kicked the crap out of a downed Savage. Miss Elizabeth then ran in from the crowd to a huge reaction to make the save, and we were greeted with one of the most iconic moments in wrestling history, as Savage and Liz reunited after two years apart. Warrior was great, but this was Savage's match. From his performance in ring, how good he made Warrior look, and the iconic aftermath, this is one of Randy's greatest triumphs. Number 22, Daniel Bryan vs Triple H at WrestleMania 30. Daniel Bryan vs The Authority was one of the biggest storylines of the past decade. Deemed a B-plus player by the McMahons, Bryan was constantly overlooked in favor of other superstars, but became the most popular performer in years. With the support of the WWE Universe during Occupy Raw, Bryan wrangled a WrestleMania match against Triple H, with the winner going into the main event against Randy Orton and Batista. But could the GOAT pull off the impossible? Bryan wrestled the match of his life, aggressively going after Triple H and unleashing all of his frustrations. But the game is the game, and soon took control, working Bryan's arm with Stephanie McMahon cackling ringside like a high. Hyena. The crowd didn't let up, screaming for Brian throughout as he took everything Triple H threw at him and just kept coming back. Spine busters, pedigrees, a crunching tiger suplex, nothing could keep Brian down, and when he finally got the win, the noise was deafening. This was us versus them, the will of the people versus the whims of the machine, and it was played superbly. Triple H wasn't done though, destroying Brian with a chair and putting his main event participation in doubt. Number 20. 21, the Undertaker vs Edge for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 24. The Undertaker went into his 16th WrestleMania with his eyes on the World Heavyweight title, but Champion Edge wasn't going to go down without a fight, having never lost a one-on-one -on -one match at WrestleMania himself. And the Rated R Superstar stayed true to his word, outmaneuvering and reversing most of the dead man's offense while hitting his own big moves. But of course, Taker wouldn't give in, nailing his Mania super dive and kicking out of everything Edge had. Undertaker Taker came back, but unfortunately took the ref out with a big boot. Seeing an opening, Edge nailed Taker with a camera, but Taker held on and crumpled the champ with a massive tombstone for two. The crowd were noisy, and as Edge nailed two spears, we believed he could actually pull it off. Undertaker, though, disagreed, caught Edge in the Hell's Gate, and got the tap out win after 25 minutes. An incredible match, which served as the beginning of Undertaker's WrestleMania match of the night streak, but it could have went differently. Several sources have since claimed that Edge was actually meant to break the streak here, but refused as he felt that he wouldn't gain anything from winning. What a nice fella. I reckon Brock owes a mistake dinner. Number 20, Edge and Christian versus the Hardy Boys versus the Dudley Boys for the tag titles in a triangle ladder match at WrestleMania 2000. The Hardys were embroiled in a feud with the Dudley Boys over the tag titles. Edge and Christian got involved too, so it was decided that the three teams would settle their differences in the first ever triangle ladder match. This was frenetic from the off and refreshingly avoided the WWE cliche, everyone lie outside the ring while two wrestlers scrap inside. We had seen nothing like this before and there were ladders 
and broken bodies everywhere. With people flying off ladders left and right, Bubba and Devon decided it wasn't crazy enough and got the tables. Not that this bothered Jeff Hardy, who hit a huge swanton bomb onto Bubba Ray from a ladder the size of the Eiffel Tower. With everyone suffering, Matt Hardy climbed for the titles, but didn't see Edge and Christian creeping up behind him to send him through a table and claim the victory. Yes, we're used to a lot of these spots now, but at the time, this was a unique match and the crowd and audience at home were blown away. It was innovative, entertaining, and would somehow be bettered a year later. Number 19, Razor Ramon versus Shawn Michaels in the Intercontinental Title Ladder Match at WrestleMania 10. The first major ladder match in WWE history saw Razor Ramon as IC champion, but Shawn felt as though he never lost it as he was actually stripped of the gold, surprise, surprise. With a physical belt each, it was decided that both would be on the line in a ladder match, the winner being crowned the undisputed IC champion. And in a way, this was a straight wrestling match between two of the best of their generation that just happened to feature a ladder. HBK bumped all over the place for his click buddy, and Razor looked like a million bucks when he suplexed Michaels from the top, before he eventually managed to grab the belts. It seems tame compared to ladder matches that have come since, but this was a genuinely groundbreaking contest unlike anything seen at the time. Number 18, The Rock versus Steve Austin at WrestleMania 19. WWE in 2003 was truly a post-attitude era world. The Rock had left for Hollywood, while Stone Cold quit WWE after falling out with Vince McMahon. But both men came back home with a score to settle. Rock hated that Austin had been named Superstar of the Decade and needed to beat Austin at WrestleMania, having lost to the Rattlesnake at Mania's 15 and 17. The two biggest stars of WWE's hottest era would go at it one more time with pride on the line. Austin started firmly in control, but Rock fired back, targeting Austin's surgically repaired knees and putting on his vest to mock him. Despite the Great One being in his amazing Hollywood Rock heel phase, the crowd were divided down the middle. Stone Cold hit his greatest hits and nailed a rock bottom for two, then when going for the stunner, Rocky grabbed Austin's leg, span him around, and nailed a stunner of his own, Shades of WrestleMania 14. Finishers flowed like wine as the tension and the noise built. Rock bottom, two count. A second rock bottom, another two. A third rock bottom, and that was it. The Rock had finally beaten Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania. Should it have been main event despite no title being on the line? That's arguable. But regardless of its place on the card, this was the perfect way for the Texas Rattlesnake to hang up his boots. Number 17, Kofi Kingston versus Daniel Bryan for the WWE title at WrestleMania 35. We all love Kofi Kingston. Whatever situation you put him in, he over delivers, be it in Royal Rumbles, ladder matches, or his work in the tag division with the New Day. But after Randy Orton branded him stupid, we didn't think he would get another sniff at the main event. An injury to Mustafa Ali saw Kofi get a spot in the Elimination Chamber for Daniel Bryan's WWE Championship, and the WWE Universe decided it's Kofi's time. But like Bryan five years before him, WWE management didn't feel the same way, and the New Day had to move heaven and earth to get Kofi a title match at WrestleMania. Bryan's work at this time was tremendous with his pompous eco-warrior act. He carried it into his matches, taking Kofi lightly whilst also dishing out punishment. But Kofi Mania was always destined to run wild, and as Kingston made his comeback, the live crowd and the superstars backstage started to believe. After several near misses, Kofi finally caught Bryan with Trouble in Paradise to finally become WWE Champion. A well-built, well-paced match that lived up to the hype, the build, and the setting. And as Kofi lifted the WWE title with his sons and the New Day, it was a genuine feel-good moment and a WrestleMania moment that will live on forever. Number 16, Brock Lesnar vs Kurt Angle for the WWE title at WrestleMania 19. I said earlier that no one has had a better rookie year than Kurt Kurt Angle, but the only person to come close is Brock Lesnar, okay, and Ronda Rousey. The next big thing had a banner debut year, destroying everyone and winning everything, including the 2003 Royal Rumble, setting him up for his sternest test, WWE Champion Kurt Angle. This was a collision of two wrestling machines in their primes. Brock was at his first Mania, Angle in his only Mania main event. If Kurt got DQ'd or counted out, he would lose the title, so we were set for a pure wrestling match of the highest caliber. Caliber. The two suplexed each other to hell and back, neither being able to dominate proceedings. Angle soon had enough and nailed the angle
Candle Slam for two, Brock being the first person to ever kick out of it, according to Michael Cole anyway. Brock fired back with an F5 for two, Angle being the first to kick out of that. Brock came back with another F5, then realized he needed something special to put the Olympic hero away, sailing through the air with a shooting star press, and sickeningly landing on his head. Both men thankfully recovered, and the next big thing sank a third F5 for the win and his second WWE title. A truly excellent match, and not even the frightening botch at the end could derail it. Number 15, The Undertaker vs CM Punk at WrestleMania 29. The early 2010s saw Undertaker's streak reach its apex, as a series of match of the year contenders made the prospect of beating Taker bigger than any championship. Fresh from his 434 day title reign, CM Punk decided he wanted the streak to add to his trophy hall and tastelessly mocked the recently deceased Paul Bearer to get into Undertaker's head. The crowd were divided down the middle and were at fever pitch for this bout. Taker was fired up, but so was Punk, who dominated large portions of the match, nailing Deadman with his own signature maneuvers as Paul Heyman stood at ringside with the urn. Taker just couldn't get any momentum, and as Punk elbow dropped him on the Spanish announce table, it seemed inevitable that he would get the win. Taker got a second win and landed the tombstone, but Punk kicked out and retook control. It was Punk's relentless mockery that was his undoing, with Taker coming back strongly after being struck with the urn as the two jockeyed for their finisher. The crowd and Heyman were losing their minds until Undertaker sank a huge tombstone for the win, the last of the streak. This was a great match, driven by Punk's fury at not being in the main event and another match of the night for The Undertaker. Number 14, Brock Lesnar versus Roman Reigns for the WWE title at WrestleMania 31. The Roman Reigns experiment, take one. The Big Dog's ascent to the main event was rapid and many fans felt it was unwarranted and undeserved. After flying high as the cool muscle of the shield, he dominated the Royal Rumble and set up a huge title match against WWE champion Brock Lesnar, with the two having a pitiful title tug of war on the road to WrestleMania. The build was a bit crap, but luckily the match was fantastic, exciting, and genuinely unforgettable. Even Roman's biggest detractors had to give him props for the way he took Brock's offense, including several crushing knees to the head and a chest-breaking clothesline. Reigns also became the first visitor to Suplex City, as Brock's off-the-cuff remark earned a round of cheers from the crowd and subsequently sold about a billion t-shirts. But the big dog withstood three F5s and came back into the bout, smacking Brock's head into the ring post and causing him to bleed like a stuck pig. The crowd, while enjoying the match, weren't ready to accept Seth Roman as champ, and that's when Seth Rollins turned up. Seth legged it to the ring to cash in his case and make it a triple threat. The crowd went crazy, and several curb stomps later, Rollins pinned Reigns to lift the WWE title for the first time in his career. Number 13, Ricky Steamboat vs Randy Savage for the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 3. Randy Savage was at his best as IC champion. Cruel and crazed, Savage did whatever he could to keep his hands on the belt, including crushing number one contender Ricky Steamboat's larynx with a ring bell. But Steamboat was made of sterner stuff, and when he returned, the match was set for WrestleMania 3, Savage vs Steamboat, IC title on the line. The crowd were well behind Steamboat, the perfect babyface who wouldn't say die in the face of Macho's nefarious ways, as commentators Gorilla Monsoon and Jesse Ventura expertly talked up their rivalry. Savage was brilliantly manic, aiming to re-injure Steamboat's throat and keep his hands on the gold. As a result, Steamboat worked more aggressively than usual, throwing brawling into the mix alongside his usual crisp offense. The dragon eventually got control and the crowd went wild as he scored several near falls. Savage resorted to desperation, grabbing the ring bell as the ref was down, only for George Steele to steal it back and throw Savage from the top rope. Steamboat went on to get the win with a small package. WWE audiences had never seen anything like it, and it was heralded immediately as an instant classic, especially in an era where WrestleMania was more about spectacle than work rates. This was two of the greatest at their absolute best, and even 30 years later, it still stands up as a masterpiece. Number Number 12, Shawn Michaels vs Ric Flair at WrestleMania 24. All good things must come to an end, and after 36 years in the wrestling business, Ric Flair was staring down the barrel of a gun. Vince McMahon decreed that the next match Flair lost would cost him his career, and after the Nature Boy got past the likes of Triple H, Randy Orton, and McMahon himself, he challenged Shawn Michaels to a match at WrestleMania 24. HBK was hesitant to accept, but Flair told him it would be an honor to retire at the hands of Mr. Wrestle. 
WrestleMania. Flair and Michaels put on a straight wrestling match, with Flair counter-wrestling HBK like he was in his 1980s prime. The fans wooed excitedly all match long as both men put everything on the line. HBK got control and went for sweet chin music but couldn't pull the trigger, allowing Nate to get the figure four. Michaels escaped and wouldn't make the same mistake twice, soon connecting with another kick for two. But Flair would not stay down. A second sweet chin music later and Flair slowly rose to his feet, still looking for a fight. Then HBK said the now iconic line and duly ended Flair's WWE career. And really, he couldn't have asked for a more perfect send-off. Number 11, Owen Hart versus Bret Hart at WrestleMania 10. Bret Hart's rise from mid-card workhorse to face of the company was a long time coming. The Hitman was the best pure wrestler in WWE, possibly the world, and everyone was ecstatic when he reached the top of the mountain, except for his little brother Owen. Owen felt overshadowed by the Hitman and felt his own accomplishments were swept under the rug. He wanted to face Bret and prove that he was the better heart, but time and time again, Bret refused. It wasn't until Owen snapped and kicked Brett's leg out of his leg that the Hitman accepted and they were on for WrestleMania 10. The match kicked off with quick, intricate chain wrestling, the likes of which we rarely saw in a WWE ring. Things got physical when Owen planted a firm slap across Brett's mush, with his brother replying in kind. The two were evenly matched and it went back and forth, Brett using his greater experience to try to dictate the pace, while Owen stood his ground with subtle hair pulls and targeted Brett's bad leg, determined to beat him with the shot. Sharpshooter. Brett fought on valiantly, but as he went for the victory roll, the movie he'd used to win King of the Ring, Owen had it scouted and pinned Brett for the shock win. This victory made Owen look like a million dollars, and when Brett won the WWE title later that night, it made Owen's win even greater. Never mind his anger. Number 10, The Undertaker vs. Triple H, Hell in a Cell, with Shawn Michaels as special guest referee at WrestleMania 28. Top 10 time now, this is the the business end of the list. At WrestleMania 27, The Undertaker beat Triple H by the skin of his teeth, but was stretched out of the Georgia Dome afterwards. Taker wasn't happy about this, and in order to save face, he offered the game another crack at the streak. Surprisingly, Triple H wasn't keen. Taker called him a coward, Shawn Michaels popped up to say, do it you idiot, I'll even be the referee, and Hunter accepted under Hell in a Cell rules. This started like their last encounter as the two grizzled veterans battered each other. The Undertaker was focused and angry and hurled Hunter around the cell as HBK watched on. As Triple H took control with a barrage of chair shots, Michaels finally got involved, telling Triple H that he was going too far, but the game wouldn't stop. HBK contemplated ending the match, but caught some offense from the dead man as well, as an enraged Undertaker came back with a vengeance. Choke slams were dished out, and as Taker went for the tombstone, he ate a sweet chin music and a pedigree, but still wouldn't stay down as the crowd lost their marbles. Michaels sat in the corner looking a wreck as both men traded finishers. Hunter went for the sledgehammer, but Taker stood on it, and right then, Trips knew he was screwed. The dead man annihilated Hunter, hit another tombstone, and went 20 and 0. The Undertaker and Michaels helped a battered and broken Triple H to the back and soaked in the applause from the thousands in attendance. It truly was the end of an era, if you ignore that tag match in Saudi Arabia ever happened, which you should. Number 9, Daniel Bryan versus Randy Orton versus Batista for the WWE World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 30. After a few years beating up aliens in Marvel films, Batista came back to WWE and won the Royal Rumble to set up a match with World Heavyweight Champion Randy Orton. Unfortunately for the former Evolution mates, there was someone called Daniel Bryan who wanted the belt, and the crowd would riot if he didn't get a shot. Bryan beat Triple H earlier in the night for this opportunity, but was worse for wear, and up against two calculated veterans with dozens of titles between them. The three went back and forth, but when Bryan got the yes lock on Orton, Triple H and Stephanie turned up to ensure that Bryan didn't get the win. The yes movement loudly kicked in, spurring on Bryan as he kicked out of a Batista bomb, wiped out the authority with a suicide dive, and nailed Triple H with the sledgehammer. Bryan's luck didn't last long though, as Batista and Randy teamed to put him through the announce table. But the crowd did not let up, screaming for Bryan as he refused medical attention. This was Yeselmania, and no matter how many times Bryan got beat down, he would get back up. 
When he finally kneed Batista in half and forced him to submit to the yes lock, the ovation was so loud you could hear it from the moon. Number 8. TLC2 for the tag team titles at WrestleMania X7 we thought the triangle ladder match couldn't be topped. Then TLC happened at SummerSlam 2000. Then we thought TLC couldn't be topped. Then TLC 2 happened. The Dudleys, the Hardys, and Edge and Christian, the three teams knew each other so well and had reinvigorated the WWE tag team division. After stealing the show at Mania 2000, they were on a mission to outdo themselves a year later. What unfolded was unparalleled carnage, making everything that came before it look tame. Everyone brought their A-game, and even when they looked like they were running out of steam, Player 3 entered the game, as Lita, Rhino, and Little Spike Dudley joined the fray. Before long, Jeff Hardy was performing his party trick of a massive swanton on the outside, then, in the immortal words of JR, Edge from a 20-foot ladder with a spear, as Jeff Hardy was annihilated while dangling from the belts. Things continued to escalate as Bubba Ray and Matt were pushed to the outside through several tables by Rhino, before the man-beast put Christian on his shoulders to piggyback or rhino back him up the ladder for the belts. Quite possibly the best ladder match ever and a ridiculous spectacle that will never and should never be topped. Number 7. Chris Benoit vs Triple H vs Shawn Michaels for the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania 20. The first triple threat main event in WrestleMania history and the first World Heavyweight title match to headline. This was a big deal. This was Benoit's first WrestleMania world title match and HBK case first since WrestleMania 14. It had that big fight feel and was a true WrestleMania super match. Benoit's intensity would be key, and as he got momentum and caused Michaels to bleed buckets, the DX founders teamed up to suplex him through the announce table. Hunter and HBK proceeded to slug each other in the ring as both men bled all over the canvas. Benoit came back to break up a pinfall attempt, and finishers flowed left, right, and center. But as Triple H went for a final pedigree, Benoit reversed it into a crippler crossface for the submission win. After being passed over time and time again, Chris Benoit had finally proven that he was the best pure wrestler in WWE and lifted the big gold belt. And we have to mention the scenes after the match as Eddie Guerrero came down to celebrate with his fellow world champion, scenes that are now unfortunately synonymous with tragedy. Number 6. The Rock vs Hollywood Hogan at WrestleMania 18 Icon vs Icon, Hollywood vs Hollywood, WWE vs WCW, Rock versus Hogan. After years of fantasy bookings and what-ifs, we finally had the impossible dream match as the People's Champion took on the leader of the NWO on the grandest stage of them all. Hollywood went it alone, wanting to prove himself and the world that he could take down The Rock without backup. The Toronto crowd were on fire for this match, giving Hogan a hero's return as he made his first WrestleMania appearance since Mania 9. Rock was also given a reaction, but not the one he expected, being vilified by those in the Toronto Skydome. You could cut the anticipation with a knife as the two icons went face to face, soaking in the uncanny atmosphere of the occasion. There were ref bumps, belt whips, and finishers popping off everywhere, but as Rock was looking for victory, Hogan hulked up, hit the leg drop for two, then missed a second. Rock took advantage, nailing two rock bottoms and a people's elbow for the win. A once in a life time collision and a match full of spectacle, all made better by an incredible crowd. This was sports entertainment at its best, and one hell of a performance from two industry titans. Number 5. Steve Austin vs The Rock for the WWE title in a no DQ match at WrestleMania X7. Just one more fight and I'll be history. Austin won the Royal Rumble for the third time and was determined to beat Rock for the title, with respect to giving way to animosity in the build to the match. As the bell rang, Austin was all over Rock as the two wasted little time in laying in some stiff shots. Stone Cold was working more aggressively than usual and soon busted Rock open with the ring bell. Rock was taking a beating but made his comeback to a chorus of boos, busting Austin open on an exposed turnbuckle. Their battle was bloody and furious as both men became more desperate to seal the the win. Rock hit a stunner, Austin kicked out, and Vince McMahon made his way to ringside. Rock had it all but won with the people's elbow, but Vince broke up the pin, then hit Rock with a chair at Austin's insistence. Austin then hit Rock with a rock bottom and a stunner, but Rock would not stay down. 
A possessed Stone Cold then rained down chair shot after chair shot on The Rock. He got the win and the title, then in an unthinkable move, shook hands with his greatest enemy, Vince McMahon. Austin had sold his soul to the devil. History showed it wasn't the right choice, but as a moment, it was incredible and signaled the end of WWE's hottest ever era. The Attitude Era was all but done. WCW and ECW were dead. WrestleMania X7 was the pinnacle of WWE's popularity and its two biggest attractions knocked it out of the park once again. Number four, Kurt Angle versus Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 21. Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels are arguably the two greatest in-ring performers of all time. No matter the stipulation or the opponent, they could put on a match of the night contender without breaking a sweat. But they never crossed paths until the 2005 Royal Rumble. Michaels eliminated Angle instantly, but Kurt snapped, threw Michaels out, and beat the heck out of him. Sexy Kurt set out on a mission to prove that he was better than Sean, attacking HBK's former allies, Marty Jannetty and Sherry Martell, before facing Michaels at WrestleMania 21. For all of Angle's determination, it was HBK who started the bout strongly, beating Angle at his own game with Matt Wrestling. The two ended up outside and Angle got the advantage with an Angle slam into the ring post, injuring Sean's historically bad back. Angle was relentless in targeting Michael's back and even started toying with the showstopper. HBK came back into it but couldn't connect with Sweet Chin Music as Kurt turned it into a nasty ankle lock. Kurt was in control but momentarily let his guard down and caught a desperation kick to the jaw. HBK was battered and bruised and just barely in the contest. Kurt noticed and rolled into another ankle lock and nothing on earth could make him break the hold. Michaels rolled and wriggled and flailed, but Kurt stayed locked in, grapevined the leg, and HBK tapped after 27 minutes of sensational action. This probably stands as the finest pure wrestling match in WrestleMania history. Not bad, eh? Number three, The Undertaker vs. Shawn Michaels career vs. streak no DQ match at WrestleMania 26. After putting on Match of the Year at WrestleMania 25, Shawn Michaels, Mr. WrestleMania himself, wanted another shot at the streak. HBK couldn't bear the fact that he didn't win and vowed to be the one to break it, but Taker said no. Michaels took matters into his own hands by costing Taker the World Heavyweight Championship and the dead man relented. But this time, if Michaels lost, he would have to retire on the spot. Michaels wasn't going to take any chances and had Taker's number from the off. Soon injuring the dead man's leg. Taker persevered, but his leg was giving him grief, HBK working over it constantly. This built slowly, but the crowd were invested and made tons of noise when Taker caught Michaels mid-springboard and tombstoned him outside the ring. Sean wouldn't stay down and continued targeting Taker's leg, nailing a huge moonsault to it through the Spanish announce table. The dead man came back with a tombstone, arms crossed, for the two. The crowd were losing their minds and Taker looked looked stunned. He readied for another tombstone but hesitated as Michaels crawled to his feet and told HBK to stay down. But like Ric Flair two years earlier, HBK wanted to go out on his feet like a man, stealing Taker's taunt and slapping the dead man before eating a huge tombstone. And with that, Sean's career was over. The greatest performer of a generation, Mr. WrestleMania went out on his terms with one of the best Mania matches ever. Again, if we can just pretend that that match in Saudi or, uh, you know what, never mind. Number two, Bret Hart versus Steve Austin in a no DQ submission match with Ken Shamrock as special guest ref at WrestleMania 13. Steve Austin and Bret Hart's blood feud was one of the best things about 1997. The two butted heads time and time again from the Royal Rumble to In Your House and several high profile clashes on Raw. After Austin had cost him the WWE title and Undertaker prevented him from recapturing it, Hart snapped, famously launching a foul-mouthed tirade against Vince McMahon and everyone backstage. The hitman's squeaky clean facade had slipped. Austin loved it and vowed to fully expose Brett at WrestleMania. The two started brawling before the bell rang and proceeded to beat the hell out of each other, but only a submission would end things. They brawled in the bleachers, they smacked each other with ring bells and steel chairs, Brett got a figure four around the ring post and Austin choked Brett with a cable.
goal. Both men were determined to win, and both were determined to maim the other in the process. Austin was a mess, with blood relentlessly pouring out of his head. No matter how much punishment he took, the rattlesnake would not go down, viciously assaulting Hart whenever he got the chance. But Hart was a ring general, and before long had the sharpshooter locked in in the middle of the ring. Blood dripping through his teeth, Austin passed out, but he didn't submit. Hart had won, but continued his assault as the crowd booed and referee Ken Shamrock threw him to one side. The hitman was now public enemy number one, while Austin was on the path to superstardom, making this the greatest double turn in wrestling history to cap off one of Mania's greatest ever matches. Number one, The Undertaker vs Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 25. Light versus Dark, The Showstopper versus The Dead Man, Shawn Michaels versus The Undertaker. The two hadn't fought one-on-one -on -one since Royal Rumble 98, a match that Michaels had won, but HBK had to fight to earn this shot at the streak, defeating JBL and Kozlov to set up the bout. Michaels was not afraid, but Taker didn't care, and the two went back and forth as the crowd showed their support for both legends. Shawn's game plan was to chop Taker down, locking a figure four and a crossface early on. Taker wasn't phased, and after withstanding more of HBK's offense, went for a choke slam, which was reversed into a sweet chin music. That was reversed into a hell's gate, and the match kicked into a higher gear. The crowd were on their feet as the two made their way to ringside, where Michaels missed a huge moonsault splatting into the mats. As HBK got to his feet, Undertaker went for his WrestleMania dive, but Michaels tried to pull a cameraman in the way. As we're sure most of you would have seen by now, Taker terrifyingly landed on his noggin. This had become a war, and each man became ever more desperate to win. A choke slam for two, sweet chin music for two, nothing would keep either man down. Michaels even kicked out of a tombstone, and Undertaker's exasperated face said it all. HBK refused to lose, nailing a huge elbow drop and a second sweet chin music to no avail. Seeing an opening, he went for a moonsault, but Taker caught him, hit the tombstone, and got the win. The crowd barely got a chance to catch their breath and both men gave it their absolute all. We knew it then, and we know it now. It's still the greatest match in WrestleMania history. It will take a supernatural effort to overtake it, but we live in hope.